This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marlouche Schoenheim. History of Holland by George Edmondson. Chapter 18. The Stadtholderate of William the Third, 1672-1688. In the early summer of 1672, when William resolved to concentrate all his available forces for the defense of Holland covered by its water line, the military situation was apparently hopeless. Had Turenne and Luxembourg made a united effort to force this line at the opening of the campaign, the probability is that they would have succeeded. Instead of doing so, they expended their energies in the capture of a number of fortified places in Gelderland, Overijssel and North Brabant and in the meantime the stadtholder was week by week strengthening the weak points in his defences, encouraging his men, personally supervising every detail, and setting an example of unshaken courage and of ceaseless industry. He had at his side, as his field marshal, George Frederick, Count of Waldeck, an officer of experience and skill who had entered the Republic's service, and von Beverning, as commissioner of the States General. With their help and counsel, he had before autumn an efficient army of 57,000 men on guard behind entrenchments at all assailable points, while armed vessels patrolled the waterways. Outside the line Nijmegen, Grave, Koevoorden, Steenwijk and other smaller places had fallen, but the Münster Cologne forces, after a siege lasting from July 9 to August 28, had to retire from Groningen. The French armies were all this time being constantly weakened, by having to place garrisons in the conquered provinces, and neither Turenne nor Luxembourg felt strong enough to attack the strongly protected Dutch frontiers behind the waterline. The prince, however, was not content with inaction. Assuming the offensive, he ventured on a series of attacks on Naarden and on Woerden, raised the siege of Maastricht, and finally made an attempt to cut the French communications by a march upon Charleroi. All these raids were more or less failures, since in each case William had to retreat without effecting anything of importance. Nevertheless, the enterprise shown by the young general had the double effect of heartening his own troops and of undermining the overweening confidence of the enemy. A hard frost in December enabled Luxembourg to penetrate into Holland, but a rapid thaw compelled a hasty withdrawal. The only road open to him was blocked by a fortified post at Nieuwerburg, but Colonel Van Epin, who was in command of the Dutch force, retired to Gouda and left the French a free passage, to the stadtholder's great indignation. The colonel was tried on the charge of deserting his post and shot. The year 1673 was marked by a decisive change for the better in the position of the states. Alarm at the rapid growth of the French power brought at last both Spanish and Austrian assistance to the hard-pressed Netherlands, and the courage and skill of de Ruyter held successfully at bay the united fleets of England and France, and effectually prevented the landing of any army on the Dutch coast. Never did de Ruyter exhibit higher qualities of leadership than in the naval campaign of 1673. His fleet was greatly inferior in numbers to the combined Anglo-French fleet under Prince Rupert and Destrée. A stubborn action took place near the mouth of the Scheldt on June 7, in which the English had little assistance from the French squadron and finally retired to the estuary of the Thames. Another fierce fight at Kijkduin on August 21 was still more to the advantage of the Dutch. Meanwhile on land the French had scored a real success by the capture of the great fortress of Maastricht with its garrison of 6,000 men, after a siege which lasted from June 6 to July 1. All attempts, however, to pass the water line and enter Holland met with failure, and, as the summer drew to its close, the advance of imperial and Spanish forces began to render the position of the French precarious. William seized his opportunity in September to capture Naarden before Luxembourg could advance to its relief. He then took a bolder step. In October, at the head of an army of 25,000 men, of whom 15,000 were Spanish, he marched to Cologne and, after effecting a junction with the Imperial Army, laid siege to Bonn, which surrendered on November 15. This brilliant stroke had great results. The French, fearing that their communications might be cut, withdrew from the Dutch frontier, and at the same time the Münster Cologne forces hastily evacuated the eastern provinces. The stadtholder, before the end of the year, entirely freed the country from its invaders. Once more, a Prince of Orange had saved the Dutch Republic in its extremity. The effect of this was to place almost supreme power in his hands. 
had the prince at this moment set his heart upon obtaining the title of sovereign, he would have had but little difficulty in gratifying his ambition. Leading statesmen like the council pensionary Fago, the experienced von Beverning, and Falconeer, the most influential man in Amsterdam, would have supported him. But William was thoroughly practical. The freeing of the provinces from the presence of the enemy was but the beginning of the task which he had already set before himself as his life work, i.e. the overthrow of the menacing predominance of the French power under Louis the Fourteenth. His first care was the restoration of the well-nigh ruined land. The country outside the water line had been cruelly devastated by the invaders, and then impoverished by having for a year and a half to maintain the armies of occupation. Large tracts on the borders of Holland, Utrecht and Friesland, submerged by the sea waters through the cutting of the dams, had been rendered valueless for some years to come, while those parts of Holland and Zeeland, on which the enemy had not set foot, had been crushed beneath heavy taxes and the loss of commerce. The position of the three provinces, Utrecht, Gelderland and Overijssel, which had been overrun by the French at the opening of hostilities and held by them ever since, had to be resettled. They had, during this period, paid no taxes and had no representation in the States General. Holland was in favour of reducing them to the status of generality lands until they had paid their arrears. The prince was opposed to any harshness of treatment and his will prevailed. The three provinces were re-admitted into the Union, but with shorn privileges, and William was elected stadtholder by each of them with largely increased powers. The nomination, or the choice out of a certain number of nominees of the members of the town corporations, of the courts of justice, and of the delegates to the States General, was granted to him. The Dutch Republic was full of anomalies. In Utrecht, Gelderland and Overijssel we have the curious spectacle in the days of William III of the Stadtholder, who was nominally a servant of the sovereign estates, himself appointing his masters. As a matter of fact, the voice of these provinces was his voice, and, as he likewise controlled the estates in Zeeland, he could always count upon a majority vote in the States General in support of his foreign policy. Nor was this all. Holland itself, in gratitude for its deliverance, had become enthusiastically Orangist. It declared the stadtholdership hereditary in the male line, and its example was followed by Zeeland, Utrecht, Gelderland and Overijssel, while the States General in their turn made the captain and admiral generalship of the Union hereditary offices. Nor was gratitude confined to the conferring of powers and dignities, which gave the prince in all but name monarchical authority. At the proposal of Amsterdam, the city which so often had been and was yet to be the stubborn opponent of the Prince of Orange, William II's debt of two million florins was taken over by the province of Holland. Zeeland presented him with thirty thousand florins, and the East India Company with a grant of one thirty-third of its dividends. From the very first, William had kept steadily in view a scheme of forming a great coalition to curb the ambitious designs of Louis XIV and for effecting this object an alliance between England and the United Provinces was essential. The first step was to conclude peace. This was not a difficult task. The English Parliament, and still more the English people, had throughout been averse from fighting on the side of the French against the Dutch. Charles II, with the help of French money, had been carrying on the war in opposition to the wishes of his subjects, who saw their fleets but feebly supported by their French allies, their trade seriously injured, and but little chance of gaining any adventurous return for the heavy cost. Charles himself had a strong affection for his nephew, and began to turn a favourable ear to his proposals for negotiations, more especially as his heroic efforts to stem the tide of the French invasion had met with so much success. In these circumstances everything was favourable to an understanding, and peace was concluded at Westminster on February 19, 1674. The terms differed little from those of Breda, except that the Republic undertook to pay a war indemnity of two million florins within three years. The striking of the flag was conceded. Suriname remained in Dutch hands. New York, which had been retaken by a squadron under Cornelius Evertsen, August 1673, was given back to the English crown. Negotiations were likewise opened with Münster and Cologne, and peace was concluded with Münster, April 22, and with Cologne, May 11, on the basis of the evacuation of all conquered territory. France was isolated and opposed now by a strong coalition, the Republic having secured the help of Austria, Spain, Brandenburg and Denmark. The campaign of the summer of 1674 thus opened under favouring circumstances, but nothing of importance occurred until August 11, when William at the head of an allied force of some 70,000 men encountered Condé at Seneff in Hainaut. 
The battle was fought out with great obstinacy and there were heavy losses on both sides. The French, however, though inferior in numbers, had the advantage of being a more compact force than that of the Allies, and William, poorly supported by the imperialist contingents, had to retire from the field. He was never a great strategist, but he now conducted a retreat which extracted admiration from his opponents. His talents for command always showed themselves most conspicuously in adverse circumstances. His coolness and courage in moments of peril and difficulty never deserted him, and, though a strict disciplinarian, he always retained the confidence and affection of his soldiers. On October 27, Grave was captured, leaving only one of the Dutch fortresses, Maastricht, in the hands of the French. The war on land dragged on without any decisive results during 1675. The Stadtholder was badly supported by his allies and reduced to the defensive. But, though tentative efforts were made by the English government to set on foot negotiations for peace, and a growing party in Holland were beginning to clamor for the cessation of a war which was crippling their trade and draining the resources of the country, the prince was resolutely opposed to the English offer of mediation, which he regarded as insincere and premature. He was well aware that there was in England a very strong and widespread opposition to the succession of James, Duke of York, who made no secret of his devoted attachment to the Roman Catholic faith. So strong was the feeling that he had been compelled to resign his post of Lord High Admiral. The dislike and distrust he aroused had been accentuated by his second marriage to Mary of Modena, a zealous Catholic. William was the son of the eldest daughter of Charles I, and to him the eyes of a large party in England were turning. The prince was keenly alive to the political advantages of his position. He kept himself well informed of the intrigues of the court and of the state of public opinion by secret agents, and entered into clandestine correspondence with prominent statesmen. Charles II himself, though he had not the smallest sympathy with his nephew's political views, was as kindly disposed to him as his selfish and unprincipled nature would allow, and he even went so far as to encourage in 1674 an alliance between him and his cousin Mary, the elder daughter of the Duke of York. But William had at that time no inclination for marriage. He was preoccupied with other things, and the age of Mary, she was only twelve, rendered it easy for him to postpone his final decision. Events were to force his hand. In 1676 the French king, fearing the power of the coalition that was growing in strength, endeavoured to detach the Republic by offering to make a separate peace on generous terms. Despite the opposition of the stadtholder, Dutch and French representatives met at Nijmegen, but William, by his obdurate attitude, rendered any settlement of the points in dispute impossible. In 1677, however, the capture of Valenciennes by the French and their decisive defeat of the army under William's command at Montcassel, April 11, made it more difficult for him to resist the growing impatience of the burgher class in Holland and especially of the merchants of Amsterdam at his opposition to peace. He was accused of wishing to continue the war for motives of personal ambition and the desire of military glory. In February of this year, however, Charles II, after a period of personal rule, was through lack of resources compelled to summon Parliament. It no sooner met than it showed its strong sympathy with the Netherlands, and the king speedily saw that he could no longer pursue a policy opposed to the wishes of his people. When, therefore, William sent over his most trusted friend and counsellor, Bentinck, to London on a secret mission in the summer, he met with a most favourable reception, and the prince himself received an invitation to visit his uncle with the special object of renewing the proposal for his marriage with Princess Mary. William accordingly arrived in London on October 19, and, the assent of the king and the Duke of York being obtained, the wedding was celebrated with almost indecent haste. It was a purely political union, and when, early in December, the prince and princess of Orange set sail for Holland, the young girl wept bitterly at having to leave her home for a strange land at the side of a cold, unsympathetic husband. The weeks he spent in England had been utilized by the prince to good purpose. He persuaded Charles to promise his support by land and sea to the Netherlands in case the terms of peace offered by the Allies were rejected by the French. A treaty between the States and Great Britain giving effect to this promise was actually signed on January 29, 1678. The results, however, did not answer William's expectations. The English Parliament and states alike had no trust in King Charles, nor was the English match at first popular in Holland. A strong opposition arose against the prince's war policy. The commercial classes had been hard hit by the French invasion, and they were now suffering heavy losses at sea through the Dunkirk privateers led by the daring Jean Bart. 
The peace party included such tried and trusted statesmen as von Bevening, von Berningen, and the council pensionary Fagel, all of them loyal councillors of the stadtholder. So resolute was the attitude of Amsterdam that the leaders of both municipal parties, Falconeer and Hoofd, were agreed in demanding that the French offer of a separate peace should be accepted. On the same side was found Henry Casimir, stadtholder of Friesland, who was jealous of his cousin's autocratic exercise of authority. The Paul Palais at Nijmegen was still going on, but made no progress in face of William's refusal to treat except in concert with his allies. Louis XIV, however, fully informed of the state of public opinion and of the internal dissensions, both in the United Provinces and in England, was not slow to take advantage of the situation. A powerful French army invaded Flanders and made themselves masters of Ypres and Ghent and proceeded to besiege Mons. William, despite the arrival of an English auxiliary force under Monmouth, could do little to check the enemy's superior forces. Meanwhile, French diplomacy was busy at Amsterdam and elsewhere in the States, working against the war parties, and by the offer of favorable terms, the States General were induced to ask for a truce of six weeks. It was granted, and the Dutch and Spanish representatives at Nijmegen, those of the Emperor, of Brandenburg, and of Denmark, refusing to accede, speedily agreed to conclude peace on the following terms, the French to restore Maastricht and to evacuate all occupied Dutch territory, and to make a commercial treaty, Spain to surrender an important slice of southern Flanders, but to be left in possession of a belt of fortresses to cover their Netherland positions against further French attack. But though these conditions were accepted, the French raised various pretexts to delay the signature of the treaty, hoping that meanwhile Mons, which was closely beleaguered by Luxembourg, might fall into their hands, and thus become an asset which they could exchange for some other possession. The States and the Spanish government were both anxious to avoid this, and the Prince of Orange, who steadily opposed the treaty, returned towards the end of July to his camp to watch the siege of Mons and prevent its falling into the hands of the enemy. At the same time, July 26, King Charles, who had been working through Sir William Temple for the conclusion of peace, now declared that, unless a treaty was signed before August 11, he would assist the Allies to enforce it. The French diplomatists at Nijmegen had hitherto declared that their troops would not evacuate Maastricht and the other places which they had agreed to restore to the States until Brandenburg and Denmark had evacuated the territory they had conquered from Sweden. On August 10, just before time for resuming hostilities had been reached, they tactfully conceded this point and promised immediate evacuation if the treaty were at once concluded. Van Bevening and his colleagues accordingly, acting on their instructions, affixed their signatures just before midnight. They fell into the trap laid for them, for the treaty between France and Spain was not yet signed, and it was the intention of the French to make further pretexts for delay in the hope that Mons meanwhile would fall. The report of the conclusion of peace reached the stadtholder in his camp on August 13, but unofficially. On the morning of August 14, Destrade came personally to bring the news to Luxembourg, and the French marshal was on the point of forwarding the message to the Dutch camp when he heard that Orange was advancing with his army to attack him, and he felt that honor compelled him to accept the challenge. A centenary fight took place at Saint-Denis, a short distance from Mons. William exposed his life freely, and though the result was nominally a drawn battle, he achieved his purpose. Luxembourg raised the siege of Mons, and negotiations with Spain were pressed forward. The treaty was signed on September 17, 1678. The Peace of Nijmegen thus brought hostilities to an end, leaving the United Provinces in possession of all their territory. It lasted ten years, but it was only an armed truce. Louis XIV desired a breathing space in which to prepare for fresh aggressions, and his tireless opponent, the Prince of Orange, henceforth made it the one object of his life to form a grand alliance to curb French ambition and uphold in Europe what was henceforth known as the balance of power. In setting about this task, William was confronted with almost inseparable difficulties. The Dutch people generally had suffered terribly in the late invasions and were heartily sick of war. The interest of the Hollanders and especially of the Amsterdamers was absorbed in the peaceful pursuits of commerce. The far-reaching plans and internal combinations upon which William concentrated his whole mind and energies had no attraction for them, even had they understood their purpose and motive. 
The consequence was that the prince encountered strong opposition, and this was not merely in Holland and Amsterdam, but from his cousin Henry Casimir and the two provinces of which he was stadtholder. In Amsterdam, the old states party revived under the leadership of Valkenier and Hooft, and in his latter days von Beuningen was ready to resist to the utmost any considerable outlay on the army or navy or any entangling alliances. They held that it was the business of the Republic to attend to its own affairs and to leave Louis to pursue his aggressive policy at the expense of other countries, so long as he left them alone. The ideal which William III had set before him was the exact reverse of this, and, unfortunately for his own country, throughout his life he often subordinated its particular interests to the wider European interests which occupied his attention. The work of building up afresh a coalition to withstand the ever-growing menace of the formidable French power could scarcely have been more unpromising than it now appeared. Spain was utterly exhausted and feeble. Brandenburg and Denmark had been alienated by the states concluding a separate peace at Nijmegen and leaving them in the lurch. The attention of the emperor was fully occupied in defending Hungary and Vienna itself against the Turks. England under Charles II was untrustworthy and vacillating, almost a negligible quantity. A visit made by William to London convinced him that nothing was at present to be hoped for from that quarter. At the same time, the very able French ambassador at The Hague, Davo, did his utmost to foment the divisions and factions in the provinces. He always insisted that he was accredited to the States General, and not to the Prince of Orange, and carried on correspondence and intrigues with the party in Amsterdam, opposed to the stadtholder's anti-French policy. The cumbrous and complicated system of government enabled him thus to do much to thwart the prince and to throw obstacles in his way. The curious thing is that William was so intent on his larger projects that he was content to use the powers he had without making any serious attempt, as he might have done, to make the machine of government more workable by reforms in the direction of centralization. Immersed in foreign affairs, he left the internal administration in the hands of subordinates, chosen rather for their subservience than for their ability and probity, and against several of them, notably against his relative Odag, serious charges were made. Odag, representing the prince as first noble in Zeeland, had a large patronage, and he shamelessly enriched himself by his venal traffic in the disposal of officers without a word of rebuke from William, in whose name he acted. On the contrary, he continued to enjoy his favour. Corruption was scarcely less rife in Holland, though no one practised it quite on the same scale as Odaic in Zeeland. William indeed cared little about the domestic politics of the Republic, except in so far as they affected his diplomatic activities, and in this domain he knew how to employ able and devoted men. He had Waldeck at his side not merely as a military adviser, but as a skilful diplomatist well versed in the intricate politics of the smaller German states. Everhard van Wede, Lord of Dijkveld, and Godard van Rede, Lord of Amerongen, proved worthy successors of van Bevening and van Beuningen. Through the council pensionary Fagel he was able to retain the support of the majority of the estates of Holland, despite the strong opposition he encountered at Amsterdam and some other towns, where the interests of commerce reigned supreme. The death of Gilles Falkenier, the ablest of the leaders of the opposition in Amsterdam, in 1680, left the control of affairs in that city in the hands of Nicolaas Witsen and Johan Hudde, but these were men of less vigour and determination than Falconeer. Louis XIV, meanwhile, had been actively pushing forward his schemes of aggrandizement. Strasbourg was seized in August 1681. Luxembourg was occupied. Claims were made under the Treaty of Nijmegen to certain portions of Flanders and Brabant, and troops were dispatched to take possession of them. There was general alarm. And, with the help of Waldeck, William was able to secure the support of a number of the small German states in the Rhenish circle, most of them always ready to hire out their armed forces for a subsidy. Sweden also offered assistance, but both England and Brandenburg were in secret collusion with France, and the Emperor would not move owing to the Turkish menace. In these circumstances, Spain was compelled, 1684, by the entry of the armies of Louis into the southern Netherlands to declare war upon France, and called upon the States for the military aid of 8,000 men in accordance with the terms of the Treaty of Nijmegen. Orange at once referred the matter to the Council of State, and himself proposed that 16,000 should be sent. As this, however, could only mean a renewal of the war with France, 
The proposal met with strong opposition in many quarters, and especially in Amsterdam. Prosperity was just beginning to revive, and a remembrance of past experiences filled the hearts of many with dread at the thought of the French armies once more invading their land. The Amsterdam regents even went so far as to enter into secret negotiations with Davo, and they were supported by Henry Casimir, who was always ready to thwart his cousin's policy. William was checkmated and at first, in his anger, inclined to follow his father's example and crush the opposition of Amsterdam by force. He possessed, however, which William II had not, the support of a majority in the estates of Holland. He used this with effect. The raising of the troops was sanctioned by the estates, January 31, 1684, an intercepted cipher letter from Davos being skillfully used to discredit the Amsterdam leaders, who were accused of traitorous correspondence with a foreign power. Nevertheless, the prince, although he was able to override any active opposition at home, did not venture, so long as England and Brandenburg were on friendly relations with France, to put pressure upon the States General. The French troops, to the prince's chagrin, overrun Flanders, and he had no alternative but to conquer in the truce for twenty years concluded at Ratisbon, August 15, 1684, which left the French king in possession of all his conquests. No more conclusive proof of the inflexible resolve of William III can be found than the patience he now exhibited. His faith in himself was never shaken, and his patience in awaiting the favourable moment was inexhaustible. To him far more appropriately than to his great-grandfather might the name of William the Silent have been given. He had no confidence, except Waldeck and William Bentinck, and few could even guess at the hidden workings of that scheming mind or at the burning fires of energy and willpower beneath the proud and frigid reserve of a man so frail in body and always ailing. Very rarely could a born leader of men have been more unamiable or less anxious to win popular applause, but his whole demeanour inspired confidence and, ignoring the many difficulties and oppositions which thwarted him, he steadfastly bided his time and opportunity. It now came quickly, for the year 1685 was marked by two events, the accession of James II to the throne of England, and the revocation of the Edict of Nantes, which were to have far-reaching consequences. The new King of England was not merely a strong but a bigoted Roman Catholic. Had he been a wise and patriotic prince, he would have tried by a studiously moderate policy to win the loyal alliance of his subjects, but he was stubborn, wrong-headed and fanatical and from the first he aimed at the impossible. His attempts to establish absolute rule, to bring back the English nation to the fold of the Catholic Church, and, as a means to that end, to make himself independent of Parliament by accepting subsidies from the French king, were bound to end in catastrophe. This was more especially the case as Louis the Fourteenth had, at the very time of King James's accession, after having for a number of years persecuted the Huguenots in defiance of the Edict of Nantes, taken the step of revoking that great instrument of religious toleration on November 17, 1685. The exile of numerous families, who had already been driven out by the Dragonates, was now followed by the expulsion of the entire Huguenot body, of all at least who refused to conform to the Catholic faith. How many hundreds of thousands left their homes to find refuge in foreign lands, it is impossible to say, but amongst them were great numbers of industrious and skilled artisans and handicraftsmen, who sought asylum in the Dutch Republic, and there found a ready and sympathetic welcome. The arrival of these unhappy immigrants had the effect of arousing a strong feeling of indignation in Holland, and indeed throughout the provinces, against the government of Louis XIV. They began to see that the policy of the French king was not merely one of territorial aggression, but was a crusade against Protestantism. The governing classes in Holland, Zeeland, Friesland and Groningen were stirred up by the preachers to enforce more strictly the laws against the Catholics in those provinces, for genuine alarm was felt at the French menace to the religion for which their fathers had fought and suffered. The cause of Protestantism was one with which the Princes of Orange had identified themselves, but none of his ancestors was so keen an upholder of that cause as was William III. The presence in their midst of the Huguenot refugees had the effect of influencing public opinion powerfully in the States in favour of their stadtholders' warlike policy. Nor was the Dutch Republic the only state which was deeply moved by the ruthless treatment of his Protestant subjects by the French king. The elector of Brandenburg, 
as head of the principal protestant state in germany had also offered an asylum to the french exiles and now reverted once more to his natural alliance with the united provinces he sent his trusted counsellor paul fuchs in may sixteen eighty five to offer to his nephew the prince of orange his friendly cooperation in the formation of a powerful coalition against france fuchs was a skilled diplomatist and by his mediation an understanding was arrived at between the stadtholder and his opponents in amsterdam at the same time strong family influence was brought to bear upon henry casimir of friesland and a reconciliation between the two stadtholders was effected william thus found himself before the year sixteen eighty five came to an end able to pursue his policy without serious let or hindrance he was quite ready to seize his opportunity and by tactful diplomacy he succeeded by august sixteen eighty six in forming an alliance between the united provinces brandenburg sweden austria spain and a number of the smaller rhenish states to uphold the treaties of westphalia and nijmegen against the encroachments of french military aggression but the design of william was still incomplete the naval power and financial resources of england were needed to enable the coalition to grapple successfully with the mighty centralized power of louis the fourteenth in england the attempt of james the second to bring about a catholic reaction by the arbitrary use of the royal prerogative was rapidly alienating the loyalty of all classes including many men of high position and even some of his own ministers william watched keenly all that was going on and kept himself in close correspondence with several of the principal malcontents he was well aware that all eyes were turning to him and he accepted the position as the natural defender should the need arise of england's civil and religious liberties the need arose and the call came in the summer of sixteen eighty eight and it found william prepared the climax of the conflict between king james and his people was reached with the acquittal of the seven bishops in may sixteen eighty eight amidst public rejoicings speedily followed on june ten by the birth of a prince of wales the report was spread that the child was superstitious and it was accepted as true by large numbers of persons including the princess anne and also on the strength of her testimony by the prince and princess of orange the secret relations of william with the leaders of opposition had for some time been carried on through his trusted confidence dijkveld the state's envoy at the english court and william of nassau lord of zuilestein a bold step was now taken several englishmen of note signed an invitation to the prince to land in england with an armed force in defence of the religion and liberties of the country and it was brought to him by admiral russell one of the signatories after some hesitation william with the consent and approval of the princess decided to accept it no man ever had a more loyal and devoted wife than william the third of orange and he did not deserve it for some years after his marriage he treated mary with coldness and neglect he confessed on one occasion to bishop burnet that his churlishness was partly due to jealousy he could not bear the thought that mary might succeed to the english throne and he would in that country be inferior in rank to his wife the bishop informed the princess who at once warmly declared that she would never accept the crown unless her husband received not merely the title of king but the prerogatives of a reigning sovereign from that time forward a complete reconciliation took place between them and the affection and respect of william for this loyal warm-hearted and self-sacrificing woman deepened as the years went on mary's character as it is revealed in her private diaries which have been preserved deserves those epithets profoundly religious and a convinced protestant mary with prayers for guidance and not without many tears felt that the resolve of her husband to hazard all on armed intervention in england was fully justified and at this critical juncture she had no hesitation in allowing her sense of duty to her husband and her country to override that of a daughter to her father already in july vigorous preparations in all secrecy began to be made for the expedition the naval yards were working at full pressure with the ostensible object of sending out a fleet to suppress piracy in the mediterranean the stadtholder felt that he was able to rely upon the willing cooperation of the states in his project his difficulty now as always was to secure the assent of amsterdam but the opposition of that city proved less formidable than was anticipated the peril to protestantism should england under james the second be leagued with france was evident and scarcely less the security of the commerce on which amsterdam depended for its prosperity 
the support of Amsterdam secured that of the Estates of Holland, and finally, after thus surmounting successfully the elements of opposition in the town and the province, where the anti-Orange party was most strongly represented, the prince had little difficulty in obtaining, on October 8, the unanimous approval of the States General, assembled in secret session to the proposed expedition. By that time an army of 14,000 men had been gathered together and was encamped at Moak. Of these the six English and Scottish regiments, who now, as throughout the War of Independence, were maintained in the Dutch service, formed the nucleus. The force also comprised the Prince's Dutch guards and other picked Dutch troops, and also some German levies. Marshal Schomberg was in command. The pretext assigned was the necessity of protecting the eastern frontier of the Republic against an attack from Cologne, where Cardinal Fürstenberg, the nominee and ally of Louis XIV, had been elected to the archiepiscopal throne. Meanwhile, diplomacy was active. Davos was far too clear-sighted not to have discerned the real object of the naval and military preparations, and he warned both Louis XIV and James II. James, however, was obdurate and took no heed, while Louis played the enemy's game by declaring war on the emperor and the pope, and by invading the Palatinate instead of the Republic. For William had been doing his utmost to win over to his side, by the agency of Waldeck and Bentinck, the Protestant princes of Germany, with the result that Brandenburg, Hanover, Saxony, Brunswick and Hesse had undertaken to give him active support against a French attack, while the constant threat against her possessions in the Belgic Netherlands compelled Spain to join the anti-French League, which the stadtholder had so long been striving to bring into existence. To these were now added the Emperor and the Pope, who, being actually at war with France, were ready to look favorably upon an expedition which would weaken the common enemy. The grand alliance of William's dreams had thus, should his expedition to England prove successful, come within the range of practical politics, and with his base secured, Orange now determined to delay no longer, but to stake everything upon the issue of the English venture. The prince bade farewell to the States general on October 26, and four days later he set sail from Helvoetsluis, but was driven back by a heavy storm, which severely damaged the fleet. A fresh start was made on November 11. Admiral Herbert was in command of the naval force, which convoyed safely through the channel without opposition the long lines of transports. Over the prince's vessel floated his flag with the words Pro religione et libertate, inscribed above the motto of the House of Orange, Germain d'André. Without mishap, a landing was effected at Torbay, November 14, 5 OS, which was William's birthday, and a rapid march was made to Exeter. He met with no armed resistance. James's troops, his courtiers, his younger daughter, the Princess Anne, all deserted him, and finally, after sending away his wife and infant son to France, the king himself left his palace at Whitehall by night, and fled down the river to Sheerness. Here he was recognized and brought back to London. It was thought, however, best to connive at his escape, and he landed on the coast of France at Christmas. The expedition had achieved its object, and William, greeted as a deliverer, entered the capital at the head of his army. On February 13, 1689, a convention, specially summoned for the purpose, declared that James, by his flight, vacated the throne, and the crown was offered to William and Mary jointly, the executive power being placed in the hands of the prince. End of chapter 18「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cory Samuel. History of Holland by George Edmondson. Chapter 19. The King Stadtholder. 1688-1702. The accession of William III to the throne of England was an event fraught with important consequences to European politics and to the United Provinces. The King was enabled at last to realize the formation of that grand alliance for which he had so long been working. The Treaty of Vienna, signed on May 12, 1689, encircled France with a ring of enemies and saw the Emperor and Spain united with the Protestant powers, England, the States, and many of the German princes, in a bond of alliance for the maintenance of the treaties of Westphalia and the Pyrenees. 
It was not without some difficulty that William succeeded in inducing the states to enter into an offensive and defensive alliance with England. A special embassy, consisting of Whitson, Odeek, Dijkveld, and others, was sent to London early in 1689 to endeavour to bring about some mutually advantageous arrangement of the various conflicting maritime and commercial interests of the two countries. But they could effect nothing. The English government refused. Either to repeal or to modify the Navigation Act, or to reduce the toll for fishing privileges, and it required all the personal influence of William to secure the signing of a treaty, September third, which many leading Hollanders considered to be a subordinating of Dutch to English interests, and they were right. From this time began that decline of Dutch commercial supremacy, which was to become more and more marked as the eighteenth century progressed. The policy of William the Third, as Frederick the Great remarked most justly, placed Holland in a position of a sloop towed behind the English ship as a line. The carrying trade of the world was still, however, in the reign of William the Third, practically in the hands of the Dutch, despite the losses that had been sustained during the English wars and the French invasion. The only competitor was England under the shelter of the Navigation Act. The English had, under favourable conditions, Their staple at Dordrecht, the Scots their staple at Veer, and the volume of trade under the new conditions of close alliance was very considerable. But the imports largely exceeded the exports, and both exports and imports had to be carried in English bottoms. The Baltic or Eastern trade remained a Dutch monopoly, as did the trade with Russia through Archangel. Almost all the ships that passed through the Sound were Dutch, and they frequented all the Baltic ports. Whether Russian, Scandinavian, or German, bringing the commodities of the South and returning laden with hemp, tallow, wood, copper, iron, corn, wax, hides, and other raw products for distribution in other lands. The English had a small number of vessels in the Mediterranean and the Levant, and frequented the Spanish and Portuguese harbors, but as yet they hardly interfered with the Dutch carrying trade in those waters. The whole trade of Spain, with her vast American dominions, was by law restricted to the one port of Cadiz. But no sooner did the galleons bringing the rich products of Mexico and Peru reach Cadiz, than the bulk of their merchandise was quickly transhipped into Dutch vessels, which here, as elsewhere, were the medium through which the exchange of commodities between one country and another was effected. It was a profitable business, and the merchants of Amsterdam. And of the other Dutch commercial centres, grew rich and prospered. The position of the Dutch in the East Indies at the close of the seventeenth century is one of the marvels of history. The East India Company, with its flourishing capital at Batavia, outdistanced all competitors. It was supreme in the Indian archipelago, and along all the shores washed by the Indian Ocean. The Governor General was invested with great powers. And owing to his distance from the home authority, was able to make unfettered use of them during his term of office. He made treaties and conducted wars, and was looked upon by the princes and petty rulers of the Orient as a mighty potentate. The conquest of Macassar in 1669, the occupation of Jepara and Cherubon in 1680, of Bantam in 1682, of Pondicherry in 1693. Together with the possession of Malacca, and of the entire coast of Ceylon, of the Moluccas, and of the Cape of Good Hope, gave to the Dutch the control of all the chief avenues of trade throughout those regions. By treaties of alliance and commerce with the Great Mogul and other smaller sovereigns and chieftains, factories were established at Huli on the Ganges, at Kolim, Surat, Bender Abbas, Palembang, and many other places. In the Moluccas, they had the entire spice trade in their hands. Thus, a very large part of the products of the Orient found its way to Europe by way of Amsterdam, which had become increasingly the commercial emporium and centre of exchange for the world. The West India Company, on the other hand, had been ruined by the loss of its Brazilian dominion, followed by the English wars. Its charter came to an end in 1674. But it was replaced by a new company on a more moderate scale. Its colonies on the Guiana coast, 
Surinam, Berbice, and Essequibo were at the end of the 17th century in an impoverished condition, but already beginning to develop the sugar plantations, which were shortly to become a lucrative industry. And the island of Curaçao had the unenviable distinction of being for some years one of the chief centers of the Negro slave trade. In the United Provinces themselves, one of the features of this period was the growth of many new industries and manufactures, largely due to the influx of Huguenot refugees, many of whom were skilled artisans. Not only did the manufacturers of cloth and silk employ a large number of hands, but also those of hats, gloves, ribbons, trimmings, laces, clocks and other articles, which had hitherto been chiefly produced in France. One of the consequences of the rapid increase of wealth was a change in the simple habits, manners and dress, which hitherto travellers had noted as one of the most remarkable characteristics of the Hollanders. Greater luxury began to be displayed, French fashions and ways of life to be imitated, and the French language to be used as the medium of intercourse among the well-to-do classes. Another sign of the times was the spread of the spirit of speculation, and of gambling in stocks and shares, showing that men were no longer content to amass wealth by the slow process of ordinary trade and commerce. This state of prosperity, which was largely due to the security which the close alliance with England brought to the Republic, explains in no small measure the acquiescence of the Dutch in a state of things which made the smaller country almost a dependency of the larger. They were proud that their stadholder should reign as king in Britain, and his prolonged absences did not diminish their strong attachment to him, or lessen his authority among them. So much greater indeed was the power exercised by William in the Republic than that which, as a strictly constitutional sovereign, he possessed in the kingdom, that it was wittily said that the Prince of Orange was stadholder in England and king in Holland. It must not be supposed, however, that William in his capacity as stadholder was free from worries and trials. He had many, and, as usual, Amsterdam was the chief centre of unrest. After the expedition set sail for Torbay, William was continuously absent for no less than two and a half years. It is no wonder, therefore, that during so long a period, when the attention of the king was absorbed by other pressing matters, difficulties should have arisen in his administration of the affairs of the Republic. It was very unfortunate that his most able and trusted friend and adviser, the council pensionary Fagel, should have died in December 1688, just when William's enterprise in England had reached its most critical stage. Fagel was succeeded, after a brief interval, in his most important and influential office, by Antony Heinsius. Heinsius, who had been for some years pensionary of Delft, was a modest, quiet man, already forty-five years of age, capable, experienced, and businesslike. His tact and statesman's like qualities were of the greatest service to William, and scarcely less to his country, at a time when urgent duties in England made it so difficult for the stadtholder to give personal attention to the internal affairs of the Republic. No other Prince of Orange had ever so favourable an opportunity as William the Third for effecting such changes in the system of government and administration in the Dutch Republic as would simplify and coordinate its many rival and conflicting authorities, and weld its seven sovereign provinces into a coherent state with himself, under whatever title, as its eminent head. At the height of his power, his will could have overridden local or partisan opposition, for he had behind him the prestige of his name and deeds, and the overwhelming support of popular opinion. But William had little or no interest in these constitutional questions. Being childless, he had no dynastic ambitions. The nearest male representative of his house was Henry Casimir, the stadtholder of Friesland, with whom his relations had been far from friendly. In his mind, everything else was subordinate to the one and overruling purpose of his life. The overthrow of the power of Louis the Fourteenth and of French ascendancy in Europe. The great coalition which had been formed in 1689 by the Treaty of Vienna was, in the first years of the war which then broke out, 
attended with but mediocre success. The French armies laid waste the Palatinate with great barbarity, and then turned their attentions to the southern Netherlands. The attempted invasion was, however, checked by an allied force, August 25th, in a sharp encounter near Charleroi. The next year, 1690, was particularly unfortunate for the Allies. William was still absent, having been obliged to conduct an expedition to Ireland. He had placed the aged Marshal Waldeck in command of the coalition forces. Waldeck had the redoubtable Luxembourg opposed to him, and on July the 1st the two armies met at Fleurus, when, after a hard-fought contest, the Allies suffered a bloody defeat. An even greater setback was the victory gained by Admiral Tourville over the combined Anglo-Dutch fleet off Beachy Head, July 10th. The Dutch squadron under Cornelis Evertsen bore the brunt of the fight and suffered heavily. They received little help from the English contingent, and the English Admiral Torrington was accused of having willfully sacrificed his allies. The effect was serious, for the French enjoyed, for a while, the rare satisfaction of holding the command of the Channel. The complete triumph of King William at the Battle of the Boyne, July 12th, relieved somewhat the consternation felt at this naval disaster, and set him free to devote his whole attention to the Continental War. His return to The Hague, early in 1691, caused general rejoicing, and he was there able to concert with his allies the placing of a large force in the field for the ensuing campaign. The operations were, however, barren of any satisfactory results. Luxembourg advanced before the Allies were ready, and burnt and plundered a large tract of country. William, acting on the defensive, contented himself with covering the capital and the rest of Flanders and Brabant from attack, and no pitched battle took place. Great preparations were made by Louis XIV in the spring of 1692 for the invasion of England. Troops were collected on the coast, and the squadron under Destray at Toulon was ordered to join the main fleet of Tourville at Brest. Contrary winds delayed the junction, and Tourville rashly sailed out and engaged off La Hogue, a greatly superior Allied fleet, on May 29th. The conflict this time chiefly fell upon the English, and after a fierce fight the French were defeated and fled for refuge into the shoal waters. Here they were followed by the lighter vessels and fire ships of the Allies, and the greater part of the French fleet was either burnt or driven upon the rocks, June 1st. The maritime power of France was, for the time being, destroyed, and all fears of invasion dissipated. On land, ill success continued to dog the footsteps of the Allies. The strong fortress of Namur was taken by the French, and after a hotly contested battle at Steinkirk, William was compelled by his old adversary Luxembourg to retreat. William, though he was rarely victorious on the field of battle, had great qualities as a leader. His courage and coolness won the confidence of his troops, and he was never greater than in the conduct of a retreat. This was shown conspicuously in the following year, 1693, when, after a disastrous defeat at Neerwinden, July 29th, again at the hands of Luxembourg, he succeeded at imminent personal risk in withdrawing his army in good order in face of the superior forces of the victorious enemy. In 1694, the Allies confined themselves to defensive operations. Both sides were growing weary of war, and there were strong parties in favour of negotiating for peace, both in the Netherlands and in England. Some of the burgher regents of Amsterdam, Dordrecht, and other towns even went so far as to make secret overtures to the French government, and they had the support of the Frisian stadtholder. But William was resolutely opposed to accepting such conditions as France was willing to offer, and his strong will prevailed. The position of the king in England was made more difficult by the lamented death of Queen Mary on January 2, 1695. William had become deeply attached to his wife during these last years, and for a time he was prostrated by grief. But a strong sense of public duty roused him from his depression, 
and the campaign of 1695 was signalized by the most brilliant military exploit of his life, the recapture of Namur. That town, strong by its natural position, had been fortified by Vauban with all the resources of engineering skill, and was defended by a powerful garrison commanded by Marshal Buffler. But William had with him the famous Cohorn, in scientific siege warfare the equal of Vauban himself. At the end of a month the town of Namur was taken, but Buffler withdrew to the citadel. Villeroy, at the head of an army of ninety thousand men, did his utmost to compel the king to raise the siege, by threatening Brussels, but a strong allied force watched his movements, and successfully barred his approach to Namur. At last, on September the 5th, Buffler capitulated after a gallant defence, on the condition that he and his troops should march out with all the honours of war. The campaign of 1696 was marked by no event of importance. Indeed, both sides were thoroughly tired out by the protracted and inconclusive contest. Moreover, the failing health of Charles II of Spain threatened to open out at any moment the vital question of the succession to the Spanish throne. Louis the Fourteenth, William the Third, and the Emperor were all keenly alive to the importance of the issue, and wished to have their hands free in order to prepare for a settlement, either by diplomatic means or by a fresh appeal to arms. But peace was the immediate need, and overtures were privately made by the French king to each of the Allied powers in 1696. At last it was agreed that plenipotentiaries from all the belligerents should meet in Congress at Rieswick near The Hague, with the Swedish Count Lilienrot as mediator. The Congress was opened on May 9, 1697, but many weeks elapsed before the representatives of the various powers settled down to business. Heinsius and Dijkveld were the two chief Dutch negotiators. The Emperor, when the other powers had come to terms, refused to accede, and finally England, Spain, and the United Provinces determined to conclude a separate peace. It was signed on September 20th, and was based on the treaties of Nijmegen and Münster. France, having ulterior motives, had been conciliatory. Strasbourg was retained, but most of the French conquests were given up. William was recognised as King of England, and the Principality of Orange was restored to him. With the Dutch, a commercial treaty was concluded, for twenty-five years on favourable terms. It was well understood, however, by all the parties, that the Peace of Rieswick was a truce, during which the struggle concerning the Spanish succession would be transferred from the field of battle to the field of diplomacy, in the hope that some solution might be found. The question was clearly of supreme importance to the States, for it involved the destiny of the Spanish Netherlands. England, too, had great interests at stake, and was determined to prevent the annexation of the Belgic provinces by France. With Charles II, the male line of the Spanish Habsburgs became extinct, and there were three principal claimants in the female line of succession. The claim of the Dauphin was much the strongest, for he was the grandson of Anne of Austria, Philip III's eldest daughter, and the son of Maria Theresa of Austria, Charles II's eldest sister. But both these queens of France had, on their marriage, solemnly renounced their rights of succession, Louis the Fourteenth, however, asserted that his wife's renunciation was invalid, since the dowry, the payment of which was guaranteed by the marriage contract, had never been received. The younger sister of Maria Theresa had been married to the emperor, and two sons and a daughter had been the fruit of the union. This daughter in her turn had wedded the elector of Bavaria, and had issue one boy of ten years. The elector himself, Maximilian Emmanuel, had been for five years governor of the Spanish Netherlands, where his rule had been exceedingly popular. William knew that one of the chief objects of the French king in concluding peace was to break up the Grand Alliance, and so prepare the way for a masterful assertion of his rights as soon as the Spanish throne was vacant. And with patient diplomatic skill, he set to work at once to arrange for such a partition of the Spanish monarchy among the claimants 
as should prevent the Belgic provinces from falling into the hands of a first-class power, and preserve Spain itself, with its overseas possessions, from the rule of a Bourbon prince. He had no difficulty in persuading the states to increase their fleet and army, in case diplomacy should fail, for the Dutch were only too well aware of the seriousness of the French menace to their independence. In England, where jealousy of a standing army had always been strong, he was less successful, and Parliament insisted on the disbanding of many thousands of seasoned troops. The object at which William aimed was a partition treaty, and a partition was actually arranged October 11, 1698. This arrangement, according to the ideas of the time, paid no respect whatever to the wishes of the peoples, who were treated as mere pawns by these unscrupulous diplomatists. The Spanish people, as might be expected, were vehemently opposed to any partition of the empire of Charles V and Philip II, and in consequence of the influences that were brought to bear upon him, Charles II left by will the young electoral prince, Joseph Ferdinand, heir to his whole inheritance. By the secret terms of the partition treaty, the crown of Spain, together with the Netherlands and the American colonies, had been assigned to the Bavarian claimant. But the Spanish dominions in Italy were divided between the two other claimants, the second son of the Dauphin, Philip, Duke of Anjou, receiving Naples and Sicily, the second son of the Emperor, the Archduke Charles the Milanese. Unfortunately, Joseph Ferdinand fell sick of the smallpox and died, March 1699. With William and Hyacinus, the main point now was to prevent the French prince from occupying the Spanish throne, and in all secrecy negotiations were again opened at The Hague for a second partition treaty. They found Louis the Fourteenth still willing to conclude a bargain. To the Duke of Anjou was now assigned, in addition to Naples and Sicily, the Duchy of Lorraine, whose duke was to receive the Milanese in exchange. The rest of the Spanish possessions were to fall to the Archduke Charles, March 1700. The terms of this arrangement between the French king and the maritime powers did not long remain a secret, and when they were known they displeased the emperor, who did not wish to see French influence predominant in Italy and his own excluded and still more the Spanish people, who objected to any partition, and to the Austrian ruler. The palace of Charles II became a very hotbed of intrigues, and finally the dying king was persuaded to make a fresh will, and to nominate Anjou as his universal heir. Accordingly, on Charles's death, November 1st, 1700, Philip V was proclaimed king. For a brief time... Louis was doubtful as to what course of action would be most advantageous to French interests, but not for long. On November the 11th, he publicly announced to his court at Versailles that his grandson had accepted the Spanish crown. This step was followed by the placing of French garrisons in some of the frontier fortresses of the Belgic Netherlands by consent of the governor, the elector of Bavaria. The following months were spent in the vain efforts of diplomacy to obtain such guarantees from the French king as would give security to the states and satisfaction to England and the emperor, and so avoid the outbreak of war. In the states, Heinsius, who was working heart and soul with the stadtholder in this crisis, had no difficulty in obtaining the full support of all parties, even in Holland, to the necessity of making every effort to be ready for hostilities. William had a more difficult task in England, but he had the support of the Whig majority in Parliament and of the commercial classes, and he laboured hard, despite constant and increasing ill health, to bring once more into existence the Grand Alliance of 1689. In July, negotiations were opened between the maritime powers and the Emperor at The Hague, which, after lengthy discussions, were brought to a conclusion in September, in no small degree through the tact and persuasiveness of Lord Marlborough the English envoy, who had now begun that career which was shortly to make his name so famous. The chief provisions of the Treaty of Alliance, signed on September 7th, 1701, were that Austria was to have the Italian possessions of Spain, the Belgic provinces were to remain as a barrier and protection for Holland against French aggression, and England and the States were to retain any conquests they might make in the Spanish West Indies. 
nothing was said about the crown of Spain, a silence which implied a kind of recognition of Philip V. To this league were joined Prussia, Hanover, Lüneburg, Hesse Cassel, while France, to whom Spain was now allied, could count on the help of Bavaria. War was not yet declared, but at this very moment Louis the Fourteenth took a step which was wantonly provocative. James the Second died at Saint Germain on September sixth, and his son was at once acknowledged by Louis as King of England by the title of James the Third. This action aroused a storm of indignation among the English people, and William found himself supported by public opinion in raising troops and obtaining supplies for war. The preparations were on a vast scale. The emperor undertook to place ninety thousand men in the field, England forty thousand, the German states fifty-four thousand, and the republic no less than one hundred thousand. William had succeeded at last in the object of his life. A mighty confederation had been called into being to maintain the balance of power in Europe and overthrow the threatened French domination. This confederation in arms, of which he was the soul. And the acknowledged head was destined to accomplish the object for which it was formed, but not under his leadership. The king had spent the autumn in Holland in close consultation with Heinsius, visiting the camps, the arsenals, and the dockyards, and giving instructions to the admirals and generals to have everything in readiness for the campaign of the following spring. Then, in November, he went to England to hurry on the preparations. Which were in a more backward condition than in the states, but he had overtaxed his strength. Always frail and ailing, William had, for years, by sheer force of willpower, conquered his bodily weakness and endured the fatigue of campaigns in which he was content to share all hardships with his soldiers. In his double capacity too of king and stadholder, the cares of government and the conduct of foreign affairs had left him no rest. Especially had this been the case in England during the years which had followed Queen Mary's death, when he found himself opposed and thwarted and humiliated by party intrigues and cabals, to such an extent that he more than once thought of abdicating. He was feeling very ill and tired when he returned, and he grew weaker, for the winter in England always tried him. His medical advice warned him. That his case was one for which medicine was of no avail, and that he was not fit to bear the strain of the work he was doing. But the indomitable spirit of the man would not give way, and he still hoped with the spring to be able to put himself at the head of his army. It was not to be; an accident was the immediate cause by which the end came quickly. He was riding in Bushy Park when his horse stumbled over a molehill, and the king was thrown, breaking his collarbone. March fourteenth, seventeen o two. The shock proved fatal in his enfeebled state, and after lingering for four days, during which, in full possession of his mental faculties, he continued to discuss affairs of state, he calmly took leave of his special friends, Bentinck, Earl of Portland, and Keppel, Earl of Albemarle, and of the English statesmen who stood round his deathbed, and after thanking them for their services. Passed away. For four generations, the House of Orange had produced great leaders of men, but it may be said, without disparagement to his famous predecessors, that the last heir male of that house was the greatest of them all. He saved the Dutch Republic from destruction, and during the thirty years of what has well been called his reign, he gave to it a weighty place in the councils of Europe, and raised it to a height of great material prosperity. But even such services as these were dwarfed by the part that he played in laying the foundation of constitutional monarchy in England, and of the balance of power in Europe. It is difficult to say whether Holland, England, or Europe owed the deepest debt to the life work of William the Third. End of chapter nineteen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information 
or to find out how to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of Holland by George Edmondson. Chapter 20. Chapter Summary. The War of the Spanish Succession and the Treaties of Utrecht. 1702-1715. William III left no successor to take his place. The younger branch of the Nassau family, who had been, from the time of John of Nassau, stadtholders of Friesland, and except for one short interval of Groningen, and who, by the marriage of William Frederick with Albertina Agnes, younger daughter of Frederick Henry, could claim descent in the female line from William the Silent, had rendered for several generations distinguished services to the Republic. But in 1702 had as its only representative a boy of fourteen years of age, by John William Friso, as already narrated the relations between his family, Henry Casimir and William the Third, had for some time been far from friendly, but a reconciliation took place before Henry Casimir's untimely death, and the king became godfather to John William Friso, and by his will left him his heir. The boy had succeeded by hereditary right to the posts of Stadtholder and Captain General of Friesland and Groningen, under the guardianship of his mother. But such claims as he had to succeed William the Third as Stadtholder in the other provinces were, on account of his youth, completely ignored. As in 1650, Holland, Zeeland, Utrecht, Gelderland and Overissel reverted once more to a Stadtholderless form of government. Fortunately, this implied no change of external policy. The men who had for years been fellow workers with King William and were in complete sympathy with his aims continued to hold the most important posts in the government of the Republic and to control its policy. That policy consisted in the maintenance of a close alliance with England for the purpose of curbing the ambitious designs of Louis the Fourteenth. For most among these statesmen were Anthony Heinsius, the council pensionary of Holland, Simon van Slinkeland, secretary of the Council of State since 1690, and Jan Hop, the treasurer general of the Union. In England, the recognition by Louis of the Prince of Wales as King James the Third had thoroughly aroused the popular feeling against France, and Anne the new queen determined to carry out her predecessor's plans. The two maritime powers, closely bound together by common interests, and the ties which had arisen between them during the thirteen years of the reign of the King Stadtholder, were to form the nucleus of a coalition with Austria and the number of the German states, including Prussia and Hanover, to which Savoy somewhat later adhered, pledged to support the claims of the Archduke Charles to the Spanish throne. For the Dutch, it was an all-important question, for which Philip V, reigning at Madrid, the hegemony of France in Europe, seemed to be assured. Already French troops were in possession of the chief fortresses of the so-called Spanish Netherlands. Face to face with such a menace, it was not difficult for Heinsius to obtain not only the assent of the States-General, but of the Estates of Holland, practically without a dissenting voice, to declare war upon France and Spain, May the 8th, 1702, and this was quickly followed by similar declarations by England and Austria. The Grand Alliance had an outward appearance of great strength, but in reality it had all the weaknesses of a coalition, its armies being composed of contingents from a number of countries, whose governments had divergent aims and strategic objects, and it was opposed by a power under absolute rule, with numerous and veteran armies, inspired by a long tradition of victory under brilliant leaders. In 1702, however, the successors of Turenne and Luxembourg were by no means of the same calibre as those great generals. On the other hand, the Allies were doubly fortunate in being led by a man of exceptional gifts, John Churchill. Earl, and sometimes afterwards Duke of Marlborough, was placed in supreme command of the Anglo-Dutch armies. Through the influence of his wife, with the weak Queen Anne, the Whig party, of which Marlborough and his friend Godolphin, the Lord Treasurer, were the heads, 
was maintained in secure possession of power, and Marlborough thus entered upon his command in the full confidence of having the unwavering support of the home government behind him. Still, this would have availed little but for the consummate abilities of this extraordinary man. As a general, he displayed a military genius, both as a strategist and a tactician, which has rarely been surpassed. For ten years he pursued a career of victory, not marred by a single defeat, and this in spite of the fact that his army was always composed of heterogeneous elements, that his subordinates of different nationalities were jealous of his authority and of one another, and above all, as will be seen, that his bold and well-laid plans were again and again hindered and thwarted by the timidity and obstinacy of the civilian deputies, who were placed by the States-General at his side. Had Marlborough been unhampered, the war would probably have ended some years before it did. As it was, the wonderful successes of the general were made possible by his skill and tact as a diplomatist. He had, moreover, the good fortune to have at his side in the imperialist general, Prince Eugène of Savoy, a commander second only to himself in brilliance and leadership. In almost all wars, the Austrian alliance has proved a weak support on which to trust. But now, thanks to the outstanding capacity of Eugène, the armies of Austria were able to achieve many triumphs. The vigorous participation of the Emperor in this war, in support of the claims of his second son, was only made possible by the victories of the Italian general over the Turks, who had overrun Hungary and threatened Vienna and now in the still more important sphere of operations in the West, in which for a series of years he had to cooperate with Marlborough. It is to the infinite credit of both these great men that they worked harmoniously and smoothly together, so that at no time was there even a hint of any jealousy between them. In any estimate of the great achievements of Marlborough, it must never be forgotten that he not only had Eugène at his right hand in the field, but Hainzius in the council chamber. Hainzius had always worked loyally and sympathetically with William the Third, and it was in the same spirit that he worked with the English Duke, who brought William's life task to its triumphant accomplishment. Between Marlborough and Hainzius, as between Marlborough and Eugène, there was no friction, surely a convincing tribute to the adroit and tactful persuasiveness of a commanding personality. In July 1702, Marlborough, at the head of 65,000 men, faced Marshal Boufflet with a French army almost as strong numerically, the one in front of Nijmegen, the other in the neighbourhood of Liège, leaving a force of 25,000 Dutch and Brandenburgers to besiege Kaiserswerth. Marlborough, by skilful manoeuvring, prevented Boufflet from attempting a relief, and would on two occasions have been able to inflict a severe defeat upon him, had he not been each time thwarted by the cautious timidity of the Dutch deputy. Kaiserswerth, however, fell, and in turn, Reimberg, Von Lu, Rumont, and Liège, and the campaign ended successfully, leaving the Allies in command of the Lower Rhine and Lower Meuse. That of 1703 was marred even more effectually than that of the previous year by the interference of the deputies and the ill-concealed opposition to Marlborough of certain Dutch generals, notably of Slangerberg. The Duke was very angry and bitter recriminations ensued. In the end, Slangerberg was removed from his command and the appointment of Oakerk as the field marshal of the Dutch forces relieved the tension though the deputies were still present at headquarters, much to Marlborough's annoyance. The campaign resulted in the capture of Bonn, Huy, and Limburg, but there was no general action. The year 1704 saw the genius of Marlborough at length assert itself. The French had placed great armies in the field, Fielroy in the Netherlands, Tallard in Bavaria, where in conjunction with the Bavarian forces, he threatened to descend the Danube into the heart of Austria. Vienna itself was in the greatest danger, 
the troops under Louis of Baden and under Eugène were, even when united, far weaker than their adversaries. In these circumstances, Marlborough, determined by a bold strategical stroke to execute a flank march from the Netherlands right across the front of the Franco-Bavarian army, and effect a junction with the imperialists. He had to deceive the timid Dutch deputies by feigning to descend the Meuse with the intention of working round Villeroy's flank, then leaving Urquerque to contain that marshal. He set out on his daring adventure early in May, and carried it out with complete success. His departure had actually relieved the Netherlands, for Villeroy had felt it necessary, with a large part of his forces, to follow Marlborough, and reinforced the Franco-Bavarians under Marshal Tallard and the Elector. The two armies met at Blenheim, Hochstadt, on August the 13th. The battle resulted in the crushing victory of the Allies under Marlborough and Eugène. 11,000 prisoners were taken, among them Tallard himself. The remnant of the French army retired across the Rhine. Vienna was saved and all Bavaria was overrun by the imperialists. Meanwhile, at sea, the Anglo-Dutch fleet was incontestably superior to the enemy, and the operations were confined to the immediate neighbourhood of the peninsula. William III had, before his death, been preparing an expedition for the capture of Cadiz. His plan was actually carried out in 1702, when a powerful fleet under the supreme command of Admiral Sir George Rook sailed for Cadiz, but the attack failed owing to the incompetence of the Duke of Ormond, who commanded the military forces. In this expedition a strong Dutch squadron under Philip van Almonde participated. Almonde was a capable seaman, trained in the school of Stromp and de Rutte, and he took a most creditable part in the action of Vigo, October the 23rd, which a large portion of the silver fleet was captured and the Franco-Spanish fleet, which formed its escort, destroyed. The maritime operations of 1703 were uneventful, the French fleet being successfully blockaded in Toulon harbour. The accession of Portugal in the course of this year to the Grand Alliance was important in that it opened the estuary of the Tagus as a naval base, and enabled the Archduke Charles to land with a body of troops escorted by an Anglo-Dutch fleet and a rook, and Kallenberg. This fleet, later in the year, August 4th, was fortunate in capturing Gibraltar, without much loss, the defences having been neglected and inadequately garrisoned. In this feat of arms, which gave to the English the possession of the rock fortress that commands the entrance into the Mediterranean, the Dutch, under Kallenberg, had a worthy share, as also in the great sea fight off Malaga on August the 24th against the French fleet under the Count of Toulouse. The French had slightly superior numbers, and the Allies, who had not replenished their stores after the siege of Gibraltar, were short of ammunition. Though a drawn battle, so far as actual losses were concerned, it was decisive in its results. The French fleet withdrew to the shelter of Toulon Harbour, and the Allies' supremacy in the Midland Sea was never again throughout the wars seriously challenged. The Dutch ships at the Battle of Malaga were twelve in number, and fought gallantly, but it was the last action of any importance in which the navy of Holland took part. There had been dissensions between the English and Dutch commanders, and from this time forward the admiralties made no effort to maintain their fleet in the state of efficiency in which it had been left by William the Third. The cost of the army fell heavily upon Holland, and money was grudged for the maintenance of the navy, whose services, owing to the weakness of the enemy, were not required. The military campaign of 1705 produced small results, the plans of Marlborough for an active offensive being thwarted by the Dutch deputies. The Duke's complaints only resulted in one set of deputies being replaced by another set of civilians equally impracticable. There was also another reason for a slackening of vigour. The Emperor Leopold I died on May the 5th. His successor, Joseph I, had no children, so that the Archduke Charles became the heir apparent to all the possessions of the Austrian Habsburgs. Louis XIV, therefore, seized the opportunity to make secret overtures of peace to some of the more influential Dutch statesmen, 
for the Marquis d'Alegna, at that time a prisoner in the hands of the Dutch. The French were willing to make many concessions in return for the recognition of Philip V as King of Spain. In the autumn, Puy, the pensionary of Amsterdam, and others, with d'Alegna and Rue, an accredited agent of the French government. Matters went so far that Puy went to London on a secret mission to discuss the matter with the English minister. The English cabinet, however, refused to recognise Philip V, and as the Dutch demand for a strong barrier of fortresses along the frontier of Netherlands was deemed inadmissible at Versailles, the negotiations came to an end. In 1706, Marlborough's bold proposal to join Eugène in Italy, and with their united forces to drive the French out of that country, and to march upon Toulon, failed to gain the assent of the Dutch deputies. The Duke, after much controversy and consequent delay, had to content himself with a campaign in Belgium. It was brilliantly carried out. On Whit Sunday, May the 23rd, at Ramillies, the Allies encountered the enemy under the command of Marshal Villeroy and the Elector of Bavaria. The French were utterly defeated with very heavy loss, and such was the vigour of the pursuit that the shattered army was obliged to retire to Coutre, leaving Brabant and Flanders undefended. In rapid succession, Louvain, Antwerp, Ghent, Bruges and other towns surrendered to Marlborough, and a little later Ostend, Dendermond, Manin and At, and the Archduke Charles was acknowledged as sovereign by the greater part of the southern Netherlands. In Italy and Spain also things had gone well with the Allies. This series of successes led Louis the Fourteenth to make fresh overtures of peace to the States General, whom the French king hoped to seduce from the Grand Alliance by the bait of commercial advantages, both with Spain and France, and a good barrier. He was even ready to yield the crown of Spain to the Archduke Charles, on condition that Philippa of Anjou were acknowledged as sovereign of the Spanish possessions in Italy. Heinsius, however, was loyal to the English alliance, and in face of the determination of the English government not to consent to any division of the Spanish inheritance, the negotiations again came to nothing. The year 1707 saw a change of fortune. Austria was threatened by the victorious advance of Charles the Twelfth of Sweden through Poland into Saxony. A French army under Villars crossed the Rhine, May 27th, and advanced far into southeastern Germany. The defence of their own territories caused several of the German princes to retain their troops at home instead of sending them as mercenaries to serve in the Netherlands, under Marlborough. The Duke, therefore, found himself unable to attack the superior French army under Vendôme, and acted steadfastly on the defensive. An attempt by Eugène, supported by the English fleet to capture Toulon, ended in dismal failure, and the retreat of the imperialists, with heavy loss into Italy. In Spain, the victory of Berwick at Almanza made Philip V the master of all Spain, except a part of Catalonia. But, though Marlborough had been reduced to immobility in 1707, the following campaign was to witness another of his wonderful victories. At the head of a mixed force of 80,000 men, he was awaiting the arrival of Eugène with an imperialist army of 35,000 when Vendôme unexpectedly took the offensive, while he still had superiority in numbers over his English opponent. Rapidly overrunning western Flanders, he made himself master of Bruges and Ghent, and led siege to Oudenard. By a series of brilliant movements, Marlborough outmarched and outmaneuvered his adversary, and interposing his army between him and the French frontier, compelled him to risk a general engagement. It took place on July the 11th, 1708, and ended in the complete defeat of the French, who were only saved by the darkness from utter destruction. Had the bold project of Marlborough to march into France forthwith been carried out, a deadly blow would have been delivered against the very vitals of the enemy's power, and Louis XIV probably compelled to sue for peace on the Allies' terms. But this time, not only the Dutch deputies, but also Eugène, were opposed to the daring venture, and it was decided that Eugène 
should besiege Lille, while Marlborough, with the field army, covered the operations. Lille was strongly fortified, and Marshal Boufflet made a gallant defence. The siege began in mid-August. The town surrendered on October the 22nd, but the citadel did not fall until December the 9th. Vendôme did his best to cut off Eugène's supply of munitions and stores, and at one time the besiegers were reduced to straits. The French marshal did not, however, venture to force an engagement with Marlborough's covering army, a portion of which, under General Webb, after gaining a striking victory over a French force at Huenendal, September 13th, conducted, at a critical moment, a large train of supplies from Ostend into Eugène's camp. As a consequence of the capture of Lille, the French withdrew from Flanders into their own territory, Ghent and Bruges being reoccupied by the Allies with a mere show of resistance. The reverses of 1708 induced the French king to be ready to yield much for the sake of peace. He offered the Dutch a strong barrier, a favourable treaty of commerce, and the demolition of the defences of Dunkirk. And there were many in Holland who would have accepted his terms, but their English and Austrian allies insisted on the restoration of Louis's German conquests, and that the king should, by force if necessary, compel his grandson to leave Spain. Such was the exhaustion of France that Louis would have consented to almost any terms, however harsh, but he refused absolutely to use coercion against Philip V. The negotiations went on through the spring, nor did they break down until June 1709, when the exorbitant demands of the Allies made further progress impossible. Louis issued a manifesto calling upon his subjects to support him in resisting terms which were dishonouring to France. He met with a splendid response from all classes, and a fine army of 90,000 men was equipped and placed in the field under the command of Marshal Villa. The long delay of the negotiations prevented Marlborough and Eugène from taking the field until June. They found Villa had meanwhile entrenched himself in Artois, in a very strong position. Marlborough's proposal to advance by the sea-coast and outflank the enemy, being opposed both by Eugène and the Dutch deputies, as too daring. Siege was laid to Tournay. Campaigns in those days were dilatory affairs. Tournay was not captured until September the 3rd, and the Allies, having overcome this obstacle without any active interference, move forward to besiege Mont. They found Villa posted at Malplaquet on a narrow front, skilfully fortified and protected on both flanks by woods. A terrible struggle ensued, September 11, 1709, the bloodiest in the war. The Dutch troops, gallantly led by the Prince of Orange, attacked the French right, but were repulsed with very heavy losses. For some time the fight on the left and the centre of the French line was undecided, the attacking columns being driven back many times. But at length the Allies succeeded in turning the extreme left, and also after fearful slaughter in piercing the centre, and the French were compelled to retreat. They had lost 12,000 men, but 23,000 of the Allies had fallen. The Dutch divisions had suffered the most heavily, losing almost half their strength. The immediate result of this hard-won victory was the taking of Mons. October the 9th. The lateness of the season prevented any further operations. Nothing decisive had been achieved, for on all the other fields of action, on the ride, on the Piedmont frontier, and in Spain, the advantage had on the whole been with the French and Spaniards. Negotiations proceeded during the winter, 1709 to 1710. Dutch and French representatives meeting both at The Hague and at Geertrudenberg, the states were anxious for peace and Louis was willing to make the concessions required of him, but Philip V refused to relinquish a crown, which he held by the practically unanimous approval of the Spanish people. The Emperor, on the other hand, was obstinate in claiming the undivided Spanish inheritance for the Archduke Charles. The maritime powers, however, would not support him in this claim, and the maritime powers meant England, for Holland followed her lead, being perfectly satisfied with the conditions of the First Barrier Treaty, which had been drawn up and agreed upon between the States General and the English Government on October the 29th, 1709. By this secret treaty, the Dutch obtained the right 
to hold and to garrison a number of towns along the French frontier, the possession of which would render them the real masters of Belgium. Indeed, it was manifest that, although the Dutch did not dispute the sovereign rights of the Archduke Charles, they intended to make the southern Netherlands an economic dependency of the Republic, which provided for its defence. The negotiations at Heertudenberg dragged on until July 1710, and were finally broken off owing to the insistence of the Dutch envoys Ries and Van Dusen, upon conditions which, even in their exhausted state, France was too proud to concede. Meanwhile, Marlborough and Eugène, unable to tend Villars to risk a battle, contented themselves with a succession of sieges. Douai, Bethune, saint vanon and Anne fell, one after the other, the French army keeping watch behind its strongly fortified lines. This was a very meagre result, but Marlborough now felt his position to be so insecure that he dared not take any risks. His wife, so long omnipotent at court, had been supplanted in the Queen's favour. Godolphin and the Whig party had been swept from power, and a Tory ministry, bent upon peace, had taken their place. Marlborough knew that his period of dictatorship was at an end, and he would have resigned his command, but for the pressing instances of Eugène, Hensius, and other leaders of the Allies. The desire of the Tory ministry to bring the long-drawn-out hostilities to an end was accentuated by the death on April 17, 1711, of the Emperor Joseph, an event which left his brother Charles heir to all the possession of the Austrian Habsburgs. The Grand Alliance had been formed, and the war waged to maintain the balance of power in Europe, but such a result would not be achieved by a revival of the Empire of Charles V, and the person of the man who had now become the head of the House of Austria. Even had the Whigs remained in office, they could hardly have continued to give active support to the cause of the Habsburg claimant in Spain. One of the consequences of the death of Joseph I, then, was to render the Tory minister, Henry St. John, more anxious to enter into negotiations for peace. Another was the paralysing of active operations in the field. Eugène had been summoned to Germany to watch over the meeting of the Imperial Diet at Frankfurt, and Marlborough was left with an army considerably inferior in numbers to that of his opponent, Villas. Thus, the only fruit of the campaign was the capture of Bouchon. Meanwhile, the French minister, Torcy, entered into secret communications with St. John, intimating that France was ready to negotiate directly with England, but at first without the cognizance of the States. The English ministry, on their part, under the influence of St. John, showed themselves to be ready to throw over their allies, to abandon the Habsburg cause in Spain, and to come to an agreement with France on terms advantageous to England. For French diplomacy, always alert and skilful, these proceedings were quite legitimate, but it was scarcely honourable for the English government, while the Grand Alliance was still in existence, to carry on these negotiations in profound secrecy. In August, matters had so far advanced that Miss Nijat was sent over from Paris to London and trusted with definite proposals. In October, the preliminaries of peace were virtually settled between the two powers. Meanwhile, the Dutch had been informed through Lord Strafford, the English envoy at The Hague, of what was going on, and the news aroused no small indignation and alarm, but great pressure was brought to bear upon them, and knowing that without England they could not continue the war, the States-General at last, in fear for their barrier, consented on November 21st to send envoys to a peace congress to be held at Utrecht on the basis of the Anglo-French preliminaries. It was in vain that the Emperor Charles VI protested both at London and The Hague, or that Eugène was dispatched on a special mission to England in January 1712. The English ministry had made up their minds to conclude peace with or without the Emperor's assent, and the Congress opened at the beginning of the year 1712 without the presence of any Austrian plenipotentiaries, though they appeared later. The Dutch provinces sent two envoys each, the conferences at Utrecht were, however, little more than futile debates, and the Congress was held there rather as a concession to save the amour propre of the States rather than to settle the terms of peace. The real negotiations were carried on secretly between England and France, 
and after a visit by St. John, now Viscount Bolingbroke, in person to Paris, in August, all points of difference between the two governments were amicably arranged. Spain followed the lead of France, and the States, knowing that they could not go on with the war without England, were reluctantly obliged to accept the Anglo-French proposals. Their concurrence might not have been so easily obtained, but for the unfortunate course of the campaign of 1712. Marlborough had now been replaced in the chief command by the Duke of Ormond. Eugène, counting upon English support, had taken Quenois on July the 4th, and was about to invest Londresy, when Ormond informed him that an armistice had been concluded between the French and English governments. On July the 16th, the English contingent withdrew to Dunkirk, which had been surrendered by the French as a pledge of good faith. Villas seized the opportunity to make a surprise attack on the isolated Dutch at the bridge of Denon, July the 24th, and a panic taking place completely annihilated their whole force of 12,000 men, with slight loss to himself. Eugène had to retreat, abandoning his magazines, and Douai, Quenoy, and Bouchon fell into the hands of the French marshal. These disasters convinced the Dutch of their helplessness when deprived of English help, and instructions were given to their envoys at Utrecht on December the 29th to give their assent to the terms agreed upon, and indeed dictated by the governments of England and France. Making the best of the situation, the Dutch statesmen, confronted with the growing self-assertion of the French plenipotentiaries, concluded on January the 30th, 1713, a new offensive and defensive alliance with England. This treaty of alliance is commonly called the Second Barrier Treaty, because it abrogated the Barrier Treaty of 1709, and was much more favourable to France. It was not until all these more or less secret negotiations were over, that the Congress, after being suspended for some months, resumed its sittings at Utrecht. The Peace of Utrecht, which ensued, is really a misnomer, no general treaty was agreed upon and signed, but a series of separate treaties between the belligerent powers. This was what France had been wishing for for some time, and by the connivance of England she achieved it. The treaty between these two countries was signed on April the 11th, 1713, and such was the dominant position of England that her allies, with the single exception of the Emperor, had to follow her lead. Treaties with the States General, with Savoy, Brandenburg and Portugal were all signed on the same day. Louis the Fourteenth had good right to congratulating himself on obtaining far more favourable terms than he could have dared to hope in 1710 or 11. Philip V was recognised as King of Spain and the Indies, but had solemnly to renounce his right of succession to the French throne and his claim to the Spanish possessions in the Netherlands and in Italy. The treaty between England and Spain was signed on July the 13th, 1713. That between the States General and Spain was delayed until June the 26th, 1714, owing to the difficulties raised by the Emperor, who, though deserted by his allies, continued the war single-handed, but with a single lack of success. He was forced to yield and make peace at Rastatt, in a treaty which was confirmed by the Imperial Diet at Baden in Switzerland on September 7th, 1714. By this treaty, the French king retained practically all his conquests, while Charles the Sixth, though he did not recognise the title of Philip V, contented himself with the acquisition of the Spanish Netherlands and of the Milanese and Naples. Into the details of these several treaties it is unnecessary here to enter, except in so far as they affected the United Provinces. The power that benefited more than any other was Great Britain, for the Peace of Utrecht laid the foundation of her colonial empire, and left her, from this time forward, the first naval and maritime power in the world. Holland, though her commerce was still great, and her colonial possessions both rich and extensive, had henceforth to see herself more and more overshadowed, and dominated by her former rival. Nevertheless, the treaties concluded by the States General at this time, were decidedly advantageous to the Republic. That with France, signed on April the 11th, 1713, placed the Spanish Netherlands in the possession of the States General, to be held by them in trust for Charles the Sixth, till such time as the Emperor came to an agreement with them 
about a barrier. France in this matter acted in the name of Spain, and was the intermediary, through whose good officers Spanish or Upper Gelderland was surrendered to Prussia. Most important of all to the Dutch was the treaty with the Emperor, concluded at Antwerp, November the 15th, 1715. This is generally styled the Third Barrier Treaty, the first being that of 1709, the second that of 1713 at Utrecht. The States General finally obtained what was for their interest a thoroughly satisfactory settlement. They obtained the right to place garrisons, amounting in all to 35,000 men, in Furno, Wernoton, Ypres, Canoc, Tournay, Manon, and Namur, and three-fifths of the cost was to be borne by the Austrian government, who pledged certain revenues of their newly acquired Belgic provinces to the Dutch for the purpose. The strong position in which such a treaty placed the Republic against aggression, either from the side of France or Austria, was made stronger by being guaranteed by the British government. End of chapter 20「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of Holland by George Edmondson. Chapter 21. The Stadtholderless Republic. 1715-1740. to The thirty-four years which followed the Peace of Utrecht are a period of decadence and decay a depressing period, exhibiting the spectacle of a state which had played a heroic part in history, sinking through its lack of inspiring leadership and the crying defects inherent in its system of government to the position of a third-rate power. The commanding abilities of the great stadtholders of the House of Orange Nassau and during the stadtholderless period, which followed the untimely death of William II, those of the council pensionary, John de Witt had given an appearance of solidarity to what was really a loose confederation of sovereign provinces. Throughout the 17th century, maritime enterprise, naval prowess, and a worldwide trade had, by the help of skilled diplomacy and wise statesmanship, combined to give the Dutch Republic a weight in the Council of Nations altogether disproportionate to its size and the number of its population. In the memorable period of Frederick Henry, the foundations were laid of an empire overseas. Dutch seamen and traders had penetrated into every ocean and had almost monopolized the carrying trade of Europe. And at the same time, Holland had become the chosen home of scholarship, science, literature, and art. In the great days of John de Witt, she contended, on equal terms with England, for the domain of the seas and Amsterdam was the financial clearing-house of the world. To William III the Republic owed its escape from destruction in the critical times of overwhelming French invasion in 1672, when by resolute and heroic leadership he not only rescued the United Provinces from French domination, but before his death had raised them to the rank of a great power. Never did the prestige of the States stand higher in Europe than at the opening of the eighteenth century. But, as has already been pointed out, the elevation of the great stadtholder to the throne of England had been far from an unmixed blessing to his native land. It brought the two maritime and commercial rivals into a close alliance, which placed the smaller and less favoured country at a disadvantage, and ended in the weaker member of the alliance becoming more and more the dependent of the stronger what would have been the trend of events had William survived for another ten or fifteen years, or had he left an heir to succeed him in his high dignities, one can only surmise. It may at least be safely said that the treaty which ended the war of the Spanish succession would not have been the Treaty of Utrecht. William the Third, by his will, made his cousin, John William Frisso, of Nassau-Seine, his heir. Frisso, despite the opposition of the Prussian king, who was the son of Frederick Henry's eldest daughter, assumed the title of Prince of Orange, 
and, as he was a real Netherlander, his branch of the house of Nassau, having been continuously stadtholders of Friesland since the first days of the existence of the Republic, he soon attracted to himself the affection of the Orangist party. But at the time of William the Third's death, Friso was about fourteen years of age, and the old states, or Republican party, which had for so many years been afraid to attempt any serious opposition to the imperious will of King William, now saw their opportunity for a return once more to the state of things established by the Great Assembly in 1651. Under the leadership of Holland, five provinces now declared for a stadtholderless government. The appointment of town councillors passed into the hands of the corporations or of the provincial estates, not, however, without serious disturbances in Gelderland, Utrecht, over Eisel, and also in Zeeland, stirred up partly by the old regent families, who had been excluded from office under William, partly by the guilds and working folk who vainly hoped that they would be able to exercise a larger share in the government. In many places, faction fights ensued. In Amersfoort, two burghers were tried and beheaded. In Nijmegen, the burgomaster Ronkens met the same fate. But after a short while, the aristocratic state's party everywhere gained control in the town corporations and through them in the provincial estates. In Zeeland, the dignity of the first noble was abolished. The effect of all this was that decentralization reached its extreme point. Not only were there seven republics, but each town asserted sovereign rights, defying at times the authority of the majority in the provincial estates. This was especially seen in the predominant province of Holland, where the city of Amsterdam, by its wealth and importance, was able to dictate its will to the estates, and through the estates to the states-general. Money-making and trade profits were the matters which engrossed everybody's interest. War interfered with trade, it was costly, and was to be avoided at any price. During this time, the policy of the Republic was neutrality, and the States-General, with their army and navy reduced more and more in numbers and efficiency, scarcely counted in the calculations of the cabinets of Europe. But this very time that was marked by the decline and fall of the Republic from the high position which it occupied during the greater part of the 17th century was the golden age of the Burger oligarchies, a haughty patrician class consisting in each place of a very limited number of families, closely interrelated, had little by little possessed themselves as a matter of hereditary right of all the offices and dignities in the town, in the province and in the state. Within their own town they reigned supreme, filling up vacancies in the Vordischkap by co-option, exercising all authority, occupying or distributing among their relatives all posts of profit, and acquiring great wealth. Their fellow citizens were excluded from all share in affairs, and were looked down upon as belonging to an inferior caste. The old, simple habits of their forefathers were abandoned, French fashions and manners were the vogue amongst them, and English clothes, furniture, and food. In the country, plotland, people had no voice, whatever, in public affairs. They were not even represented, as the ordinary townspeople were, by their regents. Thus, the United Netherlands had not only ceased to be a unified state in any real sense of the word, but had ceased, likewise, to be a free state. It consisted of a large number of semi-independent oligarchies of the narrowest description, and the great mass of its population was deprived of every vestige of civic rights. That such a state should have survived at all is to be explained by the fact that the real control over the foreign policy of the Republic and over its general government continued to be exercised by the band of experienced statesmen who had served under William the Third, and inherited his traditions. Heinzius, the wise and prudent council pensionary, continued in office until his death, August 3, 1720, when he was succeeded by Isaac van Hornbeck, pensionary of Rotterdam. 
Hornbeck was not a man of great parts, but he was sound and safe, and he had at his side Simon van Slinkeland, secretary of the Council of State since 1690, and others whose experience in public office dated from the preceding century. In their hands the external policy of the Republic, conducted with no lack of skill, was of necessity non-interventionists. In internal matters they could effect little. The finances after the war were in an almost hopeless condition, and again and again the state was threatened with bankruptcy. To make things worse, an epidemic of wild speculation spread far and wide during the period 1716 to 1720 in the Bubble Companies, the Mississippi Company, and the South Sea Company, associated with the name of Edward Law, which proved so ruinous to many in England and France, as well as in Holland. In 1716, such was the miserable condition of the country that the estates of Overijssel, under the leadership of Count van Rescherin, proposed the summoning of a great assembly on the model of that of 1651 to consider the whole question of government and finance. The proposal was ultimately accepted, and the assembly met at The Hague on November 28th. After nine months of ineffectual debate and wrangling, it finally came to an end on September 14th, 1717, without effecting anything, leaving all who had the best interests of the state at heart in despair. In the years immediately succeeding the Peace of Utrecht, Difficulties arose with Charles the Twelfth of Sweden, whose privateers had been seizing Dutch and English merchantmen in the Baltic. Under De Witt or William the Third, the fleet of the Republic would speedily have brought the Swedish king to reason. But now other counsels prevailed. Dutch squadrons sailed into the Baltic with instructions to convoy the merchant vessels, but to avoid hostilities. With some difficulty, this purpose was achieved, and the death of Charles at the siege of Frederikshald brought all danger of war to an end. And yet, in the very interest of trade, it would have been good policy for the States to act strongly in the matter of Swedish piracy in the Baltic. Russia was the rising power in those regions. The Dutch had really nothing to fear from Sweden, whose great days came to an end with the crushing defeat of Charles the Twelfth at Poltova in 1709. Trade relations had been opened between Holland and Muscovy so early as the end of the 16th century, and, despite English rivalry, the opening out of Russia and of Russian trade had been almost entirely in Dutch hands during the 17th century. The relations between the two countries became much closer and more important after the accession of the enterprising and reforming Tsar, Peter the Great. It is well known how Peter, in 1696, visited Holland to learn the art of shipbuilding and himself toiled as a workman at Zondam. As a result of this visit, he carried back with him to Russia an admiration for all things Dutch. He not only favoured Dutch commerce, but he also employed numbers of Hollanders in the building and training of his fleet, and in the construction of waterways and roads. In 1716-17, to 17, Peter again spent a considerable time in Holland. Nevertheless, Dutch policy was again timid and cautious, and no actual alliance was made with Russia, from dread of entanglements, although the opportunity seemed so favourable. It was the same when in this year, 1717, Cardinal Aberoni, at the instigation of Elizabeth of Parma, the ambitious second wife of Philip V, attempted to regain Spain's lost possessions in Italy by an aggressive policy which threatened to involve Europe in war. Elizabeth's object was to obtain an independent sovereignty for her sons in her native country. Austria, France, and England united to resist this attempt to reverse the settlement of Utrecht, and the states were induced to join with them in a quadruple alliance. 
It was not, however, their intention to take any active part in the hostilities which speedily brought Spain to reason and led to the fall of a b e r o n e But the Spanish queen had not given up her designs, and she found another instrument for carrying them out in Riperda, a Groningen nobleman, who had originally gone to Spain as ambassador of the States. This able and scheming statesman persuaded Elizabeth that she might best attain her ends by an alliance with Austria, which was actually concluded at Vienna on April the first, seventeen twenty five. This alliance alarmed France, England, and Prussia, but was especially obnoxious to the Republic, for the Emperor had, in seventeen twenty two, erected an East India Company at Ostend. In spite of the prohibition placed by Holland and Spain in the treaties of 1714 to 1715 upon Belgian overseas commerce. By the Treaty of Alliance in 1725, the Spanish crown recognized the Ostend Company and thus gave it a legal sanction. The states, therefore, after some hesitation, became parties to a defensive alliance against Austria. And Spain, that had been signed by France, England, and Prussia at Hanover in September 1728. These groupings of the powers were of no long duration. The Emperor, fearing an evasion of the Belgian provinces, first agreed to suspend the Ostend Company for seven years, and then, in order to secure the assent of the maritime powers to the pragmatic sanction, which guaranteed to his daughter, Maria Theresa, the succession to the Austrian hereditary domains. He broke with Spain and consented to suppress the Ostend Company altogether. The negotiations which took place at this time are very involved and complicated, but they ended in a revival of the old alliance between Austria and the maritime powers against the two Bourbon monarchies of France and Spain. This return to the old policy of William the Third was largely the work of s l i n g e l a n t who had become council pensionary on June twenty seventh, seventeen twenty seven. Simon van s l i n g e l a n t with the able assistance of his brother in law Francis Fagel, clerk of the States General, was during the nine years in which he directed the foreign policy of the Republic regarded as one of the wisest and most trustworthy. As he was the most experienced statesman of his time, his aim was, in cooperation with England, to maintain by conciliatory and peaceful methods the balance of power. Lord Chesterfield, at that time the British envoy at The Hague, had the highest opinion of s l i n g e l a n t s powers, and the Council Pensionary's writings, more especially his p e n s e e s Impartiales. Published in 1729, show what a thorough grasp he had of the political situation. Fortunately, the most influential ministers in England and France, Robert Walpole and Cardinal Fleury, were like-minded with him in being sincere seekers after peace. The Treaty of Vienna, March 18th, 1731, which secured the recognition by the powers of the Pragmatic Sanction, was largely his work. And he was also successful in preventing the question of the Polish succession after the death of Augustus of Saxony in 1733, being the cause of the outbreak of a European war. In domestic policy, s l i n g e l a n t though profoundly dissatisfied with the condition of the Republic, took no steps to interfere with the form of government. He saw the defects of the stadtholderless system plainly enough. But he had not, like Fagel, strong Orangist sympathies, and on his appointment as council pensionary, he pledged himself to support during his tenure of office the existing state of things. This undertaking he loyally kept, and his strong personality during his lifetime alone saved Holland and through Holland the entire republic from falling into utter ruin and disaster. At his death, Antony van der Heim came council pensionary under the same conditions as his predecessor. But van der Heim, though a capable and hard-working official, was not the same caliber as s l i n g e l a n t The narrow and grasping Burcher regents had got a firm grip of power, 
and they used it to suppress the rights of their fellow citizens, and to keep in their own hands the control of municipal and provincial affairs. Corruption reigned everywhere, and the patrician oligarchy, by keeping for themselves and their relations all offices of profit, grew rich at the same time that the finances of the state fell into greater confusion. It was not a condition of things that could endure, should any serious crises arise. John William Friso, on whom great hopes had been fixed, met with an untimely death in 1711, leaving a posthumous child who became William the Fourth, Prince of Orange. Faithful Friesland immediately elected William, stadtholder under the regency of his mother, Maria Luisa of Hesse Kessel. By her fostering care, the boy received an education to fit him for service to the state. Though of weak bodily frame and slightly deformed, William had marked intelligence and a very gentle and kindly disposition. Though brave like all his family, he had little inclination for military things. The Republican Party had little to fear from a man of such character and disposition. The Burger regents, secure in the possession of power, knew that the Frisian stadtholder was not likely to resort either to violence or intrigue to force on a revolution. Nevertheless, the prestige of the name in the prevailing discontent counted for much. William was elected stadtholder of Groningen in 1718, of Drent and of Gelderland in 1722, though, in each case, with certain restrictions. But the other provinces remained obstinate in their refusal to admit him to any place in their councils or to any military post. The estates of Zeeland went so far as to abolish the Marquisate of Flushing and Verri, which carried with it the dignity of first noble and presidency in the meetings of the estates, and offered to pay one hundred thousand guilders in compensation to the heir of the Nassaus. William refused to receive it, saying that either the Marquisate did not belong to him, in which case he could not accept money for it, or it did belong to him and was not for sale. William's position was advanced by his marriage in 1734 to Anne, eldest daughter of George the Second. Thus, for the third time, a princess royal of England became Princess of Orange. The reception of the newly married pair at Amsterdam and The Hague was, however, cool, though polite. And despite the representatives of Gelderland who urged that the falling credit and bad state of the Republic required the appointment of an eminent head, Holland, Utrecht, Zeeland, and Overijssel remained obdurate in their refusal to change the form of government. William had to content himself with the measure of power he had obtained and to await events. He showed much patience, for he had many slights and rebuffs to put up with. His partisans would have urged him to more vigorous action, but this he steadily refused to take. The Republic kept drifting, meanwhile, on the downward path. Its foreign policy was in nerveless hands. Jobbery was rampant. Trade and industry declined. The dividends of the East India Company fell year by year through the incompetence and greed of officials appointed by family influence. The West India Company was practically bankrupt. Such was the state of the country in 1740 when the outbreak of the Austrian Succession War found the Republic without leadership, hopelessly undecided what course of action it should take, and only seeking to evade its responsibilities. End of chapter 21 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of Holland by George Edmondson Chapter 22 The Austrian Succession War William the Fourth, seventeen forty to seventeen fifty one. The death of Emperor Charles the Sixth in October seventeen forty was the signal for the outbreak of another European war. 
All Charles's efforts on behalf of the pragmatic sanction proved to have been labor spent in vain. Great Britain, the United Provinces, Spain, Saxony, Poland, Russia, Sardinia, Prussia, most of the smaller German states, and finally France, had agreed to support, in 1738, the pragmatic sanction. The assent of Spain had been bought by the cession of the two Sicilies, of France by that of Lorraine, whose Duke Francis Stephen had married Maria Theresa, and was compensated by the Grand Duchy of Tuscany for the loss of his ancestral domain. The only important dissentient was Charles Albert, Elector of Bavaria, who had married the younger daughter of Joseph I, and who claimed the succession not only through his wife, but as the nearest male descendant of Ferdinand I. On the death of Charles the Sixth, then, it might have been supposed that Maria Theresa would have succeeded to her inheritance without opposition. This was far from being the case. The elector of Bavaria put forward his claims, and he found unexpected support in Frederick the Second of Prussia. Frederick had just succeeded his father Frederick William the First, and being at once ambitious and without scruples, he determined to seize the opportunity for the purpose of territorial aggression. While lulling the suspicions of Vienna by friendly professions, he suddenly, in December 1740, invaded Silesia. Maria Theresa appealed to the guarantors of the pragmatic sanction. She met no active response, but on the part of Spain, Sardinia, and France veiled hostility. Great Britain, at war with Spain since 1739, and fearing the intervention of France, confined her efforts to diplomacy. And the only anxiety of the United Provinces was to avoid being drawn into war. An addition was made to the army of eleven thousand men, and afterwards, in 1741, through dread of an attack on the Austrian Netherlands, a further increase of twenty thousand was voted. The garrisons and fortifications of the barrier towns were strengthened, and some addition was made to the navy. But the policy of the states continued to be vacillating and pusillanimous. The Republican Party, who held the reins of power, desiring peace at any price, were above all anxious to be on good terms with France. The Orangist opposition were in favor of joining with England in support of Maria Theresa, but the prince would not take any steps to assert himself, and his partisans, deprived of leadership, could exert little influence. Nor did they obtain much encouragement from England, where Walpole was still intent upon a pacifist policy. The events of 1741, however, were such as to compel a change of attitude. The Prussians were in possession of Silesia, and spoliation, having begun so successfully, became infectious. The aged Fleury was no longer able to restrain the war party in France. At May in Nymphenburg, a league was formed by France, Spain, Sardinia, Saxony, and Poland. In conjunction with Prussia and Bavaria, to effect the overthrow of Maria Theresa and share her inheritance between them, resistance seemed hopeless. A Franco-Bavarian army penetrated within a few miles of Vienna, and then overran Bohemia. Charles Albert was crowned King of Bohemia at Prague, and then, January 1742, was elected Emperor under the title of Charles the Seventh. Before this election took place, however, English mediation had succeeded by the convention of Klein-Schellendorf in securing a suspension of hostilities, October ninth, between Austria and Prussia. This left Frederick in possession of Silesia, but enabled the Queen of Hungary, supported by English and Dutch subsidies, not only to clear Bohemia from its invaders, but to conquer Bavaria. At the very time when Charles Albert was elected emperor, his own capital was occupied by his enemies. In February 1742, the long ministry of Walpole came to an end, and the party in favor of a more active participation in the war succeeded to office. George the Second was now thoroughly alarmed for the safety of his Hanoverian dominions, and Lord Stair was sent to the Hague on a special mission to urge the states to range themselves definitely on the side of Maria Theresa. But fears of a French onslaught on the southern Netherlands still caused timorous counsels to prevail. The French ambassador de Fenelon, on his part, was lavish in vague promises not unmingled with veiled threats, 
so that the feeble directors of Dutch policy, torn between their duty to treaty obligations urged upon them by England, and their dread of the military power of France, helplessly resolved to cling to neutrality as long as possible. But events proved too strong for them. Without asking their permission, an English force of 16,000 men landed at Ostend and was sent to strengthen the garrison of the barrier fortresses. May 1742. The warlike operations of this year were on the whole favorable to Maria Theresa, who through English mediation, much against her will, secured peace with Prussia by the cession of Silesia. The treaty between the two powers was signed at Berlin on July 28th. Hostilities with France continued, but though both the maritime powers helped Austria with subsidies, neither Great Britain nor the States were, at the close of the year, officially at war with the French king. Such a state of precarious make-believe could not last much longer. The Austrians were anxious that the English force in the Netherlands, which had been reinforced and was known as the Pragmatic Army, should advance into Bavaria to cooperate with the imperial forces. Accordingly, the army, commanded by George the Second in person, advanced across the main to Dettingen. Here the king, shut in by French forces and cut off from his supplies, was rescued from a very difficult position by the valor of his troops, who on June 27, 1743, attacked and completely routed their opponents. The States General had already, on June 22, recognized their responsibilities, and by a majority vote it was determined that a force of 20,000 men under the command of Count Maurice of nassau ovenkirk should join the Pragmatic Army. The fiction that the maritime powers were not at war with France was kept up until the spring of 1744, when the French king, in alliance with Spain, declared war on England. One of the projects of the war party at Versailles was the dispatch of a powerful expedition to invade England and restore the Stuarts. As soon as news of the preparations reached England, a demand was at once made, in accordance with treaty, for naval aid from the States. Twenty ships were asked for, but only eight were in a condition to sail, and the admiral in command, Grave, was seventy-three years of age and had been for fifteen years in retirement. What an object lesson of the utter decay of the Dutch naval power! Fortunately, a storm dispersed the French fleet, and the services of the auxiliary squadron were not required. The news that Marshal Maurice de Saxe was about to invade the Austrian Netherlands with a French army of 80,000 men came like a shock upon the peace party in the States. The memory of 1672 filled them with terror. The pretense of neutrality could no longer be maintained. The choice lay between peace at any price or war with all its risks, and it was doubtful which of the two alternatives was the worst. Was there indeed any choice? It did not seem so when de Fenelon, who had represented France at the Hague for nineteen years, came to take leave of the States General on his appointment to a command in the invading army, April 26th. But a last effort was made. An envoy extraordinaire, the Count of Wassenaer Twickel, was sent to Paris, but found that the king was already with his army encamped between Lille and Tournay. Wassenaer was amused with negotiations for a while, but there was no pause in the rapid advance of Marshal Saxe. The barrier fortresses, whose defenses had been neglected, fell rapidly one after another. All West Flanders was overrun. The Allied forces, gathered at Udenarde, were first too weak to offer resistance, and were divided in councils. Gradually reinforcements came in, but still the pragmatic army remained inactive and was only saved from inevitable defeat by the invasion of Alsace by the imperialists. Marshal Saxe was compelled to dispatch a considerable part of the invading army to meet this attack on the eastern frontier, and to act on the defensive in Flanders. Menin, Coutray, Ypres, Noc, and other places remained, however, in French hands. All this time the Dutch had maintained the fiction that the states were not at war with France, but in January 1745 the pressure of circumstances was too strong even for the weak-kneed Vanderheim and his fellow statesmen, and a quadruple alliance was formed between England, Austria, Saxony, and the United Provinces to maintain the pragmatic sanction. 
This was followed in March by the declaration of war between France and the States. Meanwhile, the position of Austria had improved. The Emperor Charles the Seventh died on January 20th, and his useful successor Maximilian Joseph, in return for the restoration of his electorate, made peace with Maria Theresa and withdrew all Bavarian claims to the Austrian succession. Affairs in Flanders, however, did not prosper. The commander-in-chief of the Allied army had been given to the Duke of Cumberland, who was no match for such an opponent as Maurice de Saxe. The Prince of Waldeck was in command of the Dutch contingent. The provinces of Friesland, Groningen, Overijssel, and Elderland had repeatedly urged that this post should be bestowed upon the Prince of Orange, and the States General had, in 1742, offered to give William the rank of Lieutenant General in the army, but Holland and Zealand steadily refused. The campaign of 1745 was disastrous. The Battle of Fontenoy, May 11th, resulted in a victory for Marshal Saxe over the Allied forces, and a victory snatched out of the fire through the pusillanimous withdrawal from the fight of the Dutch troops on the left wing. The British infantry, with magnificent valor on the right center, had pierced through the French lines, only to find themselves deserted and overwhelmed by superior forces. This victory was vigorously followed up. The Jacobite rising under Charles Edward, the young pretender, had necessitated the recalling not only of the greater part of the English expeditionary force, but also, under the terms of the treaties between Great Britain and the United Provinces, of a body of six thousand Dutch. Before the year 1745 had ended, Tournay, Ghent, Bruges, Odenarde, Dendermond, Ostend, Newport, Ath fell in succession to the hands of Marshal Saxe, and after a brave defense Brussels itself was forced to capitulate on February 19, 1746. Vanderheim and the Republican conclave, in whose hands was the direction of foreign affairs, dreading the approach of the French armies to the Dutch frontier, set the Count de Loray on a private mission to Paris in November 1745, to endeavor to negotiate terms of peace. He was unsuccessful, and in February 1746 another fruitless effort was made, Wassenaer and Jacob Gillis being the envoys. The French minister, D'Argenson, was not willing to discuss matters with them, and negotiations went on for some time in a more or less dulcetory way, but without in any way checking the alarming progress of hostilities. An army a hundred and twenty thousand strong under Marshal Saxe found for some months no force strong enough to resist it. Antwerp, Leuven, Mechlin, Mon, Charleroi, Huy, and finally Neymar, September 21st, surrendered to the French. At last, October 11th, a powerful Allied army under the command of Charles of Lorraine made a stand at Roucou, a hardly fought battle in which both sides lost heavily ended in the victory of the French. Liège was taken, and the French were now masters of Belgium. These successes made the Dutch statesmen at The Hague the more anxious to conclude peace. D'Argenson had always been averse to an actual invasion of Dutch territory, and it was arranged between him and the Dutch envoys, Wassenaer and Gillis, at Paris, and between the council pensionary Vanderheim and the Abbe de la Ville at The Hague, that a congress should meet at Breda in August, in which England consented to take part. Before it met, however, Vanderheim had died, August 15th. He was succeeded by Jacob Gillis. The Congress was destined to make little progress, for several of the provinces resented the way in which a small handful of men had secretly been committing the Republic to the acceptance of disadvantageous and humiliating terms of peace, without obtaining the consent of the States General to their proposals. The Congress did not actually assemble till October, and never got further than the discussion of preliminaries, for the war party won possession of power at Paris, and Louis the Fifteenth dismissed D'Argenson. Moderate counsels were thrown to the winds, and it was determined in the coming campaign to carry the war into Dutch territory. Alarm at the threatening attitude of the French roused the Allies to collect an army of 90,000 men, of whom more than half were Austrian, but instead of Charles of Lorraine, the Duke of Cumberland was placed in command. 
Marshal Saxe, at the head of the main French force, held Cumberland in check, while he dispatched Count Leventhal with twenty thousand to enter Dutch Flanders. His advance was a triumphal progress. Sluis, Cadsand, and Axel surrendered almost without opposition. Only the timely arrival of an English squadron in the Scheldt saved Zealand from invasion. The news of these events caused an immense sensation. For some time popular resentment against the feebleness and jobbery of the stadtholderless government had been deep and strong. Indignation knew no bounds, and the revolutionary movement to which it gave rise was as sudden and complete in 1747 as 1672. All eyes were speedily turned to the Prince of Orange as the savior of the country. The movement began on April 25th at Veer and Middelburg in the island of Valkeren. Three days later the estates of the province proclaimed the prince stadtholder and captain and admiral general of Zealand. The province of Holland, where the stadtholderless form of government was so deeply rooted and had its most stubborn and determined supporters, followed the example of Zealand on May 3rd, Utrecht on May 5th, and Overijssel on May 10th. The States General appointed him Captain and Admiral General of the Union. Thus, without bloodshed or disturbance of any kind, or any personal effort on the part of the Prince, he found himself by general consent invested with all the posts of dignity and authority which had been held by Frederick Henry and William the Third. It was amidst scenes of general popular rejoicing that William visited Amsterdam, The Hague, and Middelburg, and prepared to set about the difficult task to which he had been called. One of the first results of the change of government was the closing of the Congress of Breda. There was no improvement, however, in the military position. The Allied army advancing under Cumberland and Waldeck to prevent Marshal Saxe from laying siege to Maastricht was attacked by him at Lofeld on July 2nd. The fight was desperately contested, and the issue was on the whole in favor of the Allies, when at a critical moment the Dutch gave way, and the French were able to claim, though at very heavy cost, a doubtful victory. It enabled Saxe, nevertheless, to dispatch a force under Leuventhal to besiege the important fortress of Bergen op Zoom. It was carried by assault on September 16th, and with it the whole of Dutch Brabant fell into the enemy's hands. Indignation against the rule of the Burger Regents, which had been instrumental in bringing so many disasters upon the Republic, was very general, and there was loudly expressed desire that the Prince should be invested with greater powers as the eminent head of the State. With this object in view, the proposal of the nobles of Holland, the estates of that province made the dignity of Stadtholder and of Captain and Admiral General hereditary in both the male and female lines. All the other provinces passed resolutions to the same effect, and the States General made the offices of Captain and Admiral General of the Union also hereditary. In the case of a minority, the Princess Mother was to be regent. In that of a female succession, the heiress could only marry with the consent of the States, it being provided that the husband must be of the Reformed religion, and not a king or an elector. Strong measures were taken to prevent the selling of offices and to do away with the system of farming out the taxes. The postmasterships in Holland, which produced a large revenue, were offered to the prince, but while undertaking the charge he desired that the profits should be applied to the use of the state. Indeed they were sorely needed, for though William would not hear of peace, and sent Count Bentinck to England to urge a vigorous prosecution of the war in conjunction with Austria and Russia in 1748, promising a state's contingent of 70,000 men, it was found that, when the time for translating promises into action came, funds were wanting. Holland was burdened with a heavy debt, and the contributions of most of the provinces to the generality were hopelessly in arrears. In Holland a voluntary loan was raised, which afterward extended to the other provinces and also to the Indies, at the rate of 1%, on properties between... 1,000 florins and 2,000 florins of 2%. On those above 2,000 florins, the loan, mitigift, produced a considerable sum, about 50 million florins, but this was not enough, and the prince had the humiliation of writing and placing before the English government the hopeless financial state of the republic, and their need of a very large loan if they were to take any further part in the war. This pitiful revelation of the condition of their ally decided Great Britain to respond to the overtures for peace on the part of France. 
the representatives of the powers met at Aix-la-Chapelle, and as the English and French were both thoroughly tired of the war, they soon came to terms. The preliminaries of peace between them were signed on April 30, 1748, on the principle of a restoration of conquests. In this treaty of Aix-la-Chapelle the United Provinces were included, but no better proof could be afforded of the low estate to which the Dutch Republic had now fallen than the fact that its representatives at Aix-la-Chapelle, Betinkt and von Herin, were scarcely consulted and exercised practically no influence upon the decisions. The French evacuated the southern Netherlands in return for the restoration to them of the colony of Cape Breton, which had fallen into the hands of the English and the barrier towns were again allowed to receive Dutch garrisons. It was a useless concession, for their fortifications had been destroyed, and the states could no longer spare the money to make them capable of serious defense. The position of William the Fourth all this time was exceptionally responsible, and therefore the more trying. Never before had any Prince of Orange been invested with so much power. The glamour attaching to the name of Orange was perhaps the chief asset of the new stadtholder, in facing the serious difficulties into which years of misgovernment had plunged the country. He had undoubtedly the people at his back, but unfortunately they expected an almost magical change would take place in the situation with his elevation to the stadtholderate. Naturally they were disappointed. The revolution of 1747 was not carried out in the spirit of thorough which marked those of 1618, 1650, and 1672. William the Fourth was cast in a mould different from that of Maurice or William the Second, still more from that of his immediate predecessor, William the Third. He was a man of wide knowledge, kindly, conciliatory, and deeply religious, but only a mediocre statesman. He was too undecided in his opinions, too irresolute in action, to be a real leader in a crisis. The first business was to bring back peace to the country, and this was achieved not by any influence that the Netherlands government was able to exercise upon the course of the negotiations at Aix-la-Chapelle, but simply as a part of the understanding arrived at by Great Britain and France. It was for the sake of their own security that the English plenipotentiaries were willing to give up their conquest in North America as compensation for the evacuation of those portions of Belgium and of the Republic that the French forces occupied, and the restoration of the barrier fortresses. After peace was concluded, not only the Orange partisans, but the great mass of the people, who had so long been excluded from all share of political power, desired a drastic reform of the government. They had conferred sovereign authority upon William, and would have willingly increased it, in the hope that he would in his person be a center of unity to the state, and would use his power for the sweeping away of abuses. It was a vain hope. He never attempted to do away, root and branch, with the corrupt municipal oligarchies, but only to make them more tolerable by the infusion of a certain amount of new blood. The birth of an heir on March 8, 1748, caused great rejoicings, for it promised permanence to the new order of things. Whatever the prince had firmly taken in hand would have met with popular approval, but William had little power of initiative or firmness of principle. He allowed his course of action to be swayed now by one set of advisers, now by their opponents. Even in the matter of the farmers of the revenue, the best hated men throughout the Republic, and especially in Holland, it required popular tumults and riots at Harlem, Leyden, The Hague, and Amsterdam, in which the houses of the obnoxious officials were attacked and sacked, to secure the abolition of a system by which the proceeds of taxation were diverted from the service of the state, to fill the pockets of venal and corrupt officials. In Amsterdam, the spirit of revolt against the domination of the town council by a few patrician families led to serious disorders and armed conflicts in which blood was shed, and in September 1748 the prince, at the request of the estates, visited the turbulent city. As the town council proved obstinate in refusing to make concessions, the stadtholder was compelled to take strong action. The council was dismissed from office, but here, as elsewhere, the prince was adverse from making a drastic purge. Out of the thirty-six members, more than half, nineteen, were restored. The new men, who thus took their seats in the town council, obtained the subriquet of forty-eighters. 
The state of both the army and navy was deplorable at the end of the war in which the states had played so inglorious a part. William had neither the training nor the knowledge to undertake their reorganization. He therefore sought the help of Louis Ernest, Duke of Brunswick Wolfenbüttel, seventeen eighteen to eighty six, who, as an Austrian field marshal, had distinguished himself in the war. Brunswick was with difficulty persuaded in October seventeen forty nine to accept the post of Dutch field marshal, a salary of sixty thousand florins being guaranteed to him, the governorship of Hertugenbausch, and the right to retain his rank in the Austrian army. The Duke did not actually arrive in Holland to take up his duties until December 1750. The Prince's efforts to bring about a reform of the Admiralties to make the Dutch Navy an efficient force and to restore the commerce and industries of the country were well meant, but were marred by the feebleness of his health. All through the year 1750 he had recurring attacks of illness and grew weaker. On October 22, 1751, he died. It is unfair to condemn William the Fourth because he did not rise to the height of his opportunities. When in 1747 power was thrust upon him so suddenly, no man could have been more earnest in his wish to serve his country. But he was not gifted with the great abilities and high resolve of William the Third, and there can be no doubt that the difficulties with which he had to contend were manifold, complex, and deep-rooted. A valutitarian like William the Fourth was not fitted to be the physician of a body politic suffering from so many diseases as that of the United Provinces in 1747. End of chapter 22. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of Holland by George Edmondson Chapter 23 The Regency of Anne and of Brunswick, 1751-1766 On the death of William the Fourth, his widow, Anne of England, was at once recognized as regent and guardian of her son, William V., Bedding and other leaders of the Orangist party took prompt measures to secure that the hereditary rights of the young prince did not suffer by his father's early death. During the minority, Brunswick was deputed to perform the duties of captain-general. The new regent was a woman of by no means ordinary parts. In her domestic life she possessed all the virtues of her mother, Queen Caroline, and in public affairs she had been of much help to her husband, and was deeply interested in them. She was therefore in many ways well fitted to undertake the serious responsibilities that devolved upon her, but her good qualities were marred by a self-willed and autocratic temperament, which made her resent any interference with her authority. William Bedink, who was wont to be insistent with his advice, presuming on the many services he had rendered, the Duke of Brunswick, and the council pensionary Stain were all alike distrusted and disliked by her. Her professed policy was not to lean on any party, but to try and hold the balance between them. Unfortunately, William the Fourth, after the revolution of 1747, had allowed his old Frisian councillors, with Otto Zwier van Heren at their head, to have his ear and to exercise an undue influence upon his decisions. This Frisian court cabal continued to exercise the same influence with Princess Anne, and the Hollanders not unnaturally resented it. For Holland, as usual in the late war, had borne the brunt of the cost, and had a debt of seventy million florins, and an annual deficit of twenty-eight million florins. The council pensionary Stain was a most competent financier, and he, with Jan Hop, the treasurer-general of the Union, and with William Betting, head and spokesman of the nobles in the estates of Holland, were urgent in impressing upon the regent the crying need of retrenchment. Anne accepted their advice as to the means by which economies might be effected and a reduction of expenses be brought about. Among these was the disbanding of some of the military forces, including a part of the bodyguard. To this the regent consented, though characteristically without consulting Brunswick. 
the captain-general felt aggrieved, but allowed the reduction to be made without any formal opposition. No measure, however, of a bold and comprehensive financial reform, like that of John de Witt a century earlier, was attempted. The navy had, at the peace of Aix-la-Chapelle, been in an even worse condition than the army, and the stadtholder, as admiral-general, had been urging the admiralties to bestir themselves and to make the fleet more worthy of a maritime power. But William's premature death brought progress to a standstill, and it is noteworthy that such was the supineness of the states-general in 1752, that while Brunswick was given the powers of captain-general, no admiral-general was appointed. The losses sustained by the merchants and shipowners through the audacity of the Algerian pirates roused public opinion, however, and in successive years squadrons were dispatched to the Mediterranean to bring the sea robbers to reason. Admiral Boudin, in 1755, consented himself with the protection of the merchantmen, but Wassenaer, in 1756 and 1757, was more aggressive and compelled the day of Algiers to make terms. Meanwhile, the rivalry between France and England on the one hand, and between Austria and Prussia on the other, led to the formation of new alliances, and placed the Dutch Republic in a difficult position. The Peace of Aix-la-Chapelle was but an armed truce. The French lost no time in pushing forward ambitious schemes of colonial enterprise in North America and in India. Their progress was watched with jealous eyes by the English, and in 1755 war broke out between the two powers. The Republic was bound to Great Britain by ancient treaties, but the activities of the French ambassador d'Affry had been successful in winning over a number of influential Hollanders, and also the court cabal to be inclined to France and to favor strict neutrality. The situation was immensely complicated by the alliance concluded between Austria and France on May 1, 1756. This complete reversal of policy, which from the early years of William III had grouped England, Austria, and the States in alliance against French aggression, caused immense perturbation among the Dutch statesmen. By a stroke of the pen the barrier treaty had ceased to exist, for the barrier fortresses were henceforth useless. The English ambassador York urged upon the Dutch government the treaty right of Great Britain to claim the assistance of six thousand men and twenty ships. Austria had the able advocacy of Daffry in seeking to induce the states to become parties to the Franco-Austrian alliance. The regent, though an English princess, was scarcely less zealous than were the council pensionary Steyn, Brunswick, and most of the leading burgher regents in desiring to preserve strict neutrality. To England the answer was made that naval and military help were not due except in case of invasion. The French had meanwhile been offering the Dutch considerable commercial privileges in exchange for their neutrality, with the result that Dutch merchantmen were seized by the English cruisers and carried into English ports to be searched for contraband. The princess had a very difficult part to play. Delegations of merchants waited upon her, urging her to exert her influence with the English government not to use their naval supremacy for the injury of Dutch trade. Anne did her best, but without avail. England was determined to stop all commercial intercourse between France and the West Indies. Dutch merchantmen who attempted to supply the French with goods did so at their own risk. Four deputations from Amsterdam and the maritime towns waited upon the princess, urging an increase of the fleet as a protection against England. Other deputations came from the inland provinces, asking for an increase of the army against the danger of a French invasion. The French were already in occupation of Ostend and Newport, and had threatened masses of troops on the Belgian frontier. The regent, knowing on which side the peril to the security of the country was greatest, absolutely refused her consent to an increase of the fleet without an increase of the army. The estates of Holland refused to vote money for the army, and having the powers of the purse, matters were at a deadlock. The Republic lay helpless and without defense should its enemies determine to attack it. In the midst of all these difficulties and anxieties, surrounded by intrigues and counter-intrigues, sincerely patriotic and desirous to do her utmost for the country, but thwarted and distrusted on every side, the health of the regent, which had never been strong, gradually gave way. On December 11, 1758, she went in person to the States General, with tottering steps and death in her face, to endeavor to secure unity of action in the presence of the national danger, but without achieving her object. The maritime provinces were obdurate. Seeing death approaching, with the opening of the new year, she made arrangements for the marriage of her daughter Caroline with Charles Christian, Prince of Nassau-Wilburg, 
and after committing her two children to the care of the Duke of Brunswick, with whom she had effected a reconciliation, and making him guardian of the young Prince of Orange, Anne expired on January 12, 1759, at the early age of forty-nine. The task Brunswick had to fulfill was an anxious one, but by the exercise of great tact during the seven years of William's minority, he managed to gather into his hands a great deal of the power of a stadholder, and at the same time to ingratiate himself with the anti-Orange States party, whose power especially in Holland had been growing in strength and was in fact predominant. By politic concessions to the regents, and by the interest he displayed in the commercial and financial prosperity of the city of Amsterdam, that chief center of opposition gave its support to his authority, and he was able to do this while keeping at the same time on good terms with Bedding, Stain, Fagel, and the Orange Party. The political position of the United Provinces during the early part of the Brunswick guardianship was impotent and ignominious in the extreme. Despite continued protests and complaints, Dutch merchantmen were constantly being searched for contraband and brought as prizes into English ports, and the lucrative trade that had been carried on between the West Indies and France in Dutch bottoms was completely stopped. Even the fitting out of twenty-one ships of the line as a convoy effected nothing, for such a force could not face the enormous superiority of the English fleet, which at that time swept the seas. The French ambassador Daffry made most skilful use of his opportunities to create a pro-French party in Holland and especially in Amsterdam, and he was not unsuccessful in his intrigues. But the Dutch resolved to remain neutral at any cost remained as strong as ever, for whatever might be the case with maritime Holland, the inland provinces shrank from running any risks of foreign invasion. When at last the Peace of Paris came in 1763, the representatives of the United Provinces, though they essayed to play the part of mediators between the warring parties, no longer occupied a position of any weight in the councils of the European nations. The proud republic which had treated on equal terms with France and with Great Britain in the days of John de Witt and of William the Third had become in the eyes of the statesmen of 1763 a negligible quantity. One of the effects of the falling off in the overseas trade of Amsterdam was to transform this great commercial city into the central exchange of Europe. The insecurity of seaborne trade caused many of the younger merchants to deal in money securities and bills of exchange rather than in goods. Banking houses sprang up apace, and large fortunes were made by speculative investments in stocks and shares, and loans for foreign governments, large and small, were readily negotiated. This state of things reached its height during the Seven Years' War, but with the settlement which followed the peace of 1763, disaster came. On July 25th, the chief financial house in Amsterdam, that of de Neufville, failed to meet its liabilities and brought down in its crash a very large number of other firms, not merely in Holland, but also in Hamburg and other places, for a veritable panic was caused, and it was some time before stability could be restored. The remaining three years of the Brunswick regime were uneventful in the home country. Differences with the English East India Company, however, led to the expulsion of the Dutch from their trading settlements on the Hooghly and Cormorandel, and in Berbice there was a serious revolt of the Negro slaves, which, after hard fighting in the bush, was put down with much cruelty. The young Prince of Orange, on the attainment of his eighteenth year, March 8, 1766, seceded to his hereditary rights. His grandmother, Maria Luisa, to whose care he had owed much, had died on April ninth in the previous year. During the interval, the Princess Caroline had taken her place as regent in Friesland. End of chapter 23「ありがとうございました」。He had been most carefully educated and was not wanting in ability, but he lacked energy and thoroughness and was vacillating and undecided at moments when resolute action was called for. Like his contemporary Louis XVI, had he been born in a private station, he would have adorned it, 
but like that unhappy monarch he had none of the qualities of a leader of men in critical and difficult times. It was the characteristic of him that he asked for confirmation from the provincial estates of the dignities and offices which were his by hereditary right. In everything he relied upon the advice of the Duke of Brunswick, whose methods of government he implicitly followed. To such an extent was this the case that soon after his accession to power, a secret act was drawn up, May 3, 1766, known as the Act of Consultation, by which the Duke bound himself to remain at the side of the stadtholder and to assist him by word and deed in all affairs of state. During the early years, therefore, of William V stadtholderate, he consulted Brunswick in every matter, and was thus encouraged to distrust his own judgment and to be fitful and dulcitory in his attention to affairs of state. One of the first of Brunswick's cares was to provide for the prince a suitable wife. William the Second, William the Third, and William the Fourth had all married English princesses, but the feeling of hostility to England was strong in Holland, and it was not thought advisable for the young stadtholder to seek for a wife in his mother's family. The choice of the duke was the Prussian princess Wilhelmina. The new princess of Orange was niece on the paternal side of Frederick the Great, and on the maternal side of the Duke of Brunswick himself. The marriage took place at Berlin on October 4, 1767. The bride was but sixteen years of age, but her attractive manners and vivacious cleverness caused her to win the popular favor on her first entry into her adopted country. The first eight years of William's stadtholdership passed by quietly. There is little to record. Commerce prospered, but the Hollanders were no longer content with commerce and aimed rather at the rapid accumulation of wealth by successful financial transactions. Stock dealing had become a national pursuit foreign powers came to Amsterdam for loans, and vast amounts of Dutch capital were invested in British and French funds and in the various German states. And yet all the time this rich and prosperous country was surrounded by powerful military and naval powers, and having no strong natural frontiers, lay exposed, defenseless to aggressive attack, whether by sea or land. It was in vain that the stadtholder year by year sent pressing memorials to the states general urging them to strengthen the navy and the army and to put them on a war footing. The maritime provinces were eager for an increase of the navy, but the inland provinces refused to contribute their quota of the charges. Utrecht, Helderland, Overijssel, and Groningen, on the other hand, liable as they were to suffer from military invasion, were ready to sanction a considerable addition to the land forces, but were thwarted by the opposition of Holland, Zeeland, and Friesland. So nothing was done, and the Republic, torn by divided interests and with its ruling classes lapped in self-contented comfort and luxury, was a helpless prey that seemed to invite spoliation. This was the state of things when the British North American colonies rose in revolt against the mother countries. The sympathies of France were from the first with the colonials, and a body of volunteers raised by Lafayette with the connivance of the French government crossed the Atlantic to give armed assistance to the rebels. Scarcely less warm was the feeling in the Netherlands. The motives which prompted it were partly sentimental, partly practical. There was a certain similarity between the struggle for independence on the part of the American colonists against a mighty state like Great Britain and their own struggle with the world power of Spain. There was also the hope that the rebellion would have the practical result of opening out to the Dutch merchants a lucrative trade with the Americas, one of whose chief grievances against the mother country had been the severity of the restrictions forbidding all trading with foreign lands. At the same time, the whole air was full of revolutionary ideas, which were unsettling men's minds. This was no less the case in the Netherlands than elsewhere, and the American revolt was regarded as a realization and vindication in practical politics the teachings of Montesquieu, Voltaire, and Rousseau, whose works were widely read, and of the Englishmen Hume, Priestley, and Richard Price. Foremost among the propagandists of these ideas were Jan Dirk van der Capellen, Tote de Paul, a nobleman of Overijssel, and the three burgomasters of Amsterdam, von Berkel, de Vrij Temink, and Hoft, all anti-Orage partisans and pro-French in sentiment. Amidst all these contending factions and opinions, the state remained virtually without a head. William V, drifting along, incapable of forming an independent decision, 
or of making a firm and resolute use of the great powers with which he was entrusted. Torn by internal dissensions, the maintenance of neutrality by the Republic became even more difficult than in the Seven Years' War. The old questions of illicit trade with the enemy and the carrying of contraband arose. The Dutch islands of St. Eustasis and Curaçao became centers of smuggling enterprise, and Dutch merchant vessels were constantly being searched by the British cruisers and often carried off as prizes into English ports. Strong protests were made and great irritation aroused. Amsterdam was the chief sufferer. Naturally, in this hotbed of Republican opinion and French sympathies, the prince was blamed and was accused of preferring English interests to those of his own country. The arrival of the Duc de la Vagion as French ambassador did much to fan the flame. Vagion entered into close relations with the Amsterdam regents and did all in his power to exacerbate the growing feeling of hostility to England and to persuade the Republic to abandon the ancient alliance with that country in favor of one with France. The British ambassador, York, lacked his ingratiating manners, and his language now became imperative and menacing in the face of the flourishing contraband trade that was carried on at St. Eustatius. In consequence of his strong protest, the governor of the island, Van Heiliger, was replaced by de Graaf, but it was soon discovered that the new governor was no improvement upon his predecessor. He caused additional offense to the British government by saluting the American flag on November 16, 1776. The threats of York grew stronger, but with small result. The Americans continued to draw supplies from the Dutch islands. The entry of France into the war on February 6, 1778, followed by that of Spain, complicated manners. England was now fighting with her back to the wall, and her sea power had to be exerted to its utmost to make head against so many foes. She waged relentless war on merchant ships carrying contraband or suspected contraband, whether enemy or neutral. At last money was voted for under pressure from Amsterdam, supported by the prince for the building of a fleet for protection against privateers and for purposes of convoy. But a fleet cannot be built in a day, and when Admiral Van Bylandt was sent out in 1777, his squadron consisted of five ships only. Meanwhile, negotiations with England were proceeding and resulted in certain concessions, consent being given to allow what was called limited convoy. The States-General, despite the opposition of Amsterdam, accepted on November 13, 1778, the proffered compromise. But the French ambassador, Vaguion, ported the protest of Amsterdam by threatening, unless the States-General insisted upon complete freedom of trade, to withdraw the commercial privileges granted to the Republic by France. Finding that the States-General upheld their resolution of November 13, he carried his threat into execution. This action brought the majority of the estates of Holland to side with Amsterdam and to call for a repeal of the limited convoy resolution. The English, on their part, well aware of all this, continued to do their utmost to stop all supplies reaching their enemies in Dutch bottoms, convoy or no convoy. The British government, though confronted by so many foes, now took strong measures. Admiral von Bylandt, convoying a fleet of merchantmen through the channel, was compelled by a British squadron to strike his flag, and all the Dutch vessels were taken into Portsmouth. This was followed by a demand under the Treaty of 1678 for Dutch aid in ships and men, or the abrogation of the Treaty of Alliance and of the commercial privileges it carried with it. York gave the States General three weeks for their decision, and on April 17, 1779, the long-standing alliance, which William III had made the keystone of his policy, ceased to exist. War was not declared, but the States General voted for unlimited convoy on April 24th, and every effort was made by the Admiralties to build up and equip a considerable fleet. The reception given to the American privateer, Paul Jones, who, despite English protests, was not only allowed to remain in Holland for three months, but was feted as a hero, October through December 1779, accentuated the increasing alienation of the two countries. At this critical stage, the difficult position of England was increased by the formation under the leadership of Russia of a league of armed neutrality. Its object was to maintain the principle of the freedom of the seas for the vessels of neutral countries, unless they were carrying contraband of war, i.e., military or naval munitions. 
Further, a blockade would not be recognized if not effective. Sweden and Denmark joined the League, and the Empress Catherine invited the United Provinces and several other neutral powers to do likewise. Her object was to put a curb upon what was described by Britain's enemies as the tyranny of the mistress of the seas. The Republic for some time hesitated. Conscious of their weakness at sea, the majority in the States General were unwilling to take any overt steps to provoke hostilities when an event occurred which forced their hands. In 1778, certain secret negotiations had taken place between the Amsterdam regents and the American representatives at Paris, Franklin, and Lee. It chanced that Henry Lawrence, a former president of the Congress, was on his way from New York to Amsterdam in September 1780 for the purpose of raising a loan. Pursued by an English frigate, the ship on which he was sailing was captured off Newfoundland, and among his papers were found copies of the negotiations of 1778. And of the correspondence which then took place. Great was the indignation of the British government, and it was increased when the Estates of Holland, under the influence of Amsterdam, succeeded in bringing the States General, by a majority of four provinces to three, to join the League of Armed Neutrality. Better open war than a sham peace. Instructions were therefore sent to the Ambassador York to demand the punishment of the Amsterdam regents for their clandestine transactions with the enemies of England. The reply was that the matter should be brought before the court of Holland, and von Weldren, the Dutch ambassador in London, in vain endeavored to give assurances that the states were anxious to maintain a strict neutrality. York demanded immediate satisfaction, and once more called upon the Republic to furnish the aid in men and ships in accordance with the treaty. Further instructions were therefore sent to von Weldren, but they were delayed by tempestuous weather. In any case, they would have been of no avail. The British government was in no mood for temporizing. On December 20th, 1780, war was declared against the United Provinces, and three days later, York left The Hague. End of chapter 24. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of Holland by George Edmondson. Chapter 25. The Stadtholderate of William V continued, 1780 to 1788. The outbreak of war meant the final ruin of the Dutch Republic. Its internal condition at the close of 1780 made it hopelessly unfitted to enter upon a struggle with the overwhelming sea power of England. Even had William V possessed the qualities of leadership, he would have had to contend against the bitter opposition and enmity of the anti Orange party among the burgher regents, of which v a n d e r k a p p e l e n was one of the most moving spirits, and which had its chief centre in Amsterdam. But the prince, weak and incompetent, was apparently intent only on evading his responsibilities, and so laid himself open to the charges of neglect and maladministration that were brought against him by his enemies. Against an English fleet of more than three hundred vessels manned by a force of something like one hundred thousand seamen, the Dutch had but twenty ships of the line, most of them old and of little value. Large sums of money were now voted for the equipment of a fleet. And the admiralties were urged to press forward the work with all possible vigor. But progress was necessarily slow. Everything was lacking material, munitions, equipment, skilled labor, and these could not be supplied in time to prevent Dutch commerce being swept from the seas and the Dutch colonies captured. The Republicans, or Patriots as they began to name themselves, were at first delighted that the Orange Stadtholder and his party had been compelled to break with England. And to seek the alliance of France. But their joy was short lived. Bad tidings followed rapidly one upon another. In the first month of the war, two hundred merchantmen were captured, of the value of fifteen million florins. The fishing fleets dared not put out to sea. In 1780, more than two thousand vessels passed through the Sound. In 1781, only eleven. On February 3rd, St. Eustatius surrendered to Admiral Rodney. When one hundred and thirty merchantmen, together with immense stores, fell into the hands of the captors. 
Surinam and Curaçao received warning and were able to put themselves into a state of defense. But the colonies of De Merera, Berbice, and Esquibo were taken. Also St. Martin, Saba, and the Dutch establishments on the coast of Guinea. In the East Indies, Negapotam and the factories in Bengal passed into English possession, and the Cape, Java, and Ceylon would have shared the same fate, but for the timely protection of a French squadron under the command of Suffren, one of the ablest and bravest of French seamen. The losses were enormous, and loud was the outcry raised in Amsterdam and elsewhere against the prince of being the cause of his country's misfortunes. Orange, so his enemies said, is to blame for everything. He possessed the power to do whatsoever he would, and he neglected to use it in providing for the navy and the land's defenses. This was, to a considerable extent, unjust, for William from 1767 onwards had repeatedly urged an increase of the sea and land forces, but his proposals had been thwarted by bitter opposition, especially in Amsterdam itself. The accusations were to this extent correct that he was undoubtedly invested with large executive power, which he had not the strength of will to use. It was at this period that von der Capellen and others started a most violent press campaign, not only against the stadtholder, but against the hereditary stadtholdership and all that the House of Orange Nassau stood for in the history of the Dutch Republic. Brunswick was attacked with special virulence. The act of consultation had become known, and, had the prince been willing to throw responsibility upon the duke for bad advice, he might have gained some fleeting popularity by separating himself from the hated foreigner. But William, weak though he was, would not abandon the man who in his youth had been to him and to his house a wise and staunch protector and friend, and he knew, moreover, that the accusations against Brunswick were really aimed at himself. The Duke, however, appealing to the States-General, and being by them declared free from blame, found the spirit of hostility so strong at Amsterdam and in several of the provincial estates that he withdrew first, 1782, to Hertogenbosch, of which place he was governor, and finally left the country in 1784. The war, meanwhile, which had been the cause, or rather the pretext, for this outburst of popular feeling against Brunswick, was pursuing its course. In the summer of 1781, Rear Admiral Zutman, at the head of a squadron of fifteen warships, was ordered to convoy seventy-two merchantmen into the Baltic. He met an English force of twelve vessels, which were larger and better armed than the Dutch, under Vice Admiral Hyde Parker. A fierce encounter took place at the Doggerbank on August 5th, which lasted all day without either side being able to claim the victory. Parker was the first to retreat, but Zutman had likewise to return to the Tehel to repair his disabled ships, and his convoy never reached the Baltic. The Dutch, however, were greatly elated at the result of the fight, and Zutman and his captains were feted as heroes. Dogger Bank battle was but, at the most, an indecisive engagement on a very small scale and it brought no relaxation in the English blockade. No Dutch admiral throughout the rest of the war ventured to face the English squadrons in the North Sea and the Channel, and the Dutch mercantile marine disappeared from the ocean. England was strong enough to defy the armed neutrality, which indeed proved, as its authoress Catherine II is reported to have said, an armed nullity. There was deep dissatisfaction throughout the country, and mutual recriminations between the various responsible authorities, but there was some justice in making the stadtholder the chief scapegoat, for, whatever may have been the faults of others, a vigorous initiative in the earlier years of his stadtholdership might have affected much, and would have certainly gained for him increased influence and respect. The war lasted for two years, if war that could be called in which there was practically no fighting. There were changes of government in England during that time, and the party of which Fox was a leader had no desire to press hardly upon the Dutch. Several efforts were made to induce them to negotiate in London a separate peace on favorable terms, but the partisans of France in Amsterdam and elsewhere rendered these tentative negotiations fruitless. Being weak, the Republic suffered accordingly by having to accept finally whatever terms its mightier neighbor thought fit to dictate. 
On November 30, 1782, the preliminary treaty by which Great Britain conceded to the United States of America their independence was concluded. A truce between Great Britain and France followed in January 1783, in which the United Provinces, as a satellite of France, were included. No further hostilities took place, but the negotiations for a definitive peace dragged on, the protests of the Dutch plenipotentiaries at Paris against the terms arranged between England and France being of no avail. Finally, the French government concluded a separate peace on September 3rd, but it was not till May 20th, 1784, that the Dutch could be induced to surrender Negapatam and to grant the English the right of free entry into the Moluccas. Nor was this the only humiliation the Republic had at this time to suffer, for during the course of the English war serious troubles with the Emperor Joseph II had arisen. Joseph had in 1780 paid a visit to his Belgian provinces, and he had seen with his own eyes the ruinous condition of the barrier fortresses. On the pretext that the fortresses were now useless, since France and the Republic were allies, Joseph informed the States-General of his intention to dismantle them all with the exception of Antwerp and Luxembourg. This meant, of course, the withdrawal of the Dutch garrisons. The States-General, being unable to resist, deemed it the wiser course to submit. The troops accordingly left the barrier towns in January 1782. Such submission, as was to be expected, inevitably led to further demands. The Treaty of Munster, 1648, had left the Dutch in possession of territory on both banks of the Scheldt, and had given them the right to close all access by river to Antwerp, which had for a century and a quarter ceased to be a seaport. In 1781, during his visit to Belgium, Joseph had received a number of petitions in favor of the liberation of the Scheldt. At the moment he did not see his way to taking action, but in 1783 he took advantage of the embarrassments of the Dutch government to raise the question of a disputed boundary in Dutch Flanders, and in autumn of that year a body of imperial troops took forcible possession of some frontier forts near Sluis. Matters were brought to a head in May 1784 by the Emperor sending to the States General a detailed summary of all his grievances, Tableau Sommaire des Prétentions. In this he claimed, besides cessions of territory at Maastricht and in Dutch Flanders, the right of free navigation on the Scheldt, the demolition of the Dutch forts closing the river, and freedom from trading from the Belgian ports to the Indies. This document was in fact an ultimatum, the rejection of which meant war. For once all parties in the Republic were united in resistance to the Emperor's demands, and when in October 1784 two ships attempted to navigate the Scheldt, the one starting from Antwerp, the other from Ostend, they were both stopped, the first at Saftingen on the frontier, the second at Flushing. War seemed imminent. An Austrian army corps was sent to the Netherlands, and the Dutch bestirred themselves with a vigor unknown in the States for many years to equip a strong fleet and raise troops to repel invasion. It is, however, almost certain that, had Joseph carried out his threat of sending a force of 80,000 men to avenge the insult offered to his ships, the hastily enlisted Dutch troops would not have been able to offer effectual resistance. But the question the Emperor was raising was no mere local question. He was really seeking to violate important clauses of two international treaties to which all the great powers were parties, the Treaty of Munster and the Treaty of Utrecht. His own possession of the Belgian Netherlands and the independence and sovereign rights of the Dutch Republic rested on the same title. Joseph had counted upon the help, or at least the friendly neutrality, of his brother-in-law, Louis the Sixteenth, but France had just concluded an exhausting war in which the United Provinces had been her allies. The French, moreover, had no desire to see the Republic overpowered by an act of aggression that might give rise to European complications. Louis the Sixteenth offered mediation, and it was accepted. It is doubtful indeed whether the Emperor, whose restless brain was always full of new schemes, really meant to carry his threats into execution. In the autumn of 1784, a plan for exchanging the distant Belgian Netherlands for the contiguous electorate of Bavaria was beginning to exercise his thoughts and diplomacy. 
He showed himself, therefore, ready to make concessions, and by the firmness of the attitude of France, both the disputants were, after lengthy negotiations, brought to terms, which were embodied in a treaty signed at Fontainebleau on November the 8th, 1785. The Dutch retained the right to close the Scheldt, but had to dismantle some of the forts. The frontier of Dutch Flanders was to be that of 1664, and Joseph gave up all claims to Maastricht in consideration of a payment of 9,500,000 florins. A few days later, an alliance between France and the Republic, known as the Defensive Confederacy of Fontainebleau, was concluded. The French government advancing 4,500,000 florins towards the ransom of Maastricht. The return of peace, however, far from allaying the spirit of faction in the Republic, was to lead to civil strife. The situation with which William V now had to deal was in some ways more difficult and dangerous than in the days of his greater predecessors. It was no longer a mere struggle for supremacy between the Orange Stadtholder Party, Prin Gesinderi, and the patrician regents of the town corporation, Staatsgesinderi. A third party had come into existence, the Democratic or Patriot Party, which had imbibed the revolutionary ideas of Rousseau and others about the rights of man and the social contract. These new ideas spread about with fiery zeal by the two nobles, van der Capellen Tote de Paul and his cousin van der Capellen van den Marsch, had found a fertile soil in the northern Netherlands among all classes, including other nobles and many leading burgomasters. Their aim was to abolish all privileges, whether in church or state, and to establish the principle of the sovereignty of the people. These were the days, be it remembered, which immediately succeeded the American Revolution, and preceded the summoning of the States General in France with its fateful consequences. The atmosphere was full of revolution, and the men of the new ideas had no more sympathy with the pretensions of an aristocratic caste of burgher regents to exclude their fellow citizens from a voice in the management of their own affairs than they had with the quasi-sovereign position of an hereditary stadtholder. Among the Orange Party were few men of mark. The council pensionary Blazevik was without character, ready to change sides with the shifting wind and Count Bedding von Rohn had little ability. They were, however, to discover in Burgomaster von de Spiel of Goes a statesman destined soon to play a great part in the history of the country. During this period of acute party strife, Patriot and Orange men were not merely divided from one another on questions of domestic policy. The one party were strong adherents of the French alliance, and lent upon its support the other sought to renew the bonds which had so long united the Republic with England. Indeed, the able representatives of France and England at the Hague at this time, the Count de Verac and Sir James Harris, afterwards Lord Malmesbury, were the real leaders and advisers behind the scenes of the opposing factions. The strength of parties varied in the different provinces. Holland, always more or less anti-stadholder, was the chief center of the Patriots, with Holland were the majority of the estates of Friesland, Groningen, and Overijssel. In Utrecht the nobles and the regents were for the stadtholder, but the townsmen were strong patriots. Zeeland supported the prince, who had with him the army, the preachers, and the great mass of small bourgeoisie and the country folk. Nothing could exceed the violence and unscrupulousness of the attacks that were directed against the stadtholder in the press and no efforts were spared by his opponents to curtail his rights and insult him personally. Corps of Patriot volunteers were enrolled in different places with self-elected officers. The wearing of the orange colors and the singing of the Wilhelmus was forbidden, and punished by fine and imprisonment. In September 1785, a riot at The Hague led to the estates of Holland taking from the stadtholder the command of the troops in that city. They likewise ordered the foot guards henceforth to salute the members of the estates, and removed the arms of the prince from the standards and the facings of the troops. As a further slight, the privilege was given to the deputies, while the estates were in session, to pass through the gate into the Binnenhof, which had hitherto been reserved for the use of the stadtholder alone. Filled with indignation and resentment, William left The Hague with his family and withdrew to his country residence at Hetlow. 
Such a step only increased the confusion and disorder that was filling every part of the country, for it showed that William had neither the spirit nor the energy to make a firm stand against those who were resolved to overthrow his authority. In Utrecht the strife between the parties led to scenes of violence. The patriots found an eloquent leader in the person of a young student named Antje. The estates of the province were as conservative as the city of Utrecht itself was ultra-democratic, and a long series of disturbances were caused by the burgher regents of the town council refusing to accede to the popular demand for a drastic change in their constitution. Finally, they were besieged in the town hall by a numerous gathering of the free corps headed by Andacha and were compelled to accede to the people's demands. A portion of the estates thereupon assembled at Amersfoort, and at their request a body of four hundred troops were sent there from Nijmegen. Civil war seemed imminent, but it was averted by the timely mediation of the estates of Holland. Scarcely less dangerous was the state of affairs in Helderland. Here the estates of the Helderland had an orange majority, but the patriots had an influential leader in van der Kapel and Vandenmarsch. Petitions and requests were sent to the estates demanding popular reforms. The estates not only refused to receive them, but issued a proclamation forbidding the dissemination of revolutionary literature in the province. The small towns of Elberg and Hattem not only refused to obey, but the inhabitants proceeded by force to compel their councils to yield to their demands. The estates thereupon called upon the stadtholder to send troops to restore order. This was done, and garrisons were placed in Elberg and Hattem. This step caused a very great commotion in Holland, and especially at Amsterdam, and the patriot leaders felt that the time had come to take measures by which to unite all their forces in the different parts of the country for common defense and common action. The result of all this was that the movement became more and more revolutionary in its aims. To such an extent was this the case that many of the old aristocratic anti stadtholder regents began to perceive that carrying out of the Patriots' program of popular reform would mean the overthrow of the system of government which they upheld, at the same time as that of the stadtholderate. The reply of the Estates of Holland to the strong measures taken against Alberg and Hattem was the provisional removal of the prince from the post of Captain General and the recalling on their own authority of all troops in the pay of the province serving in the frontier fortresses, August 1786. As the year went on, the agitation grew in volume. Increasing numbers were enrolled in the free corps. The complete ascendancy of the ultra-democratic patriots was proved and assured by tumultuous gatherings at Amsterdam, April 21, 1787, and a few days later at Rotterdam, compelling the town councils to dismiss at Amsterdam nine regents and at Rotterdam seven, suspected of orange leanings. Holland was now entirely under patriot control, and the Democrats in other districts were eagerly looking to the forces which Holland could bring into the field to protect the patriot cause from tyrannous acts of oppression by the stadtholders' troops. In the summer of 1787, the forces on both sides were being mustered on the borders of the province of Utrecht, and frequent collisions had already taken place. Nothing but the prince's indecision had prevented the actual outbreak of a general civil war. At the critical moment of suspense, an incident occurred, however, which was to effect a dramatic change in the situation. William's pusillanimous attitude, he was actually talking of withdrawing from the country to Nassau, was by no means acceptable to his high-spirited wife. The princess was all for vigorous action, and she wrung from William a reluctant consent to her returning from Nijmegen, where for security she had been residing with her family, to The Hague. In that political center she would be in close communication with Sir J. Harris and von der Spiegel, and would be able to organize a powerful opposition in Holland to patriot ascendancy. It was a bold move, the success of which largely depended on the secrecy with which it was carried out. On June 28th, Wilhelmina started from Nijmegen, but the commandant of the Free Corps at Gouda, hearing that horses were being ordered at Schoenhoven and Hasrecht for a considerable party, immediately sent to headquarters for instructions. He was told not to allow any suspicious body of persons to pass. 
He accordingly stopped the princess and detained her at a farm until the arrival at Vorden of the members of the Committee of the Defense. By these her highness was treated, on learning her quality, with all respect, but she was informed that she could not proceed without the permit of the estates of Holland. The indignant princess did not wait for the permit to arrive, but returned to Namewagen. The British ambassador Harris at once brought the action of the estates of Holland before the states general and demanded satisfaction, and on July 10th a still more peremptory demand was made by the Prussian ambassador von Tullemeyer. Frederick William II was incensed at the treatment his sister had received, and when the estates of Holland refused to punish the offending officials on the ground that no insult had been intended, orders were immediately given for an army of twenty thousand men under Charles, Duke of Brunswick, to cross the frontier and exact reparation. The Prussians entered in three columns and met with little opposition. Utrecht, where seven thousand patriot volunteers were encamped, was evacuated, the whole force taking flight and retreating in disorder to Holland. Gorkum, Dordrecht, Kampen, and other towns surrendered without a blow, and on September 17th Brunswick's troops entered the Hague amidst general rejoicings. The populace wore orange favors, and the streets rang with the cry of Orange Bovin. Amsterdam still held out and prepared for defense, hoping for French succor, and thither the leaders of the Patriot Party had fled, together with their representatives of six cities. The nobility, the representatives of eight cities, and the council pensionary remained at The Hague, met as the estates of Holland, repealed all the anti-Orange edicts, and invited the prince to return. Amidst scenes of great enthusiasm, the stadtholder made his entry into the Binnenhof on September 20th. The hopes held by the patriot refugees at Amsterdam of French aid were in vain, for the French government was in no position to help anyone. As soon as the Prussian army appeared before the gates, the town council, as in 1650, was unwilling to jeopardize the welfare of the city by armed resistance, and negotiations were opened with Brunswick. On October 3rd, Amsterdam capitulated, and the campaign was over. The princess was now in a position to demand reparation for the insults she had received, and though her terms were severe, the estates of Holland obsequiously agreed to carry them out. October 6. She demanded the punishment of all who had taken part in her arrest, the disbanding of the free corps, and the purging of the various town councils of obnoxious persons. All this was done. In the middle of November the main body of the Prussians departed, but a force of four thousand men remained to assist the Dutch troops in keeping order. The English ambassador Harris and von de Spiegel were the chief advisers of the now dominant Orange government and drastic steps were taken to establish the hereditary stadtholderate henceforth on a firm basis. All persons filling any office were required to swear to maintain the settlement of 1766, and to declare that the high and hereditary dignities conferred upon the Princes of Orange were an essential part not only of the constitution of each province, but of the whole state. An amnesty was proclaimed by the Prince on November 21st, but it contained so many exceptions that it led to a large number of the patriots seeking a place of refuge in foreign countries, as indeed many of the leaders had already done, chiefly in France and the Belgian Netherlands. It has been said that the exiles numbered as many as 40,000, but this is possibly an exaggeration. The victory of the Orange Party was complete, but a triumph achieved by the aid of a foreign invader was dearly purchased. The Prussian troops, as they retired laden with booty after committing many excesses, left behind them a legacy of hatred. End of chapter 25
after the restoration of the stadtholder's power had been firmly established, was the appointment of Lorenz Peter van der Spiegel to the post of council pensionary of Holland, in place of the trimmer Blechweg. It was quite contrary to usage that a Zeelander should hold this, the most important post in the estates of Holland, but the influence of the princess and of Harris secured his unanimous election on December 3, 1787. Van der Spiegel proved himself to be a statesman of high capacity, sound judgment, and great moderation, not unworthy to be ranked among the more illustrious occupants of his great office. He saw plainly the hopeless deadlock and confusion of the machinery of government, and its need of root and branch revision, but he was no more able to achieve it than his predecessors. The feebleness of the stadtholder, the high-handedness of the princess, and the selfish clinging of the patrician regents to their privileged monopoly of civic power were insuperable hindrances to any attempts to interfere with the existing state of things. Such was the inherent weakness of the Republic that it was an independent state in little more than name. Its form of government was guaranteed by foreign powers, on whom it had to rely for its defence against external foes. Prussia, by armed force, England, by diplomatic support, had succeeded in restoring the hereditary stadtholderate to a predominant position in the state. It was the first care of the triumvirate, Harris, van der Spiegel, and the princess, to secure what had been achieved by bringing about a defensive alliance between the Republic, Great Britain, and Prussia. After what had taken place, this was not a difficult task, and two separate treaties were signed between the States General and the two protecting powers on the same day, April 15, 1788, each of the three States undertaking to furnish a definite quota of troops, ships, or money, if called upon to do so. Both Prussia and England gave a strong guarantee for the upholding of the hereditary stadtholderate. This was followed by the conclusion of an Anglo-Prussian alliance, directed against France and Austria, August 13. The marriage of the hereditary prince with Frederica Louise Wilhelmina of Prussia added yet another to the many royal alliances of the House of Orange. But, though it raised the prestige of the stadtholder's position, it only served to make that position more dependent on the support of the foreigner. The council pensionary, van der Spiegel, did all that statesman could do in these difficult times to effect reforms and bring order out of chaos. It was fortunate for the Republic that the stadtholder should have discerned the merits of this eminent servant of the state and entrusted to him so largely the direction of affairs. Internally, the spirit of action had, superficially at least, been crushed by Prussian military intervention, but externally there was serious cause for alarm. Van der Spiegel watched, with growing disquietude, the threatening aspect of things in France, preluding the Great Revolution, and still more serious was the insurrection, which the reforming zeal of Joseph II had caused to break out in the Austrian Netherlands. Joseph's personal visit to his Belgian dominions had filled him with a burning desire to sweep away the various provincial privileges and customs, and to replace them by administrative uniformity. Not less was his eagerness to free education from clerical influence. He stirred up thereby the fierce opposition of clericals and democrats alike, ending in armed revolt in Brabant and elsewhere. A desultory struggle went on during the years 1787, 88, and 89, ending in January 1790, in a meeting of the States General at Brussels, and the formation of a federal republic under the name of the United States of Belgium. All this was very perturbing to the Dutch government, who were most anxious lest an Austrian attempt at reconquest might lead to a European conflict close to their borders. The death of Joseph, on February 24, 1790, caused the danger to disappear. His brother, Leopold II, at once offered to re-establish ancient privileges, and succeeded by tact and moderation in restoring Austrian rule 
under the old conditions. That this result was brought about without any intervention of foreign powers was in no small measure due to a conference at The Hague, in which van der Spiegel conducted negotiations with the representatives of Prussia, England and Austria for a settlement of the Belgian question without disturbance of the peace. The council pensionary found the finances of the country in a state of great confusion. One of his first cares was a reassessment of the provincial quotas, some of which were greatly in arrears and inadequate in amount, thus throwing a disproportionate burden upon Holland. It was a difficult task, but successfully carried out. The affairs of the East and West India companies next demanded his serious attention. Both of them were practically bankrupt. The East India Company had, during the eighteenth century, been gradually on the decline. Its object was to extract wealth from Java and its other eastern possessions, and by holding the monopoly of trade and compelling the natives to hand over to the company's officials a proportion of the produce of the land at a price fixed by the company far below its real value, contingent on la garantie stelzel. The country was drained of its resources, and the inhabitants impoverished simply to increase the shareholders' dividends. This was bad enough, but it was made worse by the type of men whom the directors, all of whom belonged to the patrician regent families, sent out to fill the posts of governor-general and the subordinate governorships. For many decades these officials had been chosen, not for their proved experience, or for their knowledge of the East or of the Indian trade, but because of family connection, and the nominees went forth with the intention of enriching themselves as quickly as possible. This led to all sorts of abuses, and the profits of the company from all these causes kept diminishing. But, in order to keep up their credit, the board of seventeen continued to pay large dividends out of capital, with the inevitable result that the company got into debt and had to apply for help to the state. The English war completed its ruin. In June 1783, the estates of Holland appointed a commission to examine into the affairs of the company. Too many people in Holland had invested their money in it, and the Indian trade was too important for an actual collapse of the company to be permitted. Accordingly, an advance of eight million florins was made to the directors, with a guarantee for thirty-eight million of debt. But things went from bad to worse. In 1790, the indebtedness of the company amounted to eighty-five million florins. Van der Spiegel and others were convinced that the only satisfactory solution would be for the state to dissolve the company and take over the Indian possessions in full sovereignty at the cost of liquidating the debt. A commission was appointed in 1791 to proceed to the east and make a report upon the condition of the colonies. Before their mission was accomplished, the French armies were overrunning the Republic. It was not till 1798 that the existence of the company actually came to an end. To the West India Company, the effects of the English war was likewise disastrous. The Guinea colonies, whose sugar plantations had been a source of great profit, had been conquered first by the English, then by the French, and, though they were restored after the war, the damage inflicted had brought the company into heavy difficulties. Its charter expired in 1791, and it was not renewed. The colonies became colonies of the state, the shareholders being compensated by exchanging their depreciated shares for government bonds. The Orange Restoration, however, and the efforts of van der Spiegel to strengthen its basis by salutary reforms were doomed to be short-lived. The council pensionary, in spite of his desire to relinquish office at the end of his quinquennial term, was re-elected by the Estates of Holland on December 6, 1792, and yielded to the pressure put upon him to continue his task. A form of government which had been imposed against their will on the Patriot Party, by the aid of foreign bayonets, was certain to have many enemies, and such prospect of permanence as it had lay in the goodwill and confidence inspired 
by the statesmanlike and conciliatory policy of van der Spiegel. But it was soon to be swept away in the cataclysm of the French Revolution, now at the height of its devastating course. In France, extreme revolutionary ideas had made rapid headway, ending in the dethronement and imprisonment of the king on August 10, 1792. The invasion of France by the Prussian and Austrian armies only served to inflame the French people, intoxicated by their newfound liberty, to a frenzy of patriotism. Hastily raised armies succeeded in checking the invasion at Valmy on September 20, 1792, and in their turn invading Belgium, under the leadership of de Maurier, they completely defeated the Austrians at Chimap on November 6. The whole of Belgium was overrun, and by a decree of the French Convention was annexed. The fiery enthusiasts, into whose hands the government of the French Republic had fallen, were eager to carry by force of arms the principles of liberty, fraternity and equality to all Europe, declaring that all governments are our enemies, all peoples are our friends. The southern Netherlands having been conquered, it was evident that the northern republic would speedily invite attack. The Dutch government, anxious to avoid giving any cause for hostilities, had carefully abstained from offering any encouragement to the emigrants or support to the enemies of the French Republic. Van der Spiegel had even expressed to de Molde, the French ambassador, a desire to establish friendly relations with the Republican government. But the Jacobins looked upon the United Provinces as the dependent of their enemies, England and Prussia. And, when after the execution of the king, the English ambassador was recalled from Paris, the National Convention immediately declared war against England, and at the same time against the Stadtholder of Holland, because of his slavish bondage to the courts of St. James and Berlin. De Maurier, at the head of the French army, prepared to enter the United Provinces at two points. The main body, under his own command, was to cross the Mochdeg to Dortrecht, and then advance on Rotterdam, the Hague, Leiden and Haarlem. He was accompanied by the so-called Batavian Legion, enlisted from the Patriot exiles under Colonel Dindles, once the fiery anti-orange advocate of Hattem. General Miranda, who was besieging Maastricht, was to march by Nijmegen and Venlo to Utrecht. The two forces would then unite and make themselves masters of Amsterdam the ambitious scheme miscarried. At first, success attended de Maurier. Breda fell after a feeble resistance, also de Klundert and Gertrudenberg. Meanwhile, the advance of an Austrian army under Coburg relieved Maastricht and inflicted a defeat upon the French at Aldenhervenen, March 1, 1793. De Maurier, compelled to retreat, was himself beaten at Neerwinden on March 18 and withdrew to Antwerp. For the moment, danger was averted. Revolutionary movements at Amsterdam and elsewhere failed to realise the hopes of the patriots, and the Dutch government was able to breathe again. It indeed appeared that the French menace need no longer be feared. Du Maurier changed sides, and failing to induce his troops to follow him, took refuge in the enemy's camp. A powerful coalition had now been formed by the energy of Pitt against revolutionary France, and, in April 1794, a strong English army under the Duke of York had joined Coburg. They were supported by 22,000 Dutch troops, commanded by the two sons of the Prince of Orange. New French armies, however, organized by the genius of Carnot, proved more than a match for the Allied forces acting without any unity of place, under slow-moving and incompetent leaders. Coburg and the Austrians were heavily defeated at Fleurus by Jourdain on June 26. York and Prince William thereupon retreated across the frontier, followed by the French under Pichecru, while another French general, Moreau, took Sluis, 
and overran Dutch Flanders. This gave fresh encouragement to the Patriot Party, who in Amsterdam formed a revolutionary committee, of which the leaders were Gurgel, Van Damme, and Krenhoff. Nothing avert was done, but by means of a large number of so-called reading societies, Lies Geselschappen, secret preparations were made for a general uprising, so soon as circumstances permitted, and communications were meanwhile kept up with the exiled patriots. But Pichcru, though he captured Maastricht and other towns, was very cautious in his movements, and distrustful of the promises of the Amsterdam Convention that a general revolt would follow upon his entry into Holland. In this way the year 1794 drew to its end, and, as no further help from England or Prussia could be obtained, the States-General thought it might be possible to save the Republic from the fate of Belgium by opening negotiations for peace with the enemy. Accordingly, two envoys, Branson and Repelle, were sent on December 16 to the French headquarters, whence they proceeded to Paris. Fearing lest their plans for an uprising should be foiled, the Amsterdam Committee also dispatched two representatives, Blau and Van Damme, to Paris to counteract the envoys of Van der Spiegel, and to urge upon the French commanders an immediate offensive against Holland. The withdrawal of the remains of the English army, under the Duke of York, and the setting in of a strong frost, led force to their representations. The army of Pichcru, accompanied by Dendels and his Batavian legion, were able to cross the rivers, and Holland lay open before them. It was in vain that the two young orange princes did their utmost to organize resistance. In January 1795, one town after another surrendered, and on the 19th, Dendels, without opposition, entered Amsterdam. The revolution was completely triumphant, for on this very day the stadtholder, despite the protests of his sons and the efforts of the council pensionary, had left the country. The English government had offered to receive William V and his family, and arrangements had been quietly made for the passage across the North Sea. The princess, with her daughter-in-law and grandson, were the first to leave, and on January 17, 1795, William himself, on the ground that the French would never negotiate so long as he was in the country, bade farewell to the States-General and the foreign ambassadors. On the following day he embarked with his sons and household on a number of fishing pinks at Scheveningen and put to sea. With his departure, the Stadtholderet and the Republic of the United Netherlands came to an end. End of chapter 26「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of Holland by George Edmondson Chapter 27 The Batavian Republic, 1795-1806 to On January 19, 1795, Amsterdam fell into the hands of the advancing French troops. Dandels had previously caused a proclamation to be distributed which declared that the representatives of the French people wished the Dutch nation to make themselves free, that they do not desire to oppress them as conquerors, but to ally themselves with them as a free people. A complete change of the city government took place without any disturbance or shedding of blood. At the summons of the Revolutionary Committee, the members of the town council left the council hall and were replaced by twenty-one citizens as provisional representatives of the people of Amsterdam. Of this body, Rutger Jan Skimmelpenink, a former advocate of the council, was appointed president. The other towns, one after the other, followed in the steps of the capital. The patrician corporations were abolished and replaced by provisional municipal assemblies. Everywhere the downfall of the old regime was greeted with tumultuous joy by those large sections of the Dutch population which had imbibed revolutionary principles, 
and the French troops were welcomed by the patriots as brothers and deliverers. Trees of liberty, painted in the national colors, were erected in the principal squares, and the citizens wearing caps of liberty danced round them hand in hand with the foreign soldiers. Feast-making, illuminations, and passionate orations, telling that a new era of liberty, fraternity, and equality had dawned for the Batavian people, were the order of the day. The revolution was not confined to the town corporations. At the invitation of the Amsterdam Committee and under the protection of the French representatives, deputations from fourteen towns met at The Hague on January 26th. Taking possession of the assembly hall of the Estates of Holland and choosing as their president Peter Paulus, a man generally respected, this provisional assembly proceeded to issue a series of decrees subverting all the ancient institutions of the land. The representation by estates and the offices of stadtholder and of council pensionary were abolished. The old colleges, such as the commissioned councillors, the admiralties, the chamber of accounts, were changed into committees for general welfare, for war, for marine, for finance, etc. The other provinces, in turn, followed Holland's example, and the changes in the provincial administrations were then quickly extended to the states general. These retained their name, but now were to be representative of the citizens of the whole land. The Council of State was transformed into a Committee for General Affairs, and a Colonial Council replaced the East and West India Companies and the Society of Suriname. To the Committee for General Affairs was entrusted the task of drawing up a plan for the summoning of a national convention on March 4th. So far, all had gone smoothly with the course of the revolutionary movement, so much so that its leaders seem almost to have forgotten that the land was in the occupation of a foreign conqueror. The unqualified recognition of Batavian independence, however, in the proclamation by Dandels had caused dissatisfaction in Paris. The Committee of Public Safety had no intention of throwing away the fruits of victory, and two members of the convention, Cacon and Rommel, were dispatched to Holland to report upon the condition of affairs. They arrived at The Hague on February 7th. Both reports recommended that a war indemnity should be levied on the Republic, but counseled moderation, for, though the private wealth of the Dutch was potentially large, the state was practically insolvent. These proposals were too mild to please the Committee of Public Safety. The new States General had sent, March 3rd, two envoys, Van Blau and Meyer, to Paris with instructions to propose a treaty of alliance and of commerce with France, to ask for the withdrawal of the French troops, and that the land should not be flooded with assignat. The independence of the Batavian Republic was taken for granted. Very different were the conditions laid before them by Merlin de Du, Rubel, and Siez. A war contribution of one hundred million florins was demanded, to be paid in ready money within three months, a loan of like amount at three per cent, and the surrender of all territory south of the Waal together with Dutch Flanders, Walcheren, and South Beveland. Moreover, there was to be no recognition of Batavian independence until a satisfactory treaty on the above lines was drawn up. These hard conditions were on March 23rd rejected by the States General. Wiser councils, however, prevented this point-blank refusal being sent to Paris, and it was hoped that a policy of delay might secure better terms. The negotiations went on slowly through March and April, and, as Blau and Mayer had no powers as accredited plenipotentiaries, the committee determined to send Rubel and Siez to The Hague, armed with full authority to push matters through. The envoys reached The Hague on May 8th, and found the States General in a more yielding mood than might have been expected from their previous attitude. Rubel and Siez knew how to play upon the fears of the provisional government by representing to them that, if the terms they offered were rejected, their choice lay between French annexation or an orange restoration. Four members were appointed by the States General with full powers to negotiate. The conferences began on May 11th, and in five days an agreement was reached. The Batavian Republic, recognized as a free and independent state, entered into an offensive and defensive alliance with the French Republic but the Dutch had to cede Maastricht, Venlo, and Dutch Flanders, and to pay an indemnity of 100 million florins. 
Flushing was to receive a French garrison, and its harbor was to be used in common by the two powers. Twenty-five thousand French troops were to be quartered in the Republic and were to be fed, clothed, and paid. The Dutch were compelled to permit the free circulation of the worthless assignats in their country. One of the first results of this treaty was a breach with Great Britain. The Dutch coast was blockaded, British fleets stopped all seaborne commerce, and the Dutch colonies in the East and West Indies were one after the other captured. The action of the Prince of Orange made this an easy task. William placed in the hands of the British commanders letters addressed to the governors of the Dutch colonies, ordering them to admit the troops sent out on behalf of His Britannic Majesty, and to offer no resistance to the British warships, but to regard them as vessels of a friendly power. The Cape of Good Hope surrendered to Admiral Rodney, and in quick succession followed Malacca, Ceylon, and the Moluccas. A squadron of nine ships under Rear Admiral Lucas sent out to recover the Cape and the other East Indian possessions was compelled to surrender to the English in Saldan Ha Bay on August 17, 1796, almost without resistance, owing to the orange sympathies of the crews. The West Indian colonies fared no better. Demeraba, Esquibo, and Berbice capitulated in the spring of 1796. Suriname remained in Dutch hands until 1799, Java until 1801. The occupation by the English of this island, the most important of all the Dutch overseas possessions, made the tale of their colonial losses complete. The offensive and defensive alliance with France had thus brought upon the Republic, as a trading and colonial power, a ruin which the efforts of the provisional government under French pressure to reorganize and strengthen their naval and military forces had been unable to prevent. The erstwhile exiles, Dandels and Dumonceau, who had attained the rank of generals in the French service, were on their return entrusted with the task of raising an army of 36,000 men, disciplined and equipped on the French system. The Navy was dealt with by a special committee, of which Peter Paulus was the energetic president. Unfortunately for the committee, a large proportion of the officers and crews were strongly Orangist. Most of the officers resigned, and it was necessary to purge the crews. Their places had to be supplied by less experienced and trustworthy material, but Vice Admiral Jan de Winter did his utmost to create a fleet in fit condition to join the French and Spanish fleets in convoying an expeditionary force to make a descent upon the coast of Ireland. In July 1797, eighty ships were concentrated at the Tejal with troops on board, ready to join the Franco-Spanish squadrons, which were to sail from Brest. But the junction was never effected. Week after week the Dutch admiral was prevented from leaving to Hull by contrary winds. The idea of an invasion of Ireland was given up, but so great was the disappointment in Holland, and such the pressure exerted on de Winter by the Commission of Foreign Affairs, that he was obliged against his will to put to sea on October 7th, and attack the English fleet under the command of Admiral Duncan, who was blockading the Dutch coast. The number of vessels on the two sides was not unequal, but neither officers nor crews under de Winter could compare in seamanship and experience with their opponents. The fleets met off Camperdown, and the Dutch fought with their traditional bravery, but the defeat was complete. Out of sixteen ships of the line, nine were taken, including the flagship of de Winter himself. Meanwhile there had arisen strong differences of opinion in the Republic as to the form of government which was to replace the old confederacy of seven sovereign provinces. No one probably wished to continue a system which had long proved itself obsolete and unworkable. But particularism was still strong, especially in the smaller provinces. The country found itself divided into two sharply opposed parties of Unitarians and Federalists. The Unitarians were the most active, and meetings were held all over the country by the local Jacobin clubs. Finally, it was determined to hold a central meeting of delegates from all the clubs at The Hague. The meeting took place on January 26, 1796, and resolutions were passed in favor of summoning a national convention to draw up a new constitution on Unitarian lines. 
Holland and Utrecht pressed the matter forward in the States General, and they had the support of Helderland and Overijssel, but Zeeland, Friesland, and Groningen refused their assent. Their action was very largely financial, as provinces whose indebtedness was small dreaded lest unification should increase their burden. But even in the recalcitrant provinces there were a large number of moderate men, and through the intervention of the French ambassador, Noel, who gave strong support to the Unitarians, the proposal of Holland for a national assembly to meet on March 1st was carried, February 18th, by a unanimous vote. The following provisional regulation was then rapidly drawn up by a special committee. The land was divided into districts, each containing 15,000 inhabitants. These again into fundamental assemblies, Grandvergadringen, of 500 persons. Each of these assemblies chose an elector, Kaiser, and then the group of 30 electors chose a deputy to represent the district. The National Assembly was in this way to consist of 126 members. Its deliberations were to be public, the voting individualistic, and the majority to prevail. A commission of 21 deputies was to be appointed who were to frame a draft constitution, which after approval by the Assembly was to be submitted to the whole body of the people for acceptance or rejection. The Assembly, having duly met on March 1, 1796, in the Binnenhof at The Hague, elected Peter Paulus as their president, but had the misfortune to lose his experienced direction very speedily. He had for some time been in bad health, and on March 17th he died. It fell to his lot to assist at the ceremonial closing of the last meeting of the States General, which had governed the Republic of the United Netherlands for more than two centuries. The National Assembly reflected the pronounced differences of opinion in the land. Orangist opinion had no representatives, although possibly more than half the population had Orange sympathies. All the deputies had accepted in principle French revolutionary ideas, but there were three distinct parties, the Unitarians, the Moderates, and the Federalists. The Moderates, who were in a majority, occupied, as their name implied, an intermediate position between the Unitarians or Revolutionary Party, who wished for a centralized republic after the French model, and the Federalists or Conservatives, who aimed at retaining, so far as possible, the rights of the several provinces and towns to manage their own affairs. The leaders of the Unitarians were Vreda, Middelrick, Valkenier, and Gogol, of the Moderates, Skimmelpenink, Hahn, and Contelaar, of the Federalist, Vitringa, Van Marle, and De Mist. After the death of Peter Paulus, the most influential man in an assembly composed of politicians mostly without any parliamentary experience, was the eloquent and astute Skimmelpenink, whose opportunist moderation sprang from a natural dislike of extreme courses. One of the first cares of the Assembly was the appointment of the Commission of 21 members to draw up a draft constitution. The so-styled regulation, representing the views of the moderate majority, was presented to the Assembly on November 10th. The Republic was henceforth to be a unified state governed by the sovereign people, but the old provinces, though now named departments, were to retain large administrative rights and their separate financial quotas. The draft met fierce oppositions from the Unitarians, but after much discussion and many amendments it was at length accepted by the majority. It had, however, before becoming law to be submitted to the people, and the network of Jacobin clubs throughout the country under the leadership of the Central Club at Amsterdam carried on a widespread and secret revolutionary propaganda against the regulation. They tried to enlist the open cooperation of the French ambassador, Noel, but he, acting under the instruction of the cautious Talleyrand, was not disposed to commit himself. The Unitarian campaign was so successful that the regulation, on being submitted to the fundamental assemblies, was rejected by 136,716 votes to 27,955. In these circumstances, as had been previously arranged by the provisional government, it was necessary to summon another National Assembly to draw up another draft constitution. It met on September 1, 1797. 
The moderates, though they lost some seats, were still in a majority, and the new commission of twenty-one had, as before, federalistic leanings. The Unitarians, therefore, without awaiting their proposals, under the leadership of the stalwart revolutionary Vreda, determined to take strong action. The coup d'état they planned was helped forward by two events. The first was the revolution in Paris of September 4, 1797, which led to the replacing of Ambassador Noel by the pronounced Jacobin, Charles de la Croix. The other event was the disaster which befell the Dutch fleet at Camperdown, the blame for which was laid upon the provisional government. Vreda and his confederates, being assured by de la Croix of the support of the new French directory, and of the cooperation of the French General Joubert and of Dandels, the commander of the Batavian army, chose for the execution of their plan the week in which Middlerig, one of the confederates, took his turn as president of the assembly. Middlerig, by virtue of his office, being in command of the Hague civic force, on January twenty second, 1798, seized and imprisoned the members of the Committee for Foreign Affairs and twenty-two members of the assembly. The rump then met, protected by a strong body of troops, and declared itself a constituent assembly representing the Batavian people. After the French model, an executive council was nominated, consisting of five members, Vreda, Fania, Fokker, Vildrick, and Van Langen, and a new commission of seven to frame a constitution. The regulation was rejected, and the assembly solemnly proclaimed its unalterable aversion to the stadtholderate, federalism, aristocracy, and governmental decentralization. French influence was henceforth paramount, and the draft of the new constitution, in the framing of which Delacroix took a leading part, was ready on March 6th. Eleven days later it was approved by the assembly. The fundamental assemblies in their turn assented to it by 165,520 votes to 11,597, considerable official pressure being exerted to secure this result, and the Constitution came thus into legal existence. Its principal provisions were directed to the complete obliteration of the old provincial particularism. The land was divided into eight departments, whose boundaries in no case coincided with those of the provinces. Holland was split up among five departments, that of the Amstel, with Amsterdam as its capital, being the only one that did not contain portions of two or more provinces. Each department was divided into seven circles. Each of these returned one member, and the body of seven formed the departmental government. The circles in their turn were divided into communes, each department containing sixty or seventy. All these local administrations were, however, quite subordinate to the authority exercised by the central representative body. For the purpose of electing this body, the land was divided into ninety-four districts, each district into forty fundamental assemblies, each of five hundred persons, the forty electors chosen by these units in their turn elected the deputy for the department. The ninety-four deputies formed the representative body, which was divided into two chambers. The second chamber of thirty members was annually chosen by lot from the ninety-four, the other sixty-four forming the first chamber. The framing and proposing of all laws was the prerogative of the first chamber. The second chamber accepted or rejected those proposed laws, but for a second rejection, a two-thirds majority was required. The executive power was vested in a directorate of five persons, one of whom was to retire every year. To supply his place, the second chamber chose one out of three persons selected by the first chamber. The directorate had the assistance of eight agents or ministers, foreign affairs, war, marine, finance, justice, police, education, and economy. Finance was nationalized, all charges and debts being borne in common. Church and state were separated, payments to the reformed ministers from the state ceasing in three years. Such was the project, but it was not to be carried into effect without another coup d'etat. It was now the duty of the Constituent Assembly to proceed to the election of a representative body, Instead of this, on May 4, 1798, the Assembly declared itself to be representative, so that power remained in the hands of the Executive Council, 
who are afraid of an election returning a majority of moderates. But this autocratic act aroused considerable discontent amongst all except the extreme Jacobin faction. The opponents of the executive council found a leader in Dondles, who, strong unionist though he was, was dissatisfied with the arbitrary conduct of this self-constituted government, and more especially in matters connected with the army. Dendels betook himself to Paris, where he was favorably received by the foreign secretary, Talleyrand, and with his help was able to persuade the French directory that it was not in their interest to support the Jacobin Council in their illegal retention of office. Dendels accordingly returned to Holland, where he found the French commander, Joubert, friendly to his project, and three of the agents, including Piemann, the minister of war, ready to help him. Placed in command of the troops at The Hague, Dendels, June 12, 1798, arrested the directors and the presidents of the two chambers. The Constituent Assembly was dissolved, and a new representative body was, July 31st, elected. The moderates, as was expected, were in a considerable majority, and five members of that party, von Hesselt, Holt, von Herselt, von Hoft, and Emerius, were appointed directors. The country was now at length in the enjoyment of a settled constitution based upon liberal principles and popular representation. Dendels, though his influence was great, never attempted to play the part of a military dictator, and though party passions were strong, no political persecutions followed. Nevertheless, troubled times awaited the Batavian Republic, and the Constitution of 1798 was not to have a long life. The Emperor Paul of Russia had taken up arms with Great Britain and Austria against revolutionary France, and the hopes of the Orange Party began to rise. The hereditary prince was very active, though he was unable to move his brother-in-law, the King of Prussia, to take active steps in his favor. He succeeded in securing the intervention of an Anglo-Russian force on his behalf. In August 1798, a strong English fleet under Admiral Duncan appeared off Tehal and in the name of the Prince of Orange demanded the surrender of the Batavian fleet, which lay there under Rear Admiral Storey. Storey refused. A storm prevented the English from taking immediate action, but on the 26th a landing of troops was effected near Calentrogue and the Batavian forces abandoned the Helder. Story had withdrawn his fleet to Vlader, but Orange's sympathies were strong among his officers and crews, and he was compelled to surrender. The ships, hoisting the Orange flag, became henceforth a squadron attached to the English fleet. Such was the humiliating end of the Batavian navy. The efforts of the hereditary prince to stir up an insurrection in Overesel and Helderland failed, and he thereupon joined the Anglo-Russian army, which, about 50,000 strong, was advancing under the command of the Duke of York to invade Holland. But York was an incompetent commander, there was little harmony between the British and Russian contingents, and the French and Batavians under Generals Brun and Dandels inflicted defeats upon them at Bergen, September 19th, and at Castricum, October 6th. York thereupon entered upon negotiations with Brun and was allowed to re-embark his troops for England, after restoration of the captured guns and prisoners. The expedition was a miserable fiasco. At the very time when the evacuation of North Holland by invading armies was taking place, the Directory in Paris had been overthrown by Bonaparte, 18th Brumaire, or November 20th, who now, with the title of First Consul, ruled France with dictatorial powers. The conduct of the Batavian government during these transactions had not been above suspicion, and Bonaparte at once replaced Brun by Agarreau and sent Semonville as ambassador in place of Desforges. He was determined to compel the Batavian Republic to comply strictly with the terms imposed by the Treaty of 1795, and demanded more troops and more money. In vain the executive council, by the mouth of its ambassador Skimmelpinnick, protested its inability to satisfy those demands. Agarreau was inexorable, and there was no alternative but to obey. But the very feebleness of the central government made Bonaparte resolve on a revision of the Constitution in an anti-democratic direction. Agarreau acted as an intermediary between him and the Executive Council. Three of the directors favored his views, the other two opposed them. 
The representative body, however, rejected all proposals for a revision. On this, the three called in the aid of Augereau, who suspended the representative body and closed the doors of its hall of meeting. The question was now referred to the fundamental assemblies. On October 1, 1801, the voting resulted in 52,272 noes against 16,771 yeas. About 350,000 voters abstained, but these were declared to be yeas, and the new constitution became, on October 16th, the law of the land. The constitution of 1801 placed the executive power in the hands of a state government of twelve persons. The three directors chose seven others, who in their turn chose five more, amongst these the above-named three, to whom they owed their existence. With this state government was associated a legislative body of thirty-five members, who met twice in the year, and whose only function was to accept without amendment or to reject the proposals of the executive body. The agents were abolished and replaced by small councils, who administered the various departments of state. Considerable administrative powers were given to the local governments, and the boundaries of the eight departments, Holland, Zeeland, Utrecht, Overijssel, in which Drenthe was included, Helderland, Groningen, Friesland, and Brabant were made to coincide largely with those of the old provinces. The aim of the new constitution was efficiency, the reconciliation of the moderate elements, both of the Federalist and Unitarian parties, and the restraint alike of revolutionary and Orangist intrigues. It began its course in fortunate circumstances. The long-wished-for peace was concluded at Amiens on March 27, 1802. It was signed by Skimmelpenick as the representative of the Batavian Republic, but he had not been allowed to have any influence upon the decisions. Great Britain restored all the captured colonies except Ceylon, and the House of Orange was indemnified by the grant of the secularized bishopric of Fulda, the abbeys of Corvey and Weingarten, together with the towns of Dortmund, Isny, and Buckhorn. The hereditary prince, as his father refused to reside in this new domain, undertook the duties of government. William V preferred to live on his Nassau estates. He died at Brunswick in 1806. The peace was joyfully welcomed in Holland, for it removed the British blockade and gave a promise of the revival of trade. But all the hopes of better times were blighted with the fresh outbreak of war in 1803. All the colonial possessions were again lost, and a new treaty of alliance, which the state government was compelled to conclude with France, led to heavy demands. The Republic was required to provide for the quartering and support of 18,000 French troops and 16,000 Batavians under a French general. Further, a fleet of ten ships of war was to be maintained, and 350 flat-bottomed transports built for the conveyance of an invading army to England. These demands were perforce complied with. Nevertheless, Napoleon was far from satisfied with the state government, which he regarded as inefficient and secretly hostile. In Holland itself it was hated because of the heavy charges it was obliged to oppose. Bonaparte accordingly determined to replace it and to concentrate the executive power in a single person. The legislative body was to remain, but the head of the state was to bear the title of council pensionary, and was to be elected for a period of five years. Skimmelpenick was designated for this post. Referred to a popular vote, the new constitution was approved by 14,230 against 136. About 340,000 abstained from voting. On April 29, 1805, Skimmel Pennink entered into office as council pensionary. He was invested with monarchical authority. The executive power, finance, the army and navy, the naming of ambassadors, the proposing of legislation were placed in his hands. He was assisted by a council of state, nominated by himself of five members, and by six secretaries of state. The legislative body was reduced to 19 members, appointed by the departmental governments. They met twice in the year and could accept or reject the proposals of the council pensionary, but not amend them. Skimmelpinnock was honest and able, and during the brief period of his administration did admirable work. With the aid of the accomplished financier Gogel, who had already done much good service to his country in difficult circumstances, 
He, by spreading the burdens of taxation equally over all parts of the land, and by removing restrictive customs and duties, succeeded in reducing largely the deficits in the annual balance sheet. He was also the first to undertake seriously the improvement of primary education. But it was not Napoleon's intention to allow the council pensionary to go on with the good work he had begun. The weakening of Skimmelpinnock's eyesight through cataract gave the emperor the excuse for putting an end to what he regarded as a provisional system of government, and for converting Holland into a dependent kingdom under the rule of his brother Louis. Admiral Verhel, sent to Paris at Napoleon's request on a special mission, was bluntly informed that Holland must choose between the acceptance of Louis as their king or annexation. On Verhel's return with the report of the emperor's ultimatum, the council pensionary summoned the council of state, the secretaries and the legislative body to meet together as an extraordinary committee and deliberate on what were best to be done. It was resolved to send a deputation to Paris to try to obtain from Napoleon the relinquishment, or at least a modification, of his demand. Their efforts were in vain. Napoleon's attitude was peremptory. The Hague Committee must within a week petition that Louis Bonaparte might be their king, or he would take the matter into his own hands. The committee, despite the opposition of Skimmelpenick, finding resistance hopeless, determined to yield. The deputation at Paris was instructed accordingly to cooperate with the emperor in the framing of a new monarchical constitution. It was drawn up and signed on May 23rd, and a few days later it was accepted by the Hague Committee. Skimmelpenick, however, refused to sign it and resigned his office on June 4th, explaining in a dignified letter his reasons for doing so. Verhel, at the head of a deputation, June 5th, now went through the farce of begging the emperor in the name of the Dutch people to allow his brother Louis to be their king. Louis accepted the proffered sovereignty, since the people desires and your majesty commands it. On June 15th the new king left Paris, and a week later arrived at the Hague, accompanied by his wife, Hortense de Beauharnais, Napoleon's stepdaughter. End of chapter 27This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Corrie Samuel. History of Holland by George Edmondson. Chapter 28. The Kingdom of Holland and the French Annexation, 1806-1814. to 1814. Louis Bonaparte was but twenty-eight years old and of a kindly, gentle character, very unlike his self-willed, domineering brother. He was weakly, and his ill health made him at times restless and moody. He had given great satisfaction by his declaration that, as soon as he set foot on the soil of his kingdom, he became a Hollander. And he was well received. The constitution of the new kingdom differed little from that it superseded. The secretaries of state became ministers, and the number of members of the legislative body was raised to thirty-nine. The king had power to conclude treaties with foreign states, without consulting the legislative body. The partition of the country was somewhat changed, Holland being divided into two departments, Amsterland and Maasland. Drenthe became a separate department, and in 1807, East Friesland with Java was made into an eleventh department, as compensation for Flushing, which was annexed to France. Louis came to The Hague with the best intentions of doing his utmost to promote the welfare of his kingdom, but from the first he was thwarted by the deplorable condition of the national finances. Out of a total income of fifty million florins, the interest on the national debt absorbed thirty-five millions. The balance was not nearly sufficient to defray the costs of administration, much less to meet the heavy demands of Napoleon for contributions to war expenditure. All the efforts of the finance minister, Gogel, to reduce the charges and increase the income were of small avail. The king was naturally lavish, and he spent considerable sums in the maintenance of a brilliant court, and in adding to the number of royal residences. Dissatisfied with the Hague, 
he moved first to Utrecht, then to Amsterdam, where the Stadhuis was converted into a palace, and he bought the pavilion at Haarlem as a summer abode. All this meant great expenditure. Louis was vain, and was only prevented from creating marshals of his army and orders of chivalry by Napoleon's stern refusal to permit it. He had to be reminded that by the Bonaparte family law he was but a vassal king, owing allegiance to the emperor. Despite these weaknesses, Louis did much for the land of his adoption. The old Rhine at Leyden, which lost itself in the dunes, was connected by a canal with Catwick on the sea, where a harbour was created. The dikes and waterways were repaired and improved, and high roads constructed from the Hague to Leyden, and from Utrecht to Hetlu. Dutch literature found in Louis a generous patron. He took pains to learn the language from the instruction of Bilderdijk, the foremost writer of his day. The foundation in 1808 of the Royal Netherland Institute for Science, Letters and the Fine Arts was a signal mark of his desire to raise the standard of culture in Holland on a national basis. The introduction of the Code Napoleon, with some necessary modifications, replaced a confused medley of local laws and customs, varying from province to province, by a general, unified legal system. As a statesman and administrator, Louis had no marked ability, but the ministers to whom he entrusted the conduct of affairs, Verhuel, Minister of Marine, Roel, of Foreign Affairs, Kragenhoff, of War, Van Manen, of Justice, and more especially the experienced Gogel, in control of the embarrassed finances, were capable men. The state of the finances indeed was the despair of the Dutch government. The imperious demands of Napoleon for the maintenance of an army of forty thousand men, to be employed by him on foreign campaigns, and also of a considerable navy, made all attempts at economy and reorganization of the finances almost hopeless. By the war with England, the Dutch had lost their colonies and most of their great seaborne trade, and the situation was rendered more difficult by the decree of Berlin in 1806, and the establishment of the continental system by the Emperor as a reply to the British blockade. All trade, and even correspondence with England, were forbidden. He hoped thus to bring England to her knees, but, though the decree did not achieve this object, it did succeed in bringing utter ruin upon the Dutch commercial classes. In vain Louis protested. He was not heard, and only met with angry rebukes from his brother for not taking more vigorous steps to stop smuggling, which the character of the Dutch coast rendered a comparatively easy, and at the same time, lucrative pursuit. The overthrow of Austria and Prussia by Napoleon in 1805 and 1806, followed in 1807 by the Peace of Tilsit with Russia, made the Emperor once more turn his attention to the project of an invasion of his hated enemy, England. A great French fleet was to be concentrated on the Scheldt, with Antwerp and Flushing for its bases. For this purpose, large sums of money were expended in converting Antwerp into a formidable naval arsenal. But the British government were well aware of the pistol that was being aimed at England's breast, and in 1809 a powerful expedition under the command of Lord Chatham was dispatched, consisting of more than a hundred warships and transports, with the object of destroying these growing dockyards and arsenals, and with them the threat of invasion. The attack was planned at a favourable moment, for the defensive force was very small, the bulk of the Dutch army having been sent to fight in the Austrian and Spanish campaigns, and the French garrisons greatly reduced. Chatham landed on the island of Walcheren, captured Middleburg and Veer, and on August 15th compelled Flushing to surrender, after such a furious bombardment that scarcely any houses remained standing. The islands of Schuen, Dweveland, and Zweed Beveland were overrun, and had the British general pushed on without delay, Antwerp might have fallen. But this he failed to do, and meanwhile Louis had collected, for the defence of the town, a force of twenty thousand men, which, to his deep chagrin, Napoleon did not allow him to command. No attack, however, was made on Antwerp by the British, 
who had suffered severely from the fevers of Walcheren, and on the news of Wagram and the Treaty of Schönbrunn, they slowly evacuated their conquests. Before the end of the year, the whole force had returned to England. This invasion, though successfully repelled, only accentuated the dissensions between the two brothers. French troops remained in occupation of Zealand, and the French army of the north at Antwerp, now placed under the command of Marshal Oudinot, lay ready to enforce the demands of the emperor should the Dutch government prove recalcitrant. Those demands included the absolute suppression of smuggling, the strictest enforcement of the decrees against trading with England, conscription, and a repudiation of a portion of the state debt. Napoleon overwhelmed his brother with bitter jibes and angry threats, declaring that he wished to make Holland an English colony, and that the whole land, even his own palace, was full of smuggled goods. At last, though unwillingly, Louis consented to go in person to Paris and try to bring about an amicable settlement of the questions at issue. He arrived on December 26th, intending to return at the new year, meanwhile leaving the Council of Ministers in charge of the affairs of the kingdom. He soon found not only that his mission was in vain, but that he was regarded virtually as a prisoner. For three months he remained in Paris under police surveillance, and his interviews with his brother were of the most stormy description. The Dutch Council, alarmed by the constant threat of French invasion, at first thought of putting Amsterdam into a state of defence, but finally abandoned the idea as hopeless. The king did his utmost to appease Napoleon by the offer of concessions, but his efforts were scornfully rejected, and at last he was compelled, March 16th, 1810, to sign a treaty embodying the terms dictated by the emperor. I must, he said, at any price get out of this den of murderers. By this treaty, Brabant and Zealand and the land between the Mars and the Waal, with Nimwegen, was ceded to France. All commerce with England was forbidden. French custom-house officers were placed at the mouths of the rivers and at every port. Further, the Dutch were required to deliver up fifteen men of war and one hundred gunboats. Louis was compelled to remain at Paris for the marriage of Napoleon with Marie-Louise, but was then allowed to depart. Discouraged and humiliated, he found himself with the title of king, practically reduced to the position of administrative governor of some French departments. Oudinot's troops were in occupation of the Hague, Utrecht and Leiden. And when the emperor and his bride paid a state visit to Antwerp, Louis had to do him homage. The relations between the two brothers had for some time been strained, Napoleon having taken the part of his stepdaughter Hortense, who preferred the gaiety of Paris to the dull court of her husband, reproached the injured man for not treating better the best of wives. Matters were now to reach their climax. The coachman of the French ambassador, Rochefoucault, having met with maltreatment in the streets of Amsterdam, the emperor angrily ordered Rochefoucault to quit the Dutch capital, May 29th, leaving only a charge d'affaires, and at the same time dismissed Verhuy, the Dutch envoy, from Paris. This was practically a declaration of war. The Council of Ministers, on being consulted, determined that it was useless to attempt the defence of Amsterdam, and when the King learned, towards the end of June, that Oudinot had orders to occupy the city, he resolved to forestall this final humiliation by abdication. On July 1st, 1810, he signed the deed by which he laid down his crown, in favour of his elder son, Napoleon Louis, under the guardianship of Queen Hortense. He then left the country, and retired into Bohemia. To this disposition of the kingdom, Napoleon, who had already made up his mind, paid not the slightest heed. On July the ninth, an imperial decree incorporated Holland in the French Empire. Holland, said the Empire, being formed by the deposits of three French rivers, the Rhine, the Meuse and the Scheldt, was by nature a part of France. Not till January the 1st, 1811, was the complete incorporation to take place. Meanwhile, Lebrun, Duke of Piacenza, a man of 72 years of age, was sent to Amsterdam to be Governor-General during the period of transition. 
it was a wise appointment, as Lebrun was a man of kindly disposition, ready to listen to grievances, and with an earnest desire to carry out the transformation of the government in a conciliatory spirit. With him was associated, as intendant of home affairs, Baron d'Alphonse, like himself of moderate views, and a council of ministers. A deputation of twenty-two persons from the Legislative Assembly was summoned to Paris for consultation with the imperial government. To Amsterdam was given the position of the third city in the empire, Paris being the first, and Rome the second. The country was divided into nine departments, Bouche de Caux, Bouche de la Meuse, Bouche du Rhin, Zuidesie, Isel Supérieur, Bouche d'Isel, Frise, Ems Occidental, and Ems Oriental. Over the departments, as in France, were placed préfets, and under them sous-préfets and mayors. All the préfets now appointed were native Dutchmen, with the exception of two, de Sel at Amsterdam and de Standart at The Hague. Both were Belgians, and both rendered themselves unpopular by their efforts to gain Napoleon's favour by a stringent enforcement of his orders. The Dutch representation in the Legislative Assembly at Paris was fixed at twenty-five members, in the Senate at six members. When these took their seats, the Council of Affairs at Amsterdam was dissolved, and at the same time the Code Napoleon, unmodified, became the law of the land. Napoleon's demands upon Holland had always been met with the reply that the land's finances were unequal to the strain. The debt amounted to forty million florins, and despite heavy taxation, there was a large annual deficit in the budget. The emperor at once took action to remedy this state of things by a decree reducing the interest on the debt to one third. This was a heavy blow to those persons whose limited incomes were mainly or entirely derived from investments in the state funds, including many widows, and also hospitals, orphanages, and other charitable institutions. At the same time, this step should not be regarded as a mere arbitrary and dishonest repudiation of debt. The state was practically bankrupt. For some years, only a portion of the interest, or nothing at all, had been paid, and the reduction in 1810 was intended to be but a temporary measure. The capital amount was left untouched, and the arrears of 1808 and 1809 were paid up at the new rate. That financial opinion was favourably impressed by this drastic action was shown by a considerable rise in the quotation of the stock on the bourse. A far more unpopular measure was the introduction of military and naval conscription in 1811. There never had been any but voluntary service in Holland. Indeed, during the whole period of the Republic, though the fleet was wholly manned by Dutch seamen, the army always included a large proportion of foreign mercenaries. By the law of 1811, all youths of twenty were liable to serve for five years, either on land or sea, and the contingent required was filled by the drawing of lots. Deep and strong resentment was felt throughout the country, the more so that the law was made retrospective to all who had reached the age of twenty in the three preceding years. The battalions thus raised were treated as French troops, and were sent to take part in distant campaigns. In Spain and in Russia, of the fifteen thousand men who marched with Napoleon into Russia in eighteen twelve, only a few hundreds returned. The strict enforcement of the continental system entailed great hardships upon the population. To such an extent was the embargo carried that all English manufactured goods found in Holland were condemned to be burnt, and the value of what was actually consumed amounted to millions of florins. A whole army of custom house officers watched the coast, and every fishing smack that put to sea had one on board. At the same time, not till eighteen twelve was the customs barrier with France removed. In consequence of this, prices rose enormously, industries were ruined, houses were given up and remained unoccupied, and thousands upon thousands were reduced to abject poverty. Such was the state of the treasury that in eighteen twelve. The reformed preachers received no stipends, and officials of all kinds had to be content with reduced salaries. Nor were these the only causes of discontent. The police regulations and the censorship of the press 
were of the severest description, and the land swarmed with spies. No newspaper was permitted to publish any article upon matters of state or any political news, except such as was sanctioned by the government, and with a French translation of the Dutch original. This applied even to advertisements. All books had to be submitted for the censor's imprimatur. Every household was subject to the regular visitation of the police, who made the most minute inquisition into the character, the opinions, the occupations, and means of subsistence of every member of the household. Nevertheless, the French domination, however oppressive, had good results. In that, for the first time in their history, the Dutch provinces acquired a real unity. All the old particularism disappeared with the burgher aristocracies, and the party feuds of Orangists and patriots. A true sense of nationality was developed. All classes of the population enjoyed the same political rights and equality before the law. Napoleon himself was not unpopular. In the autumn of eighteen eleven, he, accompanied by Marie Louise, made a state progress through this latest addition to his empire. Almost every important place was visited, and in all parts of the country he was received with outward demonstrations of enthusiasm and almost servile obsequiency. It is perhaps not surprising, as the great emperor was now at the very topmost height of his dazzling fortunes. But for Holland, Napoleon's triumphs had their dark side, for his chief and most determined enemy, England, was mistress of the seas. And the last and the richest of the Dutch colonies, Java, surrendered to the English almost on the very day that the imperial progress began. Hearing of the activity of the British squadron in the eastern seas, King Louis had, shortly after his acceptance of the crown, taken steps for the defence of Java by appointing Dindels, a man of proved vigour and initiative, governor general. The difficulties of reaching Java in face of British vigilance. Were, however, well nigh insurmountable, and it was not until a year after his nomination to the governorship that Dandels reached Batavia, on January the first, eighteen o eight. His measures for the defence of the island, including the construction of important highways, were most energetic, but so oppressive and high-handed as to arouse hostility and alienate the native chiefs. Napoleon, informed of Dandels' harsh rule. Sent out Janssens with a body of troops to replace him. The new governor general landed on April twenty seventh, eighteen eleven, but he could make no effective resistance to a powerful British expedition under General Achmuti, which took possession of Batavia on August the fourth, and after some severe fighting, compelled September seventeenth the whole of the Dutch forces to capitulate. The year of Napoleon's invasion of Russia, eighteen twelve. Was a year of passive endurance. The safety of the remnant of the Grand Army was secured, November twenty-eighth, by the courage and staunchness of the Dutch pontoon engineers, who, standing in the ice-cold water of the Beresina, completed the bridge over which, after a desperate battle, the French troops effected their escape. The Moscow catastrophe was followed in eighteen thirteen by a general uprising of the oppressed peoples of Europe. Against the Napoleonic tyranny, in this uprising, the Dutch people, although hopes of freedom were beginning to dawn upon them, did not for some time venture to take any part. The Prince of Orange, however, had been in London since April, trying to secure a promise of assistance from the British government in case of a rising, and he was working in collaboration with a number of patriotic men in Holland, who saw in an Orange restoration the best hopes for their country's independence. The news of Leipzig, October fourteenth to sixteenth, roused them to action. Foremost among these leaders was Giesbert Karel von Hergendorp. He had been one of the Orangist leaders at the time of the Restoration of seventeen eighty seven, and had filled the post of pensionary of Rotterdam. After the French conquest, he had withdrawn from public life. With him were associated Count van Limburg Stirum. And Baron van der Duin van Maasdam, like himself, residents at the Hague. Van Hogendorp could also count on a number of active helpers outside the Hague, prominent among whom were Falk, captain of the National Guard at Amsterdam, and Kemper, a professor at Leiden. 
plans were made for restoring the independence of the country under the rule of the Prince of Orange. But, in order to escape the vigilance of the French police, great care was taken to maintain secrecy, and nothing was committed to writing. The rapid march of Allied troops, Russians and Prussians, towards the Dutch frontiers, after Leipzig, necessitated rapid action. Van Hergendorp and his friends wished that Holland should free herself by her own exertions, for they were aware that reconquest by the Allied forces might imperil their claims to independence. Their opportunity came when General Melleton, by order of the Governor-General Le Brun, withdrew on November the 14th from Amsterdam to Utrecht. One of the Orangist Confederates, a sea captain, named Job May, on the following day stirred up a popular rising in the city, and some custom houses were burnt. Le Brun on this retreated to Utrecht, and on the 16th, after transferring the government of the country to Melleton, returned to France. Falk, at the head of the National Guard, had meanwhile re-established order at Amsterdam, and placed the town in charge of a provisional government. No sooner did this news reach The Hague than Van Hergendorp and Van limburg Stirum determined upon instant action, November 17th. With a proclamation drawn up by Van Hergendorp, and at the head of a body of the National Guard wearing orange colours, Van Lienberg Stieren marched through the streets to the town hall, where he read the proclamation declaring the Prince of Orange eminent head of the state. No opposition being offered, after discussion with their chief supporters, the triumvirate, Van Hergendorp, Van Lienberg Stieren, and Van der Duin van Maasdam, took upon themselves provisionally the government of the country until the arrival of the prince. Emissaries were at once sent to Amsterdam to announce what had taken place at The Hague. At first the Amsterdamers showed some hesitation, and it was not until the arrival of a body of Cossacks at their gates, November 24th, that the city openly threw in its lot with the Orangist movement, which now rapidly spread throughout the country. Without delay the provisional government dispatched two envoys, Fagel, and de Perponcha, to London, to inform the Prince of Orange of what had occurred, and to invite him to Holland. William had been in England since April, and had met with a favourable reception. In an interview with the British Foreign Secretary, Lord Castlereagh, support had been promised him, April 27, 1813, on the following conditions. 1. The frontiers of Holland should be extended either by a new sort of barrier, more effective than the old one, or by the union of some portions of territory adjacent to the ancient republic. 2. Holland must wait until such time as Great Britain should deem convenient, in her own interests, for the restoration of the Dutch colonies, which she had conquered during the war. 3. A system of government must be set up, which would reconcile the wishes of Holland with those of the powers called to exercise so powerful an influence upon her future. William had gone to London, knowing that he could rely on the active assistance of his brother-in-law, Frederick William of Prussia, and of the Emperor Alexander I, and that the goodwill of England was assured by the projected marriage of his son, now serving under Wellington in Spain, with the Princess Charlotte, heiress presumptive to the British throne. He now therefore without hesitation accepted the invitation, and landed at Scheveningen, November 30th. He was received with unspeakable enthusiasm. At first there was some doubt as to what title William should bear, and as to what should be the form of the new government. Van Hogendorp had drawn up a draft of a constitution on the old lines with a hereditary stadholder, a council pensionary, and a privileged aristocracy but with large and necessary amendments, and the prince was himself inclined to a restoration of the stadtholdership with enlarged powers. To the arguments of Kemper is the credit due of having persuaded him that a return to the old system, however amended, had now become quite impossible. The prince visited Amsterdam, December 2nd, and was there proclaimed by the title and quality of William I, Sovereign Prince of the Netherlands. He refused the title of king, but the position he thus accepted with general approval was that of a constitutional monarch, and the promise was given 
that as soon as possible a commission should be appointed to draw up a fundamental law, Grondwit, for the Dutch state. End of chapter 28「Sovereign Prince of the Netherlands at Amsterdam on December 2nd, 1813, the principal towns were still occupied by French garrisons, but with the help of the Allied forces, Russians and Prussians, these were, in the opening months of 1814, one by one conquered. The Helder garrison, under the command of Admiral Verheul, did not surrender till May. By the end of that month, the whole land was freed." The first step taken by the Sovereign Prince, December 21st, was to appoint a commission to draw up a fundamental law according to his promise. The commission consisted of fifteen members, with Van Hogendorp as president. Their labours were concluded early in March. The concept was, on March 29th, submitted to an assembly of six hundred notables, summoned for the purpose, the voting to be for or against, without discussion. The gathering took place in the Nieuwe Kerk at Amsterdam. Of the 474 who were present, 448 voted in favour of the new constitution. On the following day, the Prince of Orange took the oath in the Nieuwe Kerk and was solemnly inaugurated as the Sovereign Prince of the Netherlands. The principal provisions of the fundamental law of March 1814 were as follows. The Sovereign shares the legislative power with the States-General, but alone exercises the executive power. All the Sovereign prerogatives formerly possessed by the provinces, districts, or towns are now transferred to the Sovereign. He is assisted by a Council of State of twelve members, appoints and dismisses ministers, declares war and makes peace, has the control of finance, and governs the overseas possessions. The States General consists of fifty five members elected by the nine provinces Holland, Zeeland, Utrecht, Over Isel, Gelderland, Groningen, Friesland, Brabant, and Drenthe, on the basis of population. The members are elected for three years, but one third vacate their seats every year. They have the right of legislative initiative and a veto. The finances are divided into ordinary and extraordinary expenditure. Over the former, the States General exercise no control. But a General Chamber of Accounts, al Khamein Rekenkamer, has the supervision over ways and means. The Sovereign must be a member of the Reformed Church, but equal protection is given by the State to all religious beliefs. It was essentially an aristocratic constitution, at least one quarter of the states general must belong to the nobility. The provincial estates has the control of local affairs only, but had the privilege of electing members to the states general. They were themselves far from being representative. For the country districts, the members were chosen from the nobility and the landowners in the towns by colleges of electors, keysers consisting of those who paid the highest contributions in taxes. Except for the strengthening of the central executive power and the abolition of all provincial sovereign rights, the new constitution differed little from the old in its oligarchic character. It was, however, to be but a temporary arrangement. It has already been pointed out that, months before his actual return to Holland, the Prince had received assurances from the British government that a strong Netherlands state should be created, capable of being a barrier to French aggression. The time had now arrived for the practical carrying out of this assurance. Accordingly, Lord Castlereagh, in January 1814, went on his way, as British plenipotentiary, to confer with the Allied sovereigns at Basel, visited the sovereign prince at The Hague. The conversations 
issued in a proposal to unite, with the assent of Austria, the Belgic provinces as far as the Meuse to Holland, together with the territory between the Meuse and the Rhine, as far as the line Maastricht, Duren, Cologne. Castlereagh submitted this project to the Allies at Basel, and it was discussed and adopted in principle at the Conference of Châtillon, February 3rd to March 15th. The Austrian Emperor, having renounced all claim to his Belgian dominions in favor of an equivalent in Venetia, this was done without any attempt to ascertain the wishes of the Belgian people on the proposed transference of their allegiance, and a protest was made. An assembly of notables, which had been summoned to Brussels by the military governor, the Duke Saxe Weimar, sent a deputation to the Allied headquarters at Chaumont. To express their continued loyalty to their Habsburg sovereign, and to ask that, if the Emperor Francis relinquished his claim, they might be erected into an independent state under the rule of an Austrian Archduke. A written reply, March 14th, informed them that the question of union with Holland was settled, but assurances were given that, in matter of religion, representation, commerce, and the public debt, their interest would be carefully guarded. Meanwhile, General Baron Vincent, a Belgian in the Austrian service, was made Governor General. The idea, however, of giving Holland a slice of Cisrenian territory had perforce to be abandoned in the face of Prussian objections. The preliminary treaty of peace signed at Paris on May thirtieth, eighteen fourteen, was purposely vague. Article six merely declaring that Holland, placed under the sovereignty of the House of Orange, shall receive an increase of territory, un accroissement de territoire, but a secret article defined this increase as the countries comprised between the sea, the frontiers of France, as defined by the present treaty, and the Meuse, shall be united in perpetuity to Holland. The frontiers on the right bank of the Meuse shall be regulated in accordance with the military requirements of Holland and her neighbors. In other words, the whole of Belgium, as far as the Meuse, was to be annexed to Holland. Beyond the Meuse, the military requirements of Prussia were to be consulted. Previously to this, Castlereagh had written to the British minister at the Hague, Lord Clancerity, suggesting that the sovereign prince should summon a meeting of an equal number of Dutch and Belgian notables to draw up a project of union to be presented to the Allied sovereigns at Paris for their approbation. But William had already himself, with the assistance of his minister Van Nagel, drawn up in eight articles the fundamental conditions for the constitution of the new state. And after revision by Falk and Lord Clancerity, he in person took them to Paris. They were laid by Clancerity before the plenipotentiaries and were adopted by the Allied sovereigns assembled in London on June twenty-first, eighteen fourteen. The principles which animated them were set forth in a protocol, which breathed throughout a spirit of fairness and conciliation, but all was marred by the final clause: "Elle met ses principes en exécution en vertu de la loi de conquête de la Belgique." To unite Belgium to Holland as a conquered dependency could not fail to arouse bad feelings. And thus to proclaim it openly was a very grave mistake. It was not thus that the perfect amalgamation of the two countries at which, according to the protocol, the great powers aimed, was likely to be effected. At the same time, as a standing proof of William's own excellent intentions, the text of the eight articles is given in full. Number one: the union shall be intimate and complete, so that the two countries shall form but one state. To be governed by the fundamental law already established in Holland, which, by mutual consent, shall be modified according to the circumstances. Number two, there shall be no change in those articles of the fundamental law which secure to all religious cults equal protection and privileges, and guarantee the admissibility of all citizens, whatever be their religious creed, to public offices and dignities. Number three. The Belgian provinces shall be in a fitting manner represented in the States General, whose sittings in time of peace shall be held by turns in a Dutch and a Belgian town. Number four, 
all the inhabitants of the Netherlands thus having equal constitutional rights, they shall have equal claim to all commercial and other rights, of which their circumstances allow, without any hindrance or obstruction being imposed on any to the profit of others. Number 5. Immediately after the Union... The provinces and towns of Belgium shall be admitted to the commerce and navigation of the colonies of Holland upon the same footing as the Dutch provinces and towns. Number 6. The debts contracted on the one side by the Dutch and on the other side by the Belgian provinces shall be charged to the public chest of the Netherlands. Number 7. The expenses required for the building and maintenance of the frontier fortresses of the new state shall be borne by the public chest as serving the security and independence of the whole nation. Number 8. The cost of the making and upkeep of the dikes shall be at the charge of the districts more directly interested, except in the case of an extraordinary disaster. It is not too much to say that, if the provisions of these articles had been carried out fully and generously, there might have been at the present moment a strong and united Netherlands state. On July 21st, the articles, as approved by the powers, were returned to the sovereign prince, who officially accepted them, and on August 1st took over at Brussels the government of the Belgic provinces, while awaiting the decisions of the Congress, which was shortly to meet at Vienna as to the boundaries on political status of the territories over which he ruled. The work of the Congress, however, which met in October, was much delayed by differences between the powers. Prussia wished to annex the entire kingdom of Saxony, and when it was found that such a claim, if persisted in, would be opposed by Great Britain, Austria, and France, compensation was sought in the Rhenish provinces. Thus the ideas of strengthening the new Netherland buffer state by an addition of territory in the direction of the Rhine had to be abandoned. It must be remembered that the sovereign prince on his part was not likely to raise any objection to having an enlarged and strengthened Prussia as his immediate neighbour on the east. William was both brother-in-law and first cousin to the king of Prussia and had spent much of his exile in Berlin and he no doubt regarded the presence of this strong military power on his frontier as the surest guarantee against French aggression. His relations with Prussia were indeed of the friendliest character, as is shown by the fact that secret negotiations were at this very time taking place for the cession to Prussia of his hereditary Nassau principalities of Dillenburg, Siegen, Dates, and Hadamar, in exchange for the Duchy of Luxembourg. The proceedings of the inharmonious Congress of Vienna were, however, rudely interrupted by the sudden return of Napoleon from Elba. Weary of waiting for a formal recognition of his position, William now, March 15, 1815, issued a proclamation in which he assumed the title of King of the Netherlands and Duke of Luxembourg. No protest was made, and the fait accompli was duly accepted by the powers, May 23rd. The first act of the king was to call upon all his subjects, Dutch and Belgians alike, to unite in opposing the common foe. This call to arms led to a considerable force under the command of the hereditary prince being able to join the small British army which Wellington had hurriedly collected for the defence of Brussels. The sudden invasion of Belgium by Napoleon, June 14th, took his adversaries by surprise for the Anglo-Netherland forces were distributed in different cantonments and were separated from the Prussian army under Blücher, which had entered Belgium from the east. Napoleon in person attacked and defeated Blücher at Ligny on June 16th, and on the same day a French force under Ney was, after a desperate encounter, held in check by the British and Dutch regiments, which had been pushed forward to Quatre Bras, Blücher retreated to Wavre and Wellington to Waterloo on the following day. The issue of the Battle of Waterloo, which took place on June 18th, is well known. The Belgian contingent did not play a distinguished part at Waterloo, but it would be unfair to place to their discredit any lack of steadiness that was shown. 
These Belgian troops were all old soldiers of Napoleon, to whom they were attached, and in whose invincibility they believed. The Prince of Orange distinguished himself by great courage, both at Quatre Bras and Waterloo. William, after his assumption of the regal title, at once proceeded to regularize his position by carrying out that necessary modification of the Dutch fundamental law to which he was pledged by the eight articles. He accordingly summoned a commission of twenty-four members, half Dutch and half Belgian, Catholics and Protestants being equally represented, which on April 22nd met under the presidency of Van Hogendorp. Their activity was sharpened by the threat of French invasion, and in three months, July 18th, their difficult task was accomplished. The new fundamental law made no change in the autocratic powers conferred on the king. The executive authority remained wholly in his hands. The states-general were now to consist of two chambers, but the first chamber was a nominated chamber. It contained forty to sixty members appointed by the king for life. The second chamber of a hundred and ten members, equally divided between the north and south, that is, Fifty-five Dutch and fifty-five Belgian representatives was elected under a very restricted franchise by the seventeen provinces into which the whole kingdom was divided. The ordinary budget was voted for ten years, and it was only extraordinary expenses which had to be considered annually. The other provisions strictly followed the principles and the liberties guaranteed in advance by the eight articles. The new fundamental law was presented to the Dutch States-General on August 8th, and was approved by a unanimous vote. Very different was its reception in Belgium. The king had summoned a meeting of 1,603 notables to Brussels. Of these, 1,323 were present. The majority were hostile. It had strongly been urged by the Belgian delegates on the commission that the Belgic provinces with three and a half millions of inhabitants, ought to return to the second chamber of the States-General a number of members proportionately greater than the Dutch provinces, which had barely two millions. The Dutch, on their part, argued that their country had been an independent state for two centuries, and possessed a large colonial empire, while Belgium had always been under foreign rule, and had now been added to Holland as an increase of territory. It was finally arranged, however, that the representation of the northern and southern portions of the new kingdom should be equal, fifty-five each. Belgian public opinion loudly protested, especially as the fifty-five Belgian deputies included four representatives of Luxembourg, which had been created a separate state under the personal rule of King William. Still more bitter and determined was the opposition of the powerful clerical party to the principle of religious equality. About 99% of the Belgian population was Catholic, and the bishops were very suspicious of what might be the effect of this principle in the hands of an autocratic Calvinistic king, supported by the predominant Protestant majority in Holland. A further grievance was that the heavy public debt incurred by Holland should be made a common burden. Considerable pressure was brought to bear upon the notables, but without avail. The fundamental law was rejected by 796 votes to 527. Confronted with this large hostile majority, the king took upon himself to reverse the decision by an arbitrary and dishonest manipulation of the return. He chose to assume that the 280 notables who had not voted were in favour of the law and added their votes to the minority. He then declared that 126 votes had been wrongly given in opposition to the principle of religious equality, which, by the second of the eight articles approved by the powers, was binding and fundamental to the Union, and he then not only deducted them from the majority, but added them also to the minority. He then announced that the fundamental law had been accepted by a majority of 263 votes. Such an act of chicanery was not calculated to make the relations between North and South work smoothly. Having thus, for reasons of state, summarily dealt with the decision of the Belgian notables, William, September 26, made his state entry into Brussels and took his oath to the Constitution. 
Already the Congress of Vienna had given the official sanction of the powers to the creation of the Kingdom of the Netherlands by a treaty signed at Paris on May 31, 1815. By this treaty, the whole of the former Austrian Netherlands, except the province of Luxembourg, together with the territory which before 1795 had been ruled by the Prince Bishops of Liège, the Duchy of Bouillon, and several small pieces of territory were added to Holland, and the new state thus created was placed under the sovereignty of the head of the House of Orange-Nassau. As stated above, however, it had been necessary in making these arrangements to conciliate Prussian claims for aggrandizement in the Cisrenian provinces. This led to a number of complicated transactions. William ceded to Prussia his ancient hereditary Nassau principalities, Dillenburg, Dates, Saigon, and Hadamar. The equivalent which William received was the sovereignty of Luxembourg, which for this purpose was severed from the Belgian Netherlands, of which it had been one of the provinces since the time of the Burgundian dukes, and was erected into a Grand Duchy. Further than this, the Grand Duchy was made one of the states of the Germanic Confederation, and the town of Luxembourg was declared to be a federal fortress, the garrison to consist of Prussian and Dutch detachments under a Prussian commandant. There was a double object in this transaction. One, to preserve the Grand Duke his right and privileges as a German prince. Two, to secure the defense of this important borderland against French attack. Another complication arose from the fact that in the 14th century the House of Nassau had been divided into two branches, Walram and Otto, the younger branch being that of which the Prince of Orange was the head, but by a family pact, agreed upon in 1735 and renewed in 1783, the territorial possessions of either line in default of male heirs had to pass to the next male agnate of the other branch, this pact, therefore, by virtue of the exchange that had taken place, applied to the new Grand Duchy. It is necessary here to explain what took place in some detail, for this arbitrary wrenching of Luxembourg from its historical position as an integral part of the Netherlands was to have serious and disconcerting consequences in the near future. The new kingdom of the Netherlands naturally included Luxembourg, so that William was a loser rather than a gainer by the cession of his Nassau possessions, but his close relation by descent and marriage with the Prussian royal house made him anxious to meet the wishes of a power on whose friendship he relied. All evidence also points to the conclusion that in accepting the personal sovereignty of the Grand Duchy he had no intention of treating Luxembourg otherwise than as part of his kingdom. The fundamental law was made to apply to Luxembourg, in the same way as to Brabant or Flanders, and of the fifty-five members allotted to the Belgic provinces, four were representative of the Grand Duchy, which was subject to the same legislation and taxes as the kingdom. At first the king had thought of nominating his second son, Frederick, as his successor in Luxembourg, but he changed his mind and gave him an indemnity elsewhere and he himself states the reason. Quote, Since we have judged it advisable, convenable, in the general interest of the kingdom to unite the Grand Duchy to it and to place it under the same constitutional laws. End quote. The boundaries of the new kingdom and of the Grand Duchy were fixed by the Treaty of May 31, 1815, and confirmed by the General Act of the Congress of Vienna. By this treaty, Prussia received a considerable part of the old province of Luxembourg, as well as slices of territory taken from the Bisphoric of League. A separate boundary treaty a year later, June 26, 1816, between the Netherlands and Prussia filled in the details of that 1815, and that Prussia herself acquiesced in the fusion of the kingdom and the Grand Duchy is shown by the fact that the boundary between Prussia and Luxembourg is three times referred to in the later treaty as the boundary between Prussia and the Kingdom of the Netherlands. End of chapter This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ezwa. History of Holland by George Edmondson. Chapter 30. The Kingdom of the Netherlands. Union of Holland and Belgium. 1815 to 1830. The autocratic powers that were conferred upon King William by the fundamental law rendered his personality a factor of the utmost importance in the difficult task which lay before him. William's character was strong and self-confident, and he did not shrink from responsibility. His intentions were of the best. He was capable, industrious, a good financier, sparing himself no trouble in mastering the details of state business. But he had the defects of his qualities, being self-opinionated, stubborn, and inclined, as in the matter of the vote of the Belgian notables, to override opposition with a high hand. He had, at the beginning of his reign, the good fortune of being on the best of terms with Carsery, the British foreign minister. To Carsery, more than to any other statesman, the Kingdom of the Netherlands owed its existence. The Peace of Paris saw Great Britain in possession by conquest of all the Dutch colonies. By the Convention of London, August the 13th, 1814, which was Carsery's work, it was arranged that all the captured colonies, including Java, the richest and most valuable of all, should be restored with the exception of the Cape of Good Hope and the Guiana colonies, Demerara, Burbice, and Essequibo. In the later, the plantations had almost all passed into British hands during the eighteen years since their conquest, and Cape Colony was retained as essential for the security of the sea route to India. But these surrenders were not made without ample compensation. Great Britain contributed two million pounds towards erecting fortresses along the French frontier, one million pounds to satisfy a claim of Sweden with regard to the island of Guadeloupe, and three million pounds, or one half of a debt from Holland to Russia, that is to say a sum of six million pounds in all. One of the most urgent problems with which the sovereign prince had to deal on his accession to power was the state of the finances. Napoleon, by a stroke of the pen, had reduced the public debt to one-third of its amount. William, however, was too honest a man to avail himself of the opportunity for partial repudiation that was offered him. He recalled into existence the two-thirds on which no interest had been paid, and called it deferred debt, uitgestelde schuld. The other third received the name of working debt, werkelijke schuld. The figure stood at 1,200 million florins, 600 million florins respectively. Every year, four millions of the working debt were to be paid off, and a similar amount from the deferred added to it. Other measures taken in 1814 for effecting economies were a little avail, as the campaign of Waterloo in the following year added 40 million florins to the debt. Heavier taxation had to be imposed, but even then the charges for the debt made it almost impossible to avoid an annual deficit in the budget. It was one of the chief grievances of the Belgians that they were called upon to share the burden of a crushing debt which they had not incurred. The voting of ways and means for ten years gave the king the control over all ordinary finance. It was only extraordinary expenditure that had to be submitted annually to the representatives of the people. The dislike of the Catholic hierarchy in Belgium to Dutch rule had been intensified by the manner in which the king had dealt with the vote of the notables. Their leader was Maurice de Broglie, Bishop of Ghent, a Frenchman by birth. His efforts by speech and by pen to stir up active enmity in Belgium to the Union aroused William's anger and he resolved to prosecute him. It was an act of courage, rather than of statesmanship, but the king could not brook opposition. Broglie refused to appear before the court and fled to France. In his absence, he was condemned to banishment and the payment of costs. The powerful clerical party regarded him as a martyr, 
and continued to criticize the policy of the Protestant king with watchful and hostile suspicion. Nor were the Belgian Liberal Party more friendly. They did not indeed support the clerical claim to practical predominance in the state, but they were patriotic Belgians who had no love for Holland and resented the thought that they were being treated as a dependency of their northern neighbors. They were at one with the clericals in claiming that the Belgian representation in the second chamber of the States General should be proportional to their population. But this grievance might have been tolerated had the king shown any inclination to treat his Belgian subjects on a footing of equality with the Dutch. He was, as will be seen, keenly interested in the welfare and progress of the South, but in spirit and his conduct of affairs he proved himself to be an out-and-out -out Hollander. The provision of the fundamental law that the seat of government and the meetings of the States-General should be alternately from year to year at The Hague and at Brussels was never carried out. All the ministries were permanently located at The Hague, and of the seven ministers who held office in 1816, only one, the Duke d'Urcel, was a Belgian, and he held the post of Minister of Public Works and Waterways. Fourteen years later, at the time of the revolt, six out of seven were still northerners. The military establishments were all in Holland, and nearly all the diplomatic and civil posts were given to Dutchmen. Nor was this merely due to the fact that, when the Union took place, Holland already possessed an organized government and a supply of experienced officials, while Belgium lacked both. On the contrary, the policy of the king remained fixed and unwavering. In 1830, out of 39 diplomatists, 30 were Dutch. All the chief military posts were filled by Dutchmen. Nor was it different in the civil service. In the home department, there were a hundred and seventeen Dutch, eleven Belgians. In the war department, a hundred and two Dutch, three Belgians. In finance, fifty-nine Dutch, five Belgians. Such a state of things was bound to cause resentment. Parties in the Belgic provinces were in the early days of the Union divided very much as they have been in recent years. The Catholic or clerical party had its stronghold in the two Flanders and Antwerp, that is to say in the Flemish-speaking districts. In Walloon, Belgium, the Liberals had a considerable majority. The opposition to the fundamental law came overwhelmingly from Flemish Belgium, the support from Liège, Namur, Luxembourg and other Walloon districts. But the sense of injustice brought both parties together, so that in the representative chamber the Belgian members were soon found voting solidly together as a permanent opposition, while the Dutch voted en bloc for the government. As the representation of North and South was equal, 55 members each, the results would have been a deadlock, but there were always two or three Belgians who held government offices, and these were compelled, on pain of instant dismissal, to vote for a government measure or at least to abstain. Thus, the king could always rely on a small but constant majority, and by its aid he did not hesitate to force through financial and legislative proposals in the teeth of Belgian opposition. It is only fair, however, to the arbitrary king to point out how earnestly he endeavored to promote the material and industrial welfare of the whole land, and to encourage to the best of his power literary scientific and educational progress. In Holland, the carrying trade, which had so long been the chief source of the country's wealth, had been utterly ruined by Napoleon's continental system. On the other hand, Belgian industries, which had been flourishing through the strict embargo placed upon the import of British goods, were now threatened with British competition. The steps taken by the energy and initiative of the king were, considering the state of the national finances, remarkable in the variety of their aims and the results that they achieved. The old Amsterdam bank was transformed into a bank of the Netherlands. A number of canals were planned and constructed. 
Chief among these was the North Holland Canal, connecting Amsterdam with the Helder. The approaches to Rotterdam were improved, so that this port became the meeting point of sea traffic from England and river traffic by the Rhine from Germany. But both these ports were quickly overshadowed by the rapid recovery of Antwerp, now that the Scheldt was free and open to commerce. Other important canals, begun and wholly or in part constructed during this period were the Zuid Willemswaard, the Zederik, the Appeldoorn, and the Voorne canals. Water communication was not so necessary in the south as in the north, but care was there also bestowed upon the canals, especially upon the canal of Terneuzen connecting Ghent with the western Scheldt, and many highways were constructed. To restore the prosperity of the Dutch carrying trade, especially that with their East Indies, in 1824 a company, the Nederlandse Handelmaatschappij, was founded, and at the same time a commercial treaty was concluded with Great Britain, by which both nations were to enjoy free trade with each other's East Indian possessions. The Handelmaatschappij had a capital of 37 million florins. To this the king contributed 4 millions and guaranteed to the shareholders for 20 years a dividend of 4.5%, the company at first worked at a loss, and in 1831 William had to pay four million florins out of his private purse to meet his guarantee. This was partly due to the setback of a revolt in Java, which lasted some years. Agriculture received equal attention. Marshy districts were impoldered or turned into pasture land. More especially did the Maatschappij van Weldadigheid, a society founded in 1818, by General van den Bosch, with the king's strong support, undertake the task of reclaiming land with the special aim of relieving poverty. No less zealous was the king for the prosperity of Belgian industries. Ghent with its cotton factories and sugar refineries, Tournai with its porcelain industry, and Liège with its hardware, all were the objects of royal interest. The great machine factory at Serain, near Liège, under the management of an Englishman, Cockrell, owed its existence to the king. Nor was William's care only directed to the material interests of his people. In 1815, the university at Utrecht was restored, and in Belgium, besides Louvain, two new foundations for higher education were in 1816 created at Ghent and Liège. Royal Academies of the Arts were placed at Amsterdam and Antwerp, which were to bear good fruit. His attention was also given to the much-needed improvement of primary education, which in the South was almost non-existent in large parts of the country. Here the presence of a number of illiterate dialects was a great obstacle and was the cause of the unfortunate effort to make literary Dutch into a national language for his whole realm. Nevertheless, the king's political mistakes, of which the attempted compulsory use of Dutch was one, rendered all his thoughtful watchfulness over his people's welfare unavailing. Great as were the autocratic powers conferred upon the sovereign, he overstepped them. Plans in which he was interested, he carried out without consulting the States General. His ministers he regarded as bound to execute his orders. If their views differed from his, they were dismissed. This was the fate even of Van Hogendorp, to whom he owed so much. Roel and Falk also had to make way for less competent, but more obsequious ministers. The chief difficulty with which the king had to contend throughout this period was the ceaseless and irreconcilable opposition of the Catholic hierarchy and clergy to the principle of absolute religious equality established by the Fundamental Law, Articles 190 to 193. Their leader, Maurice de Broglie, Bishop of Ghent, actually published a jugement doctrinal in which he declared that the taking of the oath to the Constitution was an act of treason to the Catholic Church. In this defiance to the government, he had the support of the Pope, who only permitted the Count de Méan to take the oath on his appointment to Archbishopric of Malines, on the understanding that he held Articles 190 to 193 to refer only to civil matters. From this time, to take the oath dans le sens de Monsieur Méan 
became with the ultra-clerical party a common practice. Other measures of the government aroused Catholic hostility. In this year, 1819, a decree forbade the holding of more than two religious processions in a year. In such a country as Belgium, this restriction was strongly resented, but the establishment in 1825 by the king of a Collegium Philosophicum at Louvain, at which all candidates for the priesthood were by royal decree required, after 1826, to have a two years course before proceeding to an episcopal seminary, met with strenuous resistance. The instruction was in ancient languages, history, ethics, and canon law, and the teachers were nominated by the king. The first effect of this decree was that young men began to seek education in foreign seminaries. Another royal decree at once forbade this, and all youths were ordered to proceed either to the collegium or to one of the high schools of the land. Unless they did so, access to the priesthood or to any public office was barred to them. This was perhaps the most serious of all the king's mistakes. He miscalculated both the strength and the sincerity of the opposition he thus deliberately courted. His decrees were doomed to failure. The bishops, on their part, refused to admit to their seminaries or to ordination anyone who attended the Collegium Philosophicum. The king, in the face of the irrevocable decision of the Belgian hierarchy, found himself in an untenable position. He could not compel the bishops to ordain candidates for holy orders, and his decrees were therefore a dead letter. Nor, on the other hand, could he trample upon the convictions of the vast majority of his Belgian subjects by making admission to the priesthood impossible. He had to give way and to send a special envoy, de Sel, to the Pope in 1827 to endeavor to negotiate a concordat. It was accomplished. By Article 3 of the Concordat, there were to be eight bishops in the Netherlands instead of five. They were to be chosen by the Pope, but the king was to have the right of objection, and they were required to take the oath of allegiance. The course at the Collegium Philosophicum was made optional. William thus yielded on practically all the points at issue, but prided himself on having obtained the right of rejecting a papal nominee. The Pope, however, in an allocution, made no mention of this right, and declared that the decree about the Collegium was annulled and that in matters of education the bishops would act in accordance with instructions from Rome. The government immediately issued a confidential notice to the governors of provinces that the carrying out of the concordat was indefinitely postponed. Thus the effort at conciliation ended in the humiliation of the king and the triumph of the astute diplomacy of the Vatican. The financial situation, as we have seen, was from the outset full of difficulty. The king was personally parsimonious, but his many projects for the general welfare of the land involved large outlay, and the consequence was an annual average deficit of seven million florins. At first, the revenue was raised by the increase of customs and excise, including colonial imports. This caused much dissatisfaction in Holland, especially when duties were placed on coffee and sugar. The complaint was that, thus, an undue share of taxation fell on the maritime north. In order to lighten these duties on colonial wares, other taxes had to be imposed. In 1821, accordingly, it was proposed to meet the deficit by two most unwise and obnoxious taxes, known as mouture and abattage. The first was on ground corn, the second, on the carcasses of beasts, exacted at the mill or the slaughterhouse, in other words, on bread and on butcher's meat. Both were intensely unpopular, and the mouture in particular fell with especial severity on the Belgian working classes and peasantry, who consumed much more bread per head than the Dutch. Nevertheless, by ministerial pressure, the bill was passed, on July the 21st, 1821, by a narrow majority of four, fifty-five to fifty-one. All the minority were Belgians. Only two Belgians voted with the majority. 
it is inconceivable how the government could have been so impolitic as to impose these taxes in face of such a display of national animosity. The mouture only produced a revenue of 5.5 million florins, the abattage 2.5 million florins. This amount, though its exaction pressed heavily on the very poor, afforded little relief, and to meet recurring deficits the only resource was borrowing. To extricate the national finances from ever-increasing difficulties, the Amortizatie Syndicat was created in December 1822. Considerable sources of income from various public domains and from tolls passed into the hands of the seven members of the syndicate, all of whom were bound to secrecy, both as to its public and private transactions. Its effect was to diminish still further the control of the representative chamber over the national finances. The syndicate did indeed assist the state, for between 1823 and 1829 it advanced no less than 58,885,443 florins to meet the deficits in the budget, but the means by which it achieved this result were not revealed. Yet another device to help the government in its undertakings was the million de l'industrie, which was voted every year, as an extraordinary charge, but of which no account was ever given. That this sum was beneficially used for the assistance of manufacturing and industrial enterprise, as at Serain and elsewhere, and that it contributed to the growing prosperity of the southern provinces, is certain. But the needless mystery which surrounded its expenditure led to the suspicion that it was used as a fund for secret service and political jobbery, the autocratic temper of the king showed itself not merely in keeping the control of finance largely in his own hands, but also in carrying out a series of measures arousing popular discontent by simple arrêté or decrees of the Council of State without consultation with the representative chamber. Such were the decree of November the 6th, 1814, abolishing trial by jury and making certain of the changes in judicial proceedings that of April the 15th, 1815, imposing great restrictions on the liberty of the press, that of September the 15th, 1819, making Dutch the official language of the country, that of June the 25th, 1825, establishing the Collegium Philosophicum, and finally, that of June the 21st, 1830, making The Hague the seat of the Supreme Court of Justice. All these produced profound discontent and had a cumulative effect. The language decree of 1819 was tentative, declaring a knowledge of Dutch obligatory for admission to all public offices, but it was followed by a much more stringent decree in 1822, by which, in the two Flanders, South Brabant and Limburg, Dutch was to be used in the law courts and in all public acts and notices, Although the operation of this decree was confined to the Flemish-speaking districts, it must be remembered that, from the time of the Burgundian dukes, right through the Spanish and Austrian periods, French had always been the official language of the country. The upper classes only spoke French, and with few exceptions, the advocates could only plead in that language. This was a great hardship upon the Belgian bar, which would have been greatly increased had the royal decree of June the 21st, 1830, placing the court of appeal for the whole kingdom at The Hague, been carried into effect. More serious in its results was the infringement of Article 227 of the Fundamental Law, guaranteeing liberty of the press. The return of Napoleon from Elba, and the imminent danger to which the as yet unorganized kingdom of the Netherlands was exposed, led to the issue of an arrêté of the severest character. By it, all persons publishing news of any kind or giving information injurious to the state or writing or distributing political pamphlets were to be brought before a special tribunal of nine judges holding office at the king's pleasure, and if condemned were liable to be sentenced to exposure in the pillory, deprivation of civic rights, branding, imprisonment, and fines varying from a hundred to ten thousand francs. 
this harsh measure was possibly justifiable in an extreme emergency upon the plea that it was necessary for the safety of the state. When the danger was over, and the fundamental law was passed, there was no excuse for its further maintenance on the statute book. Yet, before this court, Abbé de Faure was summoned for having defended in the spectateur beige the jugement doctrinal of Bishop de Broglie, and he was sentenced to two years' imprisonment. In the following year, 1818, the government obtained the approval of the States-General, with slight modification, for the continuance of this wartime censorship of the press. The penalties remained, but the court consisted of a judge and four assessors, all government nominees. Under this law, a Brussels advocate, van der Straten, was fined 3,000 florins for a brochure attacking the ministers, and several other advocates were disbarred for protesting that this sentence was in conflict with the fundamental law. Prosecutions henceforth followed prosecutions, and the press was gagged. As a result of these press persecutions, the two Belgian political parties, the clericals and the liberals, pulled apart as they were in their principles, drew closer together. All differences of religious and political creed were fused in a common sense of national grievances under what was regarded as a foreign tyranny. This brought about in 1828 the formation of the Union, an association for the cooperation of Belgians of all parties in defense of liberty of worship, liberty of instruction, and liberty of the press. The ultra-clericals, who looked to the Vatican for their guidance, and the advanced liberals, who professed the principles of the French Revolution, were thus by the force of events led on step by step to convert an informal into a formal alliance. The Abbé de Faure in The Spectateur, and Messieurs de Lougue et Donker in The Observateur, had been for some years advocating united action, and it was their success in winning over to their side the support and powerful pen of Louis de Potter, a young advocate and journalist of Franco-radical sympathies, that the Union as a party was actually affected. From this time, the onslaughts in the press became more and more violent and embittered, and stirred up a spirit of unrest throughout the country. Petitions began to pour in against the mouture and abattage taxes, and other unpopular measures, especially from the Walloon provinces. These were followed by a national petition, signed by representatives of every class of the community, asking for redress of grievances, but it met with no response from the unyielding king. He had, in the early summer of this year, 1828, made a tour in Belgium, and had in several towns, especially in Antwerp and Ghent, met with a warm reception, which led him to underestimate the extent and seriousness of the existing discontent. At Liège, a centre of Walloon liberalism, he was annoyed by a number of petitions being presented to him, and in a moment of irritation, he described the conduct of those who there protested against pretended grievances as infamous, une conduite infâme. The words gave deep offence, and the incident called forth a parody of the League of the Beggars in 1566, an order of infamy being started with a medal bearing the motto, Fidèle jusqu'à l'infamie. The movement spread rapidly, but it remains a curious fact that the animosity of the Belgians, as yet, was directed against the Dutch ministers, especially Van Manen, the Minister of Justice, and the Dutch people, whose overbearing attitude was bitterly resented, rather than against the King or the House of Orange. William's good deeds for the benefit of the country were appreciated. His arbitrary measures, in contravention to the fundamental law, were attributed chiefly to his bad advisers. The month of December, 1829, was, however, to bring the king and his Belgian subjects into violent collision. A motion was brought forward in the second chamber, on December the 8th, by Monsieur Charles de Broucaire, an eminent Belgian liberal, supported by the Catholics under the leadership of Monsieur de Gerlache, for the abolition of the hated press law of 1815. The motion was defeated by the solid Dutch vote, supplemented by the support of seven Belgians. The decennial budget was due, and opposition to it was threatened unless grievances were remedied. 
The cry was point de redressement de grief, point d'argent. On December the 11th came a royal message to the States General which, while promising certain concessions regarding the taxes, the Collegium Philosophicum, and the language decree, stated in unequivocal terms the principle of royal absolutism. To quote the words of a competent observer of these events, the message declared in substance that the constitution was an act of condescension on the part of the throne, that the king had restrained rather than carried to excess the rights of his house, that the press had been guilty of sowing discord and confusion throughout the state, and that the opposition was but the fanatic work of a few misguided men, who, forgetting the benefits they enjoyed, had risen up in an alarming and scandalous manner against a paternal government. The Minister of Justice, Van Manen, on the next day issued a circular calling upon all civil officials to signify their adherence to the principles of the message within twenty-four hours. Several functionaries who had taken part in the petition agitation were summarily dismissed, and prosecutions against the press were instituted with renewed energy. From this time, Van Manen became the special object of Belgian hatred. The threat of the Belgian deputies to oppose the decennial budget was now carried out. At the end of December, the ministerial proposals were brought before the States General. The expenditure was sanctioned. The ways and means to meet it were rejected by 55 votes to 52. The finance minister, in this emergency, was obliged to introduce fresh estimates for one year only, from which the mouture and abattage taxes were omitted. This was passed without opposition, but in his vexation at this rebuff, the king acted unworthily of his position by issuing an arrêté on January the 8th, 1830, depriving six deputies, who had voted in the majority, of their official posts. Meanwhile, the virulence of the attacks in the press against the king and his ministers from the pens of a number of able and unscrupulous journalists were too daring and offensive to be overlooked by any government. Foremost in the bitterness of his onslaught was Louis de Potter, whose lettre de démophile au roi was throughout a direct challenge to the autocratic claims advanced by the royal message. Nor was de Potter content only with words. An appeal dated December the 11th, of which he and his friend Tillmans were originators, appeared on January the 31st, 1830, in 17 newspapers, for raising a national subscription to indemnify the deputies who had been ejected from their posts and salaries for voting against the budget. Proceedings were taken against de Potter and Tillmans, and also against Bartel, editor of the Catholique, and the printer, de Neve, and all were sentenced by the court to banishment, de Potter for eight years, Tillmans and Bartel for seven years, de Neve for five years. These men had all committed offences which the government were fully justified in punishing, for their language had passed to the limits not only of good order, but of decency, and was subversive of all authority. Nevertheless, they were regarded by their Belgian compatriots as political martyrs, suffering for the cause of their country's liberties. Their condemnation was attributed to Van Manen, already the object of general detestation. The ministry had meanwhile taken the wise step of starting an organ, the National, at Brussels, to take their part in the field of controversy. But in the circumstances, it was an act of almost inconceivable folly to select as the editor a certain Libri Bagnano, a man of Italian extraction, who, as it was soon discovered by his opponents, had twice suffered heavy sentences in France as a forger. He was a brilliant and caustic writer, well able to carry the polemical war into his adversary's camp, but his antecedents were against him and he aroused a hatred second only to the aversion felt for Van Manen. We have now arrived at the eve of the Belgian revolt, which had its actual origin in a riot. But the riot was not the cause of the revolt. It was but the spark which brought about an explosion, the materials for which had been for years preparing. The French secret agent, Julien, 
reports a conversation which took place between the king and Count Bilant on July the 20th, 1823. The following extract proves that, so early as this date, William had begun to perceive the impossibility of the situation. I say it, and I repeat it often to Clan Carty, the British minister, that I should love much better to have my Holland quite alone. I should be then a hundred times happier. When I am exerting myself to make a whole of this country, a party, which in collusion with the foreigner never ceases to gain ground, is working to disunite it. Besides, the Allies have not given me this kingdom to submit it to every kind of influence. This situation cannot last. Another extract from a dispatch of the French minister at The Hague, La Mousset, dated December the 26th, 1828, depicts a state of things in the relations between the two people, tending sooner or later to make a political separation of some kind inevitable. The Belgian hates the Hollander, and he, the Hollander, despises the Belgian, besides which he assumes an infinite auteur, both from his national character, by the creations of his industry, and by the memories of his history. Disdained by their neighbor of the north, governed by a prince whose confidence they do not possess, hindered in the exercise of their worship, and, as they say, in the enjoyment of their liberties, overburdened with taxes, having but a share in the national representation disproportionate to the population of the South, the Belgians ask themselves whether they have a country, and are restless in a painful situation, the outcome of which they seek vainly to discover. From an intercepted letter from Louvain, dated July the 30th, 1829. What does one see? Hesitation? uncertainty, embarrassment and fear in the march of the government, organization, reorganization, and finally disorganization of all and every administration. Again a rude shock and the machine crumbles. A true forecast of coming events. End of chapter 30「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ezwa. History of Holland by George Edmondson. Chapter 31. The Belgian Revolution, 1830-1842. During the last days of July, 1830, came the revolution at Paris that overthrew Charles X and placed the Duke of Orleans at the head of a constitutional monarchy with the title of Louis-Philippe, King of the French. The Belgian liberals had always felt drawn towards France rather than Holland, and several of the more influential among them were in Paris during the days of July. Through their close intercourse with their friends in Brussels, the news of all that had occurred spread rapidly and was eagerly discussed. Probably at this time, few contemplated the complete separation of Belgium from Holland, but rather looked to the northern and southern provinces becoming administratively autonomous under the same crown. This, indeed, appeared to be the only practical solution of the impasse which had been reached. Even had the king met the complaints of the Belgians by large concessions, had he dismissed Van Manen, removed Libri Bagnano from the editorship of the National and created a responsible ministry, which he had no intention of doing, he could not have granted the demand for a representation of the South in the Second Chamber proportionate to the population. For this would have meant that the position of Holland would have henceforth been subordinate to that of Belgium, and to this the Dutch, proud of their history and achievements, would never have submitted. It had been proved that amalgamation was impossible, but the king personally was popular with those large sections of the Belgian mercantile and industrial population whose prosperity was so largely due to the royal care and paternal interest, and had he consented to the setting up of a separate administration at Brussels, 
he might by a conciliatory attitude have retained the loyalty of his Belgian subjects. He did none of these things. But when in August he and his two sons paid a visit to Brussels, at a time when the town was celebrating with festivities the holding of an exhibition of national industry, he was well received and was probably quite unaware of the imminence of the storm that was brewing. It had been intended to close the exhibition by a grand display of fireworks on the evening of August the 23rd, and to have a general illumination on the king's birthday, August the 24th, but the king had hurried back to the Hague to keep his birthday, and during the preceding days there were abundant signs of a spirit of revolutionary ferment. Inscriptions were found on blank walls, down with Van Manen, death to the Dutch, down with Libri Bagnano and the National, and, more ominous still, leaflets were distributed containing the words Le 23 août, feu d'artifice. Le 24 août, anniversaire du roi. Le 25 août, révolution. In consequence of these indications of subterranean unrest, which were well known to Baron van der Foss, the civil governor of Brabant, and to Monsieur Keuf, the head of the city police, the municipal authorities weakly decided, on the ground of unfavorable weather, to postpone the fireworks and the illumination. The evening of the 23rd, as it turned out, was exceedingly fine. At the same time, the authorities permitted, on the evening of the 25th, the first performance of an opera by Scribe and Auber, entitled La Muete de Portici, which had been previously proscribed. The hero, Massaniello, headed a revolt at Naples in 1648 against foreign Spanish rule. The piece was full of patriotic, revolutionary songs likely to arouse popular passion. The evening of the performance arrived, and the theatre was crowded. The excitement of the audience grew as the play proceeded, and the thunders of applause were taken up by the throng which had gathered outside. Finally, the spectators rushed out with loud cries of vengeance against Libri Bagnano and Van Manen, in which the mob eagerly joined. Brussels was at that time a chosen shelter of political refugees, ready for any excesses, and a terrible riot ensued. The house of Van Manen and the offices of the National were attacked, pillaged, and burned. The city was given over to wild confusion and anarchy, and many of the mob secured arms by the plunder of the gunsmith shops. Meanwhile, the military authorities delayed action. Several small patrols were surrounded and compelled to surrender, while the main body of troops, instead of attacking and dispersing the rioters, was withdrawn and stationed in front of the royal palace. Thus, by the extraordinary passiveness of Lieutenant General Bailant, the military governor of the province, and of Major General Wautier, commandant of the city, who must have been acting under secret orders, the wild outbreak of the night began, as the next day progressed and the troops were still inactive, to assume more of the character of a revolution. This was checked by the action of the municipal authorities and certain of the principal inhabitants, who called together the civic guard to protect any further tumultuary attacks by marauders and ne'er do wells on private property. The guard were joined by numbers of volunteers of the better classes, and, under the command of Baron Dorvoort, were distributed in different quarters of the town, and restored order. The French flags, which at first were in evidence, were replaced at the town hall by the Brabant tricolor, red, yellow, and black. The royal insignia had in many places been torn down, and the orange cockades had disappeared. Nevertheless, there was at this time no symptom of an uprising to overthrow the dynasty, only a national demand for redress of grievances. Meanwhile, news arrived that reinforcements from Ghent were marching upon the city, 
The notables, however, informed General Bailant that no troops would be allowed to enter the city without resistance, and he agreed to stop the advance and to keep his own troops in their encampment until he received further orders from The Hague. For this abandonment of any attempt to reassert the royal authority, he has been generally blamed. There is no lack of evidence to show that the riot of August the 25th and its consequences were not the work of the popular leaders. The correspondence of Jean de Bien with de Botter at this time and the tone of the Belgian press before and after the outbreak are proofs of this. The Catholic of Ghent, the former organ of Bartel, for instance, declared, There is no salvation for the throne, but in an ample concession of our rights. The essential points to be accorded are royal inviolability and ministerial responsibility, the dismissal of Van Manen, liberty of education and the press, a diminution of taxation, in short, justice and liberty in all and for all, in strict conformity with the fundamental law. The Coursier des Pays-Bas, the former organ of de Potter, after demanding the dismissal of Van Manen as the absolute condition of pacification, adds, We repeat that we are neither in a state of insurrection nor revolution. All we want is a mitigation of the grievances we have so long endured, and some guarantees for a better future. In accordance with such sentiments, an influential meeting on the 28th at the town hall appointed a deputation of five, headed by Alexandre de Jean de Bien and Félix Count de Merode, to bear to the king a loyal address, setting forth the just grievances which had led to the Brussels disturbances, and asking respectfully, for their removal. The news of the uprising reached the king on the 27th, and he was much affected. At a council held at The Hague, the Prince of Orange earnestly besought his father to accept the proffered resignation of Van Manen, and to consider, in a conciliatory spirit, the grievances of the Belgians. But William refused flatly to dismiss the minister, or to treat with rebels. He gave the prince, however, permission to visit Brussels, not armed with powers to act, but merely with a mission of enquiry. He also consented to receive the deputation from Brussels, and summoned an extraordinary meeting of the States-General at The Hague for September the 13th. Troops were at once ordered to move south and to join the camp at Villevorde where the regiments sent to reinforce the Brussels garrison had been halted. The Prince of Orange and his brother, Frederick, meanwhile had left The Hague and reached Villevorde on August the 31st. Here, Frederick assumed command of the troops, and Orange sent his aide-de-camp to Baron d'Ourvoort to invite him to a conference at headquarters. The news of the gathering troops had aroused immense excitement in the capital and it was resolved that Hochwurt, at the head of a representative deputation, should go to Villevoort to urge the prince to stop any advance of the troops on Brussels, as their entrance into the town would be resisted unless the citizens were assured that Van Manen was dismissed and that the other grievances were removed. They invited Orange to come to Brussels, attended only by his personal suit, and offered to be sureties for his safety. The prince made his entry on September the 1st, the streets being lined with the civic guard. He was personally popular, but, possessing no powers, he could effect nothing. After three days of parleying, he returned to the camp, and his mission was a failure. On the same day when Orange entered Brussels, the deputation of five was received by King William at The Hague. His reply to their representations was that, by the fundamental law, he had the right to choose his ministers, that the principle of ministerial responsibility was contrary to the Constitution, and that he would not dismiss Van Manen or deal with any alleged grievances with a pistol at his head. William, however, despite his uncompromising words, 
did actually accept the resignation of Van Manen, September the 3rd. But when the Prince of Orange, returning from his experiences at Brussels, urged the necessity of an administrative separation of North and South, and offered to return to the Belgian capital, if armed with full authority to carry it out, his offer was declined. The king would only consent to bring the matter to the consideration of the States-General, which was to meet on the 13th. Instead of taking any immediate action, he issued a proclamation which in no way faced the exigencies of the situation, and was no sooner posted on the walls at Brussels than it was torn down and trampled underfoot. It is only just to say that the king had behind him the unanimous support of the Dutch people, especially the commercial classes. To them, separation was far preferable to admitting the Belgians to that predominant share of the representation which they claimed on the ground of their larger population. Meanwhile, at Brussels, owing to the inaction of the government, matters were moving fast. The spirit of revolt had spread to other towns, principally in the Walloon provinces. Liège and Louvain were the first to move. Charles Rogier, an advocate by profession and a Frenchman by birth, was the leader of the revolt at Liège, and such was his fiery ardor that, at the head of some four hundred men, whom he had supplied with arms from the armorers' warehouses, he marched to Brussels and arrived in that disturbed city without encountering any Dutch force. The example of Liège was followed by Jemap, Wavre, and by the miners of the Borinage, and Brussels was filled with a growing crowd of men filled with a revolutionary spirit. Their aim was to proclaim the independence of Belgium and set up a provisional government. For such a step, even pronounced liberals like Jean de Bien, Van de Weyer, and Roup, the veteran burgomaster of the city, were not yet prepared, and they combined with the moderates, Count Félix de Mérode and Ferdinand Meus, to form a committee of public safety. They were aided in the maintenance of order by the two barons d'Augvoort, Emmanuel and Joseph. The first the commander of the civic guard, and both popular and influential, and by the municipality. While these were still struggling to maintain their authority, the States-General had met at The Hague on September the 13th. It was opened by a speech from the King which announced his firm determination to maintain law and order in the face of revolutionary violence. He had submitted two questions to the consideration of the States-General. One, whether experience had shown the necessity for a modification of the fundamental law. Two, whether any change should be made in the relations between the two parts of the kingdom. Both questions were, after long debate, September the 29th, answered in the affirmative. But before this took place, events at Brussels had already rendered deliberations at The Hague futile and useless. The contents of the King's speech were no sooner known in Brussels than they were used by the revolutionary leaders to stir up the passions of the mob by inflammatory harangues. Rogier and Duc Petiot, at the head of the Liégeois and the contingents from the other Walloon towns, with the support of the lowest elements of the Brussels population, demanded the dissolution of the Committee of Public Safety and the establishment of a provisional government. The members of the Committee and of the municipality, sitting in permanence at the Hôtel de Ville, did their utmost to maintain order with the strong support of Baron d'Augvoort and the Civic Guard. But it was in vain. On the evening of September the 20th, an immense mob rushed the Hôtel de Ville after disarming the Civic Guard, and Rogier and Duc Petiot were henceforth masters of the city. The Committee of Public Safety disappeared, and is heard of no more. Hoogvoort resigned his command. On recept of this news, Prince Frederick, at Vilvoorde was ordered to advance upon the city and compel submission. But the passions of the crowd had been aroused, and the mere rumor that the Dutch troops were moving 
caused the most vigorous steps to be taken to resist à outrance their penetrating into the town. The royal forces, on the morning of September the 23rd, entered the city at three gates and advanced as far as the park. But beyond that point, they were unable to proceed, so desperate was the resistance and such the hail of bullets that met them from barricades and from the windows and roofs of the houses. For three days, almost without cessation, the fierce contest went on, the troops losing ground rather than gaining it. On the evening of the 26th, the prince gave orders to retreat, his troops having suffered severely. The effect of this withdrawal was to convert a street insurrection into a national revolt. The moderates now united with the liberals, and a provisional government was formed, having amongst its members Rogier, Van de Weyer, Jean de Bien, Emmanuel d'Augvoort, Félix de Mérode, and Louis de Potter, who a few days later returned triumphantly from banishment. The provisional government issued a series of decrees declaring Belgium independent, releasing the Belgian soldiers from their allegiance, and calling upon them to abandon the Dutch standard. They were obeyed. The revolt, which had been confined mainly to the Walloon districts, now spread rapidly over Flanders. Garrison after garrison surrendered, and the remnants of the disorganized Dutch forces retired upon Antwerp, October the 2nd. Two days later, the provisional government summoned a national congress to be elected by all Belgian citizens of 25 years of age. The news of these events caused great perturbation at The Hague. The Prince of Orange, who had throughout advocated conciliation, was now permitted by his father to go to Antwerp, October the 4th, and endeavor to place himself at the head of the Belgian movement on the basis of a grant of administrative separation, but without severance of the dynastic bond with Holland. King William, meanwhile, had already, October the 2nd, appealed to the great powers, signatories of the Articles of London in 1814, to intervene and to restore order in the Belgic provinces. The difficulties of the prince at Antwerp were very great, for he was hampered throughout by his father's unwillingness to grant him full liberty of action. He issued a proclamation, but it was coldly received, and his attempts to negotiate with the provisional government at Brussels met with no success. Things had now gone too far, and any proposal to make Belgium connected with Holland by any ties, dynastic or otherwise, was unacceptable. The well-meaning prince returned disappointed to The Hague on October the 24th. A most unfortunate occurrence now took place. As General Chassé, the Dutch commander at Antwerp, was withdrawing his troops from the town to the citadel, attacks were made upon them by the mob, and some lives were lost. Chassé, in reprisal, October the 27th, ordered the town to be bombarded from the citadel and the gunboats upon the river. This impolitic act increased throughout Belgium the feeling of hatred against the Dutch, and made the demand for absolute independence deeper and stronger. The appeal of William to the signatory powers had immediate effect, and representatives of Austria, Prussia, Russia and Great Britain to whom a representative of France was now added, met at London on November the 4th. This course of action was far from what the king expected or wished. Their first step was to impose an armistice, their next to make it clear that their intervention would be confined to negotiating a settlement on the basis of separation. A Whig ministry in England had, November the 16th, taken the place of that of Wellington, and Lord Palmerston, the new foreign secretary, was well disposed to Belgium, and found himself able to work in accord with Talleyrand, the French plenipotentiary. Austria and Russia were too much occupied with their own internal difficulties to think of supporting the Dutch king by force of arms, and Prussia, despite the close family connection, 
did not venture to oppose the determination of the two Western powers to work for a peaceful settlement. While they were deliberating, the National Congress had met at Brussels, and important decisions had been taken. By overwhelming majorities, November the 18th, Belgium was declared to be an independent state, and four days later, after vigorous debates, the Congress, by 174 votes to 13, resolved that the new state should be a constitutional monarchy, and, by 161 votes to 28, that the House of Orange Nassau be for ever excluded from the throne. A committee was appointed to draw up a constitution. William had appealed to the powers to maintain the treaties of Paris and Vienna, and to support him in what he regarded on the basis of those treaties as his undoubted rights, and it was with indignation that he saw the conference decline to admit his envoy, Falk, except as a witness, and on precisely the same terms as the representatives of the Brussels Congress. On December the 20th, a protocol was issued by the powers which defined their attitude. They accepted the principle of separation and independence, subject to arrangements being made for assuring European peace. The conference, however, declared that such arrangements would not affect the rights of King William and of the German Confederation in the Grand Duchy of Luxembourg. This part of the protocol was as objectionable to the Belgians as the former part was to the Dutch king. The London plenipotentiaries had in fact no choice, for they were bound by the unfortunate clauses of the treaties of 1815, which, to gratify Prussian ambition for Cisrenian territory, converted this ancient Belgian province into a German state. This ill-advised step, was now to be the chief obstacle to a settlement in 1831. The mere fact that William had throughout the period of Union always treated Luxembourg as an integral part of the southern portion of his kingdom made its threatened severance from the Belgic provinces a burning question. For Luxembourgers had taken a considerable part in the revolt, and Luxembourg's representatives set in the National Congress. Of these, eleven voted for the perpetual exclusion of the Orange Nassau dynasty, one only in its favor. It is not surprising, therefore, that a strong protest was made against the decision of the London Conference to treat the status of Luxembourg as outside the subject of their deliberations. The Conference, however, unmoved by this protest, proceeded in a protocol of January the 20th, 1831, to define the conditions of separation. Holland was to retain her old boundaries of the year 1790, and Belgium was to have the remainder of the territory assigned to the Kingdom of the Netherlands in 1815. Luxembourg was again excluded. The five powers, moreover, declared that within these limits the new Belgian state was to be perpetually neutral, its integrity and inviolability being guaranteed by all and each of the powers. A second protocol, January the 27th, fixed the proportion of the national debt to be borne by Belgium at 16 parts out of 31. The sovereign of Belgium was required to give his assent to these protocols, as a condition to being recognized by the powers. But the Congress of Brussels was in no submissive mood. They had already, January the 19th, resolved to proceed to the election of a king without consulting anyone. The territorial boundaries assigned to Belgium met with almost unanimous reprobation, a claim being made to the incorporation not merely of Luxembourg, but also of Maastricht, Limburg, and Dutch Flanders in the new state. Nor were they more contented with the proportion of the debt Belgium was asked to bear. On February the 1st, the five powers had agreed that they would not assent to a member of any of the reigning dynasties being elected to the throne of Belgium. Nevertheless, February the 3rd, 
the Duc de Nemours, son of Louis Philippe, was elected by ninety four votes, as against sixty seven recorded for the Duke of Luchtenberg, son of Eugène Beauharnais. The conference took immediate action by refusing to permit either Nemours or Luchtenberg to accept the proffered crown. These acute differences between the conference and the Belgian Congress were a cause of much satisfaction to the Dutch king, who was closely watching the course of events, and he thought it good policy, February the 18th, to signify his assent to the conditions set forth in the protocols of January the 20th and 27th. He had still some hopes of the candidature of the Prince of Orange, who was in London, being supported by the powers, but for this the time was past. At this juncture, the name of Leopold of Saxe-Cobourg, who had resided in England since the death of his wife, the Princess Charlotte, was put forward. This candidature was supported by Great Britain. France raised no objection, and in Belgium it met with official support. Early in April, a deputation of five commissioners was sent to offer the crown provisionally to the prince, subject to his endeavouring to obtain some modification of the protocols of January the 20th and 27th. The five powers, however, in a protocol dated April the 15th, announced to the Belgian government that the conditions of separation as laid down in January protocols were final and irrevocable, and, if not accepted, relations would be broken off. Leopold was not discouraged, however, and such was his influence that he did succeed in obtaining from the conference an undertaking that they would enter into negotiations with King William in regard both to the territorial and financial disputes with a view to a settlement moyennant de juste compensation. The Saxe-Cobourg prince was elected king by the Congress June the 4th, and in redemption of their undertaking, the conference promulgated June the 26th the preliminary treaty, generally known as the Treaty of the Eighteen Articles. By this treaty, the question of Luxembourg was reserved for a separate negotiation, the status quo being meanwhile maintained. Other boundary disputes, Maastricht, Limburg, and various enclaves, were to be amicably arranged, and the share of Belgium in the public debt was reduced. Leopold had made his acceptance of the crown depend upon the assent of the Congress being given to the treaty. This assent was given, but in the face of strong opposition, July the 9th, and the new king made his public entry in Brussels and took the oath to the Constitution twelve days later. On the same day, July the 21st, the Dutch king refused to accept the 18 articles, declaring that, adhering to the protocols of January the 20th and 27th, which the plenipotentiaries had themselves declared, April the 15th, to be fundamental and irrevocable. Nor did he confine himself to a refusal. He declared that, if any prince should accept the sovereignty of Belgium, or take possession of it without having assented to the protocols as the basis of separation, he could only regard such prince as his enemy. He followed this up, August the 2nd, by a dispatch addressed to the foreign ministers of the five powers, announcing his intention to throw his army into the balance with a view to obtaining more equitable terms of separation. These were no empty words. The facile success of the Belgian Revolution had led to the Dutch army being branded as a set of cowards. The king, therefore, despite a solemn warning from the conference, was determined to show the world that Holland was perfectly able to assert her rights by armed force if she chose to do so. In this course, he had the whole-hearted support of his people. It was a bold act politically justified by events. Unexpectedly, on August the 2nd, the Prince of Orange, at the head of an army of 30,000 picked men with 72 guns, crossed the frontier. The Belgians were quite taken by surprise. Their army, 
though not perhaps inferior in numbers to the invaders, was badly organized, and was divided into two parts, the army of the Schelt and the army of the Meuse. The prince knew that he must act with promptness and decision, and he thrust his army by rapid movements between the two Belgian corps. That of the Meuse fell back in great disorder upon Liège. That of the Schelt was also forced to beat a rapid retreat. Leopold, whose reign was not yet a fortnight old, joined the Western Corps and did all that man could do to organize and stiffen resistance. At Louvain, August the 12th, he made a last effort to save the capital and repeatedly exposed his life, but the Belgians were completely routed and Brussels lay at the victor's mercy. It was a terrible humiliation for the new Belgian state, but the prince had accomplished his task and did not advance beyond Louvain. On hearing that a French army, at the invitation of King Leopold, had entered Belgium with the sanction of the powers, he concluded an armistice by the mediation of the British minister, Sir Robert Adair, and undertook to evacuate Belgian territory. His army recrossed the Dutch frontier, August the 20th, and the French thereupon withdrew. The ten days' campaign had effected its purpose, and when the conference met to consider the new situation, it was felt that the eighteen articles must be revised. Belgium, saved only from conquest by French intervention, had to pay the penalty of defeat. A new treaty in twenty-four articles was drawn up, and was, October the 14th, again declared to be final and irrevocable. By this treaty, the northwestern, Walloon, portion of Luxembourg was assigned to Belgium, but at the cost of ceding to Holland a considerable piece of Belgian Limburg, giving the Dutch the command of both banks of the River Meuse, from Maastricht to the Gelderland frontier. The proportion of the debt was likewise altered in favor of Holland. King William was informed that, he must obtain the assent of the Germanic Confederation and of the Nassau Agnets to the territorial adjustments. These conditions created profound dissatisfaction both in Belgium and Holland. It was again the unhappy Luxembourg question which caused so much heart burning. The conference, however, felt itself bound by the territorial arrangements of the Congress of Vienna, and Palmerston and Talleyrand acting in concert throughout, could not on this matter overrule the opposition of Prussia and Austria supported by Russia. All they could do was to secure the compromise by which Walloon-Luxembourg was given to Belgium in exchange for territorial compensation in Limburg. Belgian feeling was strong against surrendering any part either of Luxembourg or Limburg, but King Leopold saw that surrender was inevitable and by a threat of abdication he managed to secure, though against vehement opposition, the acceptance of the Treaty of the Twenty-Four Articles by the Belgian Chambers, November the 1st. The treaty was signed at London by the plenipotentiaries of the five great powers and by the Belgian envoy, Van de Weyer, on November the 15th, 1831, and Belgium was solemnly recognized as an independent state whose perpetual neutrality and inviolability was guaranteed by each of the signatories severely. Once more, the obstinacy of King William proved an insuperable obstacle to a settlement. He had expected better results from the ten days' campaign, and he emphatically denied the right of the conference to interfere with the Grand Duchy of Luxembourg, as this was not a Belgian question, but concerned only the House of Nassau and the Germanic Confederation. He also objected to the proposed regulations regarding the navigation of the river Scheldt and refused to evacuate Antwerp or other places occupied by Dutch troops. He was aware that Great Britain and France had taken the leading part in drawing up the treaty, but he relied for support upon his close family relations with Prussia and Russia, with whom Austria acted. But although these powers bore him goodwill, they had no intention of encouraging his resistance. 
Their object in delaying their ratification of the treaty was to afford time to bring good advice to bear upon the unbending temper of the Dutch king. The Tsar even sent Count Alexis Orloff on a special mission to the Hague with instructions to act with the Prussian and Austrian envoys in urging William to take a reasonable course. All their efforts ended in failure. During the first nine months of the year 1832, a vigorous exchange of notes took place between London and The Hague, and the conference did its utmost to effect an accommodation. At last, patience was exhausted, and the powers had to threaten coercion. The three eastern powers declined, indeed, to take any active share in coercive measures, but were willing that Great Britain and France should be their delegates. Palmerston and Talleyrand, however, were determined that the King of Holland should no longer continue to defy the will of the European great powers, and on October the 22nd, the English and French governments concluded a convention for joint action. Notice was given to King William, November the 2nd, that he must withdraw his troops before November the 13th from all places assigned to Belgium by the Treaty of the 24 Articles. If he refused, the Dutch ports would be blockaded and an embargo placed upon Dutch ships in the Allies' harbors. Further, if on November the 13th any Dutch garrisons remained on Belgian soil, they would be expelled by armed force. William at once, November the 2nd, replied to the notice by a flat refusal. In so acting, he had behind him the practically unanimous support of Dutch public opinion. The Allies took prompt measures. An Anglo-French squadron set sail, November the 7th, to blockade the Dutch ports and the mouth of the Scheldt, and in response to an appeal from the Belgian government, as was required by the terms of the convention, a French army of 60,000 men under Marshal Gérard crossed the Belgian frontier, November the 15th, and laid siege to the Antwerp citadel held by a garrison of 5,000 men commanded by General Chassé. The siege began on November the 20th, and it was not until December the 22nd that Chassé, after a most gallant defence, was compelled to capitulate. Rear Admiral Koopman preferred to burn his twelve gunboats rather than surrender them to the enemy. Marshal Gérard offered to release his prisoners if the Dutch would evacuate the forts of Lillo and Liefkenshoek lower down the river. His offer was refused, and the French army, having achieved its purpose, withdrew. For some time longer, the blockade and embargo continued, to the great injury of Dutch trade. An interchange of notes between The Hague and London led to the drawing up of a convention, known as the Convention of London, on May the 21st, 1833. By this agreement, King William undertook to commit no acts of hostility against Belgium until a definitive treaty of peace was signed and to open the navigation of the Scheldt and the Meuse for commerce. The convention was in fact a recognition of the status quo and was highly advantageous to Belgium, as both Luxembourg and Limburg were, ad interim, treated as if they were integral parts of the new kingdom. The cessation of hostilities, however, led to a fresh attempt to reach a settlement. In response to an invitation sent by the Western powers to Austria, Prussia and Russia, the conference again met in London on July the 15th. The thread of negotiations was taken up, but the Belgian government insisted, with the full support of Palmerston, that as a preliminary to any further discussion, the King of Holland must obtain the assent of the German Confederation and of the Nassau Agnets to the proposed territorial rearrangements. William declined to ask for this assent. The conference on this was indefinitely suspended. That the king's refusal in August was a part of his fixed policy of waiting upon events 
was shown by his actually approaching the Confederation and the Agnates in the following November, 1833. Neither of these would consent to any partition of Luxembourg unless they received full territorial compensation elsewhere. So matters drifted on through the years 1834 to 1837. Meanwhile, in Holland, a change of opinion had been gradually taking place. The heavy taxes, consequent upon the maintenance of an army on a war footing, pressed more and more upon a country whose income was insufficient to meet its expenses. People grew tired of waiting for a change in the political position that became every year more remote. Luxembourg was of little interest to the Dutch. They only saw that Belgium was prosperous and that the maintenance of the status quo was apparently all to her advantage. The dissatisfaction of the Dutch people, so long patient and loyal, made itself heard with increasing insistence in the States General, and the king saw that the time had arrived for abandoning his obstinate non possumus attitude. Accordingly, in March 1838, he suddenly instructed his ministers in London, Dedel, to inform Palmerston that he, the king, was ready to sign the Treaty of the Twenty-Four Articles and to agree pleinement et entièrement to the conditions it imposed. The unexpected news of this sudden step came upon the Belgians like a thunderclap. From every part of the kingdom arose a storm of protest against any surrender of territory, the people of Luxembourg and Limburg appealed to their fellow citizens not to abandon them, and their appeal met with the strongest support from all classes and in both chambers. They argued that Holland had refused to sign the Treaty of 1831, which had been imposed on Belgium in her hour of defeat, and that now, after seven years, the treaty has ceased to be in force and required revision. The Belgians expected to receive support from Great Britain and France, and more especially from Palmerston, their consistent friend. But Palmerston was tired of the endless wrangling, and, acting on his initiative, the five powers determined that they would insist on the Treaty of the Twenty-Four Articles being carried out as it stood. The conference met again in October 1838, and all the efforts of the Belgian government and of King Leopold personally to obtain more favoured terms proved unavailing. An offer to pay 60 million francs indemnity for Luxembourg and Limburg was rejected both by King William and the Germanic Confederation. Such was the passionate feeling in Belgium that there was actually much talk of resisting in the last resort by force of arms. Volunteers poured in and in Holland also, the government began to make military preparations. But it was an act of sheer madness for isolated Belgium to think of opposing the will of the great powers of Europe. The angry interchange of diplomatic notes resulted only in one modification in favor of Belgium. The annual charge of 8,400,000 francs placed upon Belgium on account of her share in the public debt of the Netherlands was reduced to a payment of 5 million francs. The Dutch king signed the treaty on February 1st, 1839. Finally, the proposal that the treaty should be signed, a position being useless, met with a sullen assent from the two Belgian chambers. On April 19th, 1839, the Belgian envoy, Van de Weyer, affixed his signature at the Foreign Office in London, and so brought to an end the long controversy, which had lasted for nine years. There were still many details to be settled between the two kingdoms, which from this time became two separate and distinct political entities. But these were finally arranged in an amicable spirit, and were embodied in a subsidiary treaty signed on November 5, 1842. End of chapter 31. This recording is in the public domain. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, 
or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cory Samuel. History of Holland by George Edmondson. Chapter Thirty Two. William the First abdicates. Reign of William the Second. Revision of the Constitution, eighteen forty two to eighteen forty nine. The Dutch nation welcomed the final separation from Belgium with profound relief. The national charges had risen from fifteen million florins in eighteen fifteen to thirty eight million florins in eighteen thirty eight. Taxation was oppressive, trade stagnant, and the financial position growing more and more intolerable. The long tried loyalty of the people. Who had entrusted their sovereign with such wide and autocratic powers had cooled. The king's Belgian policy had obviously been a complete failure, and the rotten state of public finance was naturally, in large part, attributed to the sovereign, who had so long been practically his own finance minister. Loud cries began to be raised for a revision of the constitution on liberal lines. To the old king, any such revision was repugnant. But, unable to resist the trend of public opinion, he gave his assent to a measure of constitutional reform in the spring of eighteen forty. Its limited concessions satisfied no one. Its principal modifications of the fundamental law were: one, the division of the province of Holland into two parts; two, the reduction of the civil list; three, the necessary alteration of the number of deputies in the second chamber. Due to the separation from Belgium, four, abolition of the distinction between the ordinary and the extraordinary budget. Five, a statement of the receipts and expenditure of the colonies to be laid before the States General. Finally, the principle of ministerial responsibility was granted most reluctantly, the King yielding only after the Chambers had declined to consider the estimates without this concession. But William had already made up his mind to abdicate, rather than reign under the new conditions. He knew that he was unpopular and out of touch with the times, and his unpopularity had been increased by his announced intention of marrying the Countess Henriette Dulcimer, a Belgian and a Catholic. On October seventh, he issued a proclamation by which he handed over the government to his son William Frederick, Prince of Orange. He then retired quietly to his private estates in Silesia. He died at Berlin in eighteen forty-three. William the Second was forty-eight years of age on his accession to the throne. He was a man of character very different from that of his father. Amiable, accessible, easily influenced, liberal-handed even to extravagance, he was deservedly popular. He had shown himself in the peninsula. At Quatre Bras and Waterloo, and later in the Ten Days' Campaign, to be a capable and courageous soldier, but he possessed few of the qualities either of a statesman or of a financier. He had married in eighteen sixteen Anna Paulovna, sister of the Tsar Alexander the First, after his proposed marriage with the Princess Charlotte of England had been broken off. He entered upon his reign in difficult times. There was a loud demand for a further sweeping revision of the constitution. Religious movements, which had been gathering force during the reign of William the First, required careful handling. One minister after another had tried to grapple with the financial problem, but in vain. In eighteen forty, the public debt amounted to two thousand two hundred million florins, and the burden of taxation, though it had become almost unendurable. Failed to provide for the interest on the debt and the necessary expenses of administration, the state was in fact on the verge of bankruptcy. The appointment in eighteen forty two of F. A. Van Hall, formerly an Amsterdam advocate, who had held the post of Minister of Justice, to be finance minister, opened out a means of salvation. The arrears to eighteen forty amounted to thirty five million florins. The deficit for eighteen forty one to forty three had to be covered, and means provided for the expenditure for eighteen forty three to forty four. Van Hall's proposals gave the people the choice 
between providing the necessary money by an extraordinary tax of one and a half percent on property and income, and raising a voluntary loan of one hundred and fifty million florins at three percent. After long debates, the States General accepted the proposal for the voluntary loan, but the amount was reduced to a hundred and twenty-six millions. The success of the loan, though at first doubtful, was. By March 1844, complete. The Amsterdam Bourse gave its utmost support, and the royal family set a good example by a joint subscription of 11 million florins. By this means, and by the capitalization of the annual Belgian payment of 5 million francs, Van Hall was able to clear off the four years' arrears, and to convert the five and four and a half percent scrip into four percent. He was helped by the large annual payments, which now began to come in from the Dutch East Indies, and at length an equilibrium was established in the budget between receipts and expenditure. In the years preceding the French Revolution, the Reformed Church in the United Provinces had become honeycombed with rationalism. The official orthodoxy of the Dort Synod had become a fossilized skeleton. By the constitution of 1798, church and state were separated, and the property of the church was taken by the state, which paid, however, stipends to the ministers. Under King Louis, subsidies were paid from the public funds to teachers of every religious persuasion, and this system continued during the union of Holland and Belgium. A movement known as the Reveil had meanwhile been stirring the dry bones of Calvinistic orthodoxy in Holland. Its first leaders were Bilderdijk, De Costa, and Capadoes. Like most religious revivals, this movement gave rise to extravagances and dissensions. In 1816, a new sect was founded by a sea captain, Staffel Mulder, on communistic principles, after the example of the first Jerusalem converts, which gathered a number of followers among the peasantry. The new lighters, such was the name they assumed. Established in 1823, their headquarters at Zwintrecht. The first enthusiasm, however, died down, and the sect gradually disappeared. More serious was the liberal revolt against the cut and dried orthodoxy of Dort. Slowly it made headway, and it found leaders in Hofstede de Groot, professor at Groningen, and in two eloquent preachers, de Kock at Ulrum, and Schulte at Deventer. These men, finding that their views met with no sympathy or recognition by the synodal authorities, resolved, October fourteenth, eighteen thirty-four, on the serious step of separating from the Reformed Church, and forming themselves and their adherents into a new church body. They were known as the Separatists, the Afghanistanen. Though deprived of their pulpits, fined and persecuted, the Separatists grew in number. In 1836, the government refused to recognize them as a church, but permitted local congregations to hold meetings in houses. In 1838, more favorable conditions were offered, in which De Kock and Schulte finally agreed to accept, but no subsidies were paid to the sect by the state. William II, in 1842, made a further concession by allowing religious teaching to be given daily in the public schools, out of school hours. By the separatist ministers, as well as by those of other denominations. All this while, however, certain congregations refused to accept the compromise of 1838, and a large number, headed by a preacher named Van Raalt, in order to obtain freedom of worship, emigrated to Michigan to form the nucleus of a flourishing Dutch colony. The accession of William II coincided with a period of political unrest, not only in Holland. But throughout Europe, a strong reaction had set in against the system of autocratic rule, which had been the marked feature of the period which followed 1815. Liberal and progressive ideas had, during the later years, been making headway in Holland, under the inspiring leadership of Johann Rudolf Thorbeck, at that time a professor of jurisprudence at Leiden. He had many followers. And the cause he championed had the support of the brilliant writers and publicists, 
Donka Curtius, Luzak, Poitierger, Bakwies and van der Brink, and others. A strong demand arose for a thorough revision of the Constitution. In 1844 a body of nine members of the Second Chamber, chief amongst them Thorbeck, drew up a definite proposal for a revision, but the King expressed his dislike to it, and it was rejected. The Van Hall Ministry had meanwhile been carrying out those excellent financial measures which had saved the credit of the State, and was now endeavouring to conduct the government on opportunist lines. But the potato famine in 1845-46 to caused great distress among the labouring classes, and gave added force to the spirit of discontent in the country. The King himself grew nervous in the presence of the revolutionary ferment spreading throughout Europe, and was more especially alarmed, February 1848, by the sudden overthrow of the monarchy of Louis-Philippe and the proclamation of a republic at Paris. He now resolved himself to take the initiative. He saw that the proposals hitherto made for revision did not satisfy public opinion, and on March the 8th, without consulting his ministers, he took the unusual step of sending for the President of the Second Chamber, Borel van Hoogladen. He asked him to ascertain the opinions and wishes of the Chamber on the matter of revision, and to report to him. The Ministry on this resigned, and a new Liberal Ministry was formed, at the head of which was Count Schimmelpenick, formerly Minister in London. On March 17th a special commission was appointed to draw up a draft scheme of revision, it consisted of five members, four of whom, Thorbeck, Luzak, Donker Curtius, and Kempner, were prominent liberals, and the fifth a Catholic from North Brabant. Their work was completed by April the 11th, and the report presented to the King. Schimmelpenick, not agreeing with the proposals of the Commission, resigned, and on May the 11th a new ministry, under the leadership of Donker Curtius, was formed for the express purpose of carrying out the proposed revision. A periodical election of the Second Chamber took place in July, and difficulties at first confronted the new scheme. These were, however, overcome, and on October 14th the revised constitution received the King's assent. It was solemnly proclaimed on November the 3rd. The Constitution of 1848 left in the hands of the king the executive power, i.e., the conduct of foreign affairs, the right of declaring war and making peace, the supreme command of the military and naval forces, the administration of the overseas possessions, and the right of dissolving the chambers. But these prerogatives were modified by the introduction of the principle of ministerial responsibility. The ministers were responsible for all acts of the government, and the king could legally do no wrong. The king was president of the Council of State, fifteen members, whose duty it was to consider all proposals made to or by the states-general. The king shared the legislative power with the states-general, but the second chamber had the right of initiative, amendment, and investigation, and annual budgets were henceforth to be presented for its approval. All members of the States-General were to be at least thirty years of age. The first chamber of thirty-nine members was elected by the provincial estates, from those most highly assessed to direct taxation. The members sat for nine years, but one-third vacated their seats every third year. All citizens of full age, paying a certain sum to direct taxation, had the right of voting for members of the second chamber. The country for this purpose being divided into districts, containing 45,000 inhabitants. The members held their seats for four years, but half the chamber retired every second year. Freedom of worship to all denominations, liberty of the press, and the right of public meeting were guaranteed. Primary education in public schools was placed under state control, but private schools were not interfered with. The provincial and communal administration was likewise reformed and made dependent on the direct popular vote. The ministry of Donker Curtius at once took steps for holding fresh elections, as soon as the new constitution became the fundamental law of the country. 
a large majority of liberals was returned to the second chamber. The king in person opened the States General on February 13, 1849, and expressed his intention of accepting loyally the changes to which he had given his assent. He was, however, suffering and weak from illness, and a month later, March 17th, he died at Tilburg. His gracious and kindly personality had endeared him to his subjects, who deeply regretted that at this moment of constitutional change the States should lose his experienced guidance. He was succeeded by his son, William the Third. End of chapter 32「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Menno, Kulumburg, the Netherlands. History of Holland by George Edmondson. Chapter 33 Reign of William III to the death of Torbecke. 1849 to 1872. William the Third succeeded to the throne at a moment of transition. He was 32 years of age and his natural leanings were autocratic, but he accepted loyally the principle of ministerial responsibility and throughout his long reign endeavored honestly and impartially to fulfill his duties as a constitutional sovereign. There were at this time in Holland four political parties. One, the old conservative party, which after 1849 gradually dwindled in numbers and soon ceased to be a power in the state. Two, the liberals under the leadership of Thorbecke. Three, the anti-revolutionary or orthodox Protestant party, ably led by Geroen van Prinster, better known perhaps as a distinguished historian, but at the same time a good debater and a resourceful parliamentarian, for the Catholic Party. The Catholics, for the first time, obtained in 1849 the full privileges of citizenship. They owed this to the liberals, and for some years they gave their support to that party, though differing from them fundamentally on many points. The anti-revolutionaries placed in the foreground the upholding of the reformed, orthodox Calvinistic faith in the state, and of religious teaching in the schools. In this last article of their political creed they were at one with the Catholics, and in its defense the two parties were destined to become allies. The liberal majority in the newly elected States General was considerable, and it was the general expectation that Thorbecke would become head of the government. The king, however, suspected the aims of the liberal leader and personally disliked him. He therefore kept in office the Donker Curtius de Kempenaar cabinet, but after a vain struggle against the hostile majority it was compelled to resign, and Thorbecke was called upon to form a ministry. Thorbecke was thus the first constitutional prime minister of Holland. His answer to his opponents, who asked for his program, was contained in words which he was speedily to justify. Wait for our deeds. A law was passed which added 55,000 votes to the electorate, and by two other laws the provincial and communal assemblies were placed upon a popular representative basis. The system of finance was reformed by the gradual substitution of direct for indirect taxation. By the navigation laws, all differential and transit dues upon shipping were reduced. Tolls on through cargoes on the rivers were abolished, and the tariff on raw materials lowered. It was a considerable step forward in the direction of free trade. Various changes were made to lighten the incidence of taxation on the poorer classes. Among the public works carried to completion at this time, 1852, was the empoldering of the Haarlem Lake, which converted a large expanse of water into good pasture land. It was not on political grounds that the Torbecke ministry was to be wrecked, but by their action in matters which aroused religious passions and prejudices. 
The Prime Minister wished to bring all charitable institutions and agencies under state supervision. Their number was more than 3,500, and a large proportion of these were connected with and supported by religious bodies. It is needless to say the proposal aroused strong opposition. More serious was the introduction of a Catholic episcopate into Holland. By the fundamental law of 1848, complete freedom of worship and of organization had been guaranteed to every form of religious belief. It was the wish of the Catholics that the system which had endured ever since the 16th century of a Dutch mission under the direction of an Italian prelate, generally the Internuncio, should come to an end, and that they should have bishops of their own. The proposal was quite constitutional, and, far from giving the papal curia more power in the Netherlands, it decreased it. A petition to Pius IX in 1847 met with little favor at Rome, but in 1851 another petition, much more widely signed, urged the Pope to seize the favorable opportunity for establishing a native hierarchy. Negotiations were accordingly opened by the Papal See with the Dutch government, which ended, October 1852, in a recognition of the right of the Catholic Church in Holland to have freedom of organization. It was stipulated, however, that a previous communication should be made to the government of the papal intentions and plans before they were carried out. The only communication that was made was not official, but confidential, and it merely stated that Utrecht was to be erected into an archbishopric with Haarlem, Breda, Hertogenbosch and Roeremonde as suffragans. The ministry regarded the choice of such Protestant centers as Utrecht and Haarlem with resentment, but were faced with the fait accompli. This strong-handed action of the Roman authorities was made still more offensive by the issuing of a papal elocution, again without any consultation with the Dutch government, in which Pius IX described the establishment of the new hierarchy as a means of counteracting in the Netherlands the heresy of Calvin. A wave of fierce indignation swept over Protestant Holland, which united in one camp Orthodox Calvinists, anti-revolutionaries, conservatives and anti-papal liberals. The preachers everywhere inveighed against a ministry which had permitted such an act of aggression on the part of a foreign potentate against the Protestantism of the nation. Utrecht took the lead in drawing up an address to the king and to the states general, which obtained 200,000 signatures, asking them not to recognize the proposed hierarchy. At the meeting of the Second Chamber of the States General on April 12th, Torbecke had little difficulty in convincing the majority that the Pope had proceeded without consultation with the ministry and that under the Constitution the Catholics had acted within their rights in remodeling their church organization. But his arguments were far from satisfying outside public opinion. On the occasion of a visit of the king to Amsterdam, the ministry took the step of advising him not to receive any address hostile to the establishment of the hierarchy, on the ground that this did not require the royal approval. William, who had never been friendly with Thorbecke, was annoyed at being thus instructed in the discharge of his duties, and he not only received an address containing 51,000 signatures, but expressed his great pleasure in being thus approached, April the 15th. At the same time, he summoned Van Hal, the leader of the opposition, to Amsterdam for a private consultation. The ministry, on hearing of what had taken place, sent its resignation, which was accepted on April the 19th. Thus fell the Torbecke ministry, not by a parliamentary defeat, but because the king associated himself with the uprising of hostile public opinion, known as the April Movement. A new ministry was formed under the joint leadership of Van Hal and Donker Curtius, and an appeal to the electors resulted in the defeat of the liberals. The majority was a coalition of conservatives and anti-revolutionaries. The followers of Groen van Prinsler 
were small in number, but of importance through the strong religious convictions and debating ability of the leader. The presence of Don Curtius was a guarantee for moderation, and, as Van Hall was an adept in political opportunism, the new ministry differed from its liberal predecessor chiefly in its more cautious attitude towards the reforms which both were ready to adopt. As it had been carried into office by the April movement, a church association bill was passed into law, making it illegal for a foreigner to hold any church office without royal assent, and forbidding the wearing of a distinctive religious dress outside closed buildings. Various measures were introduced dealing with ministerial responsibility, poor law administration, and other matters, such as the abolition of the excise on meat and of barbarous punishments on the scaffold. The question of primary education was to prove for the next half century a source of continuous political and religious strife, dividing the people of Holland into hostile camps. The question was whether the state schools should be mixed, i.e. neutral schools, where only those simple truths which were common to all denominations should be taught or should be separate, i.e. denominational schools, in which religious instruction should be given in accordance with the wishes of the parents. A bill was brought in by the government, September 1854, which was intended to be a compromise. It affirmed the general principle that the state schools should be neutral, but allowed separate schools to be built and maintained. This proposal was fiercely opposed by Groen and gave rise to a violent agitation. The ministry struggled on, but its existence was precarious, and internal dissension at length led to its resignation. July 1856 The elections of 1856 had effected but little change in the constitution of the Second Chamber, and the anti-revolutionary J.J.L. van der Bruggen was called upon to form a ministry. Groen himself declined office. Van der Bruggen made an effort to conciliate opposition and a bill for primary education was introduced, 1857, upholding the principle of the mixed schools, but with the proviso that the aim of the teaching was to be the instruction of the children in Christian and social virtues. At the same time, separate schools were permitted and under certain conditions would be subsidized by the state. Groen again did his utmost to defeat this bill, but he was not successful, and after stormy debates it became law, July 1857. The Liberals obtained a majority at the elections of 1858, and van der Bruggen resigned. But the king would not send for Torbeke, and J.J. Rochussen, a former governor-general of the Dutch East Indies, was asked to form a fusion ministry. During his tenure of office, 1858 to 1860, slavery was abolished in the East Indies, though not the cultivation system, which was but a kind of disguised slavery. The way in which the Javanese suffered by this system of compulsory labor for the profit of the home country, the amount received by the Dutch treasury being not less than 250 million florins in 30 years, was now scathingly exposed by the brilliant writer Douwes Dekker. He had been an official in Java, and his novel, Max Havelaar, published in 1860 under the pseudonym Multatuli, was widely read, and brought to the knowledge of the Dutch public the character of the system which was being enforced. Holland was at this time far behind Belgium in the construction of a system of railroads, to the great hindrance of trade. A bill, however, proposed by the ministry to remedy this want, was rejected by the First Chamber, and Rochussen resigned. The king again declined to send for Torbeke, and Van Hall was summoned for the third time to form a ministry. He succeeded in securing the passage of a proposal to spend not less than 10 million florins annually in the building of state railways. All Van Hal's parliamentary adroitness and practiced opportunism could not, however, long maintain in office a ministry supported cordially by no party. Van Hal gave up the unthankful task, 
February 1861, but still it was not Darbecke, but Baron S. van Heemstra that was called upon to take his place. For a few months only was the ministry able to struggle on in the face of a liberal majority. There was now no alternative but to offer the post of first minister to Torbecke, who accepted the office January 31, 1862. The second ministry of Torbecke lasted for four years and was actively engaged during that period in domestic trade and colonial reforms. Torbecke, as a free trader, at once took in hand the policy of lowering all duties except for revenue purposes. The communal dues were extinguished. A law for secondary and technical education was passed in 1863, and in the same year slavery was abolished in Suriname and the West Indies. Other bills were passed for the canalizing of the Hook of Holland and the reclaiming of the estuary of the Ai. This last project included the construction of a canal, the Canal of Holland, with the artificial harbour of Eymuiden at its entrance, deep enough for ocean liners to reach Amsterdam. With the advent of Frans van der Putte as colonial minister in 1863 began a series of far-reaching reforms in the East Indies, including the lowering of the differential duties. His views, however, concerning the scandal of the cultivation system in Java did not meet with the approval of some of his colleagues, and Torbecke himself supported the dissensions. The ministry resigned, and van der Putte became head of the government. He held office for four months only. His bill for the abolition of the cultivation system and the conversion of the native cultivators into possessors of their farms was thrown out by the small majority. Torbecke, with a few liberals and some Catholics, voting with the conservatives against it. This was the beginning of a definite liberal split, which was to continue for years. A coalition ministry followed, under the presidency of J. van Heemskerk, interior, and Baron van Zuylen van Neeveld, foreign affairs. The colonial minister Meyer shortly afterwards resigned in order to take the post of Governor-General of the East Indies. This appointment did not meet with the approval of the Second Chamber, and the government suffered a defeat. On this they persuaded the king not only to dissolve the chamber, but to issue a proclamation impressing upon the electors the need of the country for a more stable administration. The result was the return of a majority for the Heemskerp van Zuylen combination. It is needless to say that Torbecke and his followers protested strongly against the dragging of the king's name into a political contest, as gravely unconstitutional. The ministry had a troubled existence. The results of the victory of Prussia over Austria at Sadova, and the formation of the North German Confederation under Prussian leadership, rendered the conduct of foreign relations a difficult and delicate task, especially as regards Luxembourg and Limburg, both of which were under the personal sovereignty of William III, and at the same time formed a part of the old German Confederation. The rapid success of Prussia had seriously perturbed public opinion in France, and Napoleon III anxious to obtain some territorial compensation which would satisfy French amour propre, entered into negotiations with William III for the sale of the Grand Duchy of Luxembourg. The king was himself alarmed at the Prussian annexations, and Queen Sophie and the Prince of Orange had decided French leanings, and, as Bismarck had given the king reason to believe that no objection would be raised, the negotiations for the sale were seriously undertaken. On March the 26th, 1867, the Prince of Orange actually left The Hague, bearing the document containing the Grand Duke's consent, and on April the 1st the session was to be finally completed. On that very day, the Prussian ambassadors at Paris and The Hague were instructed to say that any session of Luxembourg to France would mean war with Prussia. It was a difficult situation, and a conference of the great powers met at London on May the 11th 
to deal with it. Its decision was that Luxembourg should remain as an independent state, whose neutrality was guaranteed collectively by the powers under the sovereignty of the House of Nassau, that the town of Luxembourg should be evacuated by its Prussian garrison, and that Limburg should henceforth be an integral part of the Kingdom of the Netherlands. Van Zuylen was assailed in the Second Chamber for his exposing the country to danger and humiliation in this matter, and the Foreign Office vote was rejected by a small majority. The Ministry resigned, but, rather than address himself to Torbecke, the King sanctioned a dissolution, with the result of a small gain of seats to the Liberals. Heemskerk and Van Zuylen retained office for a short time in the face of adverse votes, but finally resigned, and the king had no alternative but to ask Torbecke to form a ministry. He himself declined office, but he chose a cabinet of young liberals who had taken no part in the recent political struggles, P.P. van Bosse becoming first minister. From this time forward, there was no further attempt on the part of the royal authority to interfere in the constitutional course of the parliamentary government. Van Bosse's ministry, scoffingly called by their opponents Torbecke's marionettes, maintained themselves in office for two years, 1868 to 1870, passing several useful measures, but are chiefly remembered for the abolition of capital punishment. The outbreak of the Franco-German War in 1870 found, however, the Dutch army and fortresses ill-prepared for an emergency, when the maintenance of strict neutrality demanded an efficient defense of the frontiers. The ministry was not strong enough to resist the attacks made upon it, and at last the real leader of the Liberal Party, the veteran Torbecke, formed his third ministry, January 1871. But Torbecke was now in ill health, and the only noteworthy achievement of his last premiership was an agreement with Great Britain by which the Dutch possessions on the coast of Guinea were ceded to that country in exchange for a free hand being given to the Dutch in Suriname. The ministry, having suffered a defeat on the subject of the cost of the proposed army reorganization, was on the point of resigning when Torbecke suddenly died, June 5, 1872. His death, brought forth striking expressions of sympathy and appreciation from men and journals representing all parties in the state. For five and twenty years, in or out of office, his had been the dominating influence in Dutch politics, and it was felt on all sides that the country was the poorer for the loss of a man of outstanding ability and genuine patriotism. End of chapter 33This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Menno, Culemburg, the Netherlands. History of Holland by George Edmondson. Chapter 34. The later reign of William the Third and the Regency of Queen Emma, 1872 to 1898. The death of Thorbecke was the signal for a growing cleavage between the old doctrinaire school of liberals who adhered to the principles of 1848 and the advanced liberalism of many of the younger progressive type. To Gerrit de Vries was entrusted the duty of forming a ministry, and he had the assistance of the former first minister, F. van de Putte. His position was weakened by the opposition of the Catholic party, who became alienated from the liberals, partly on the religious education question, but more especially because their former allies refused to protest against the Italian occupation of Rome. The election of 1873 did not improve matters, 
for it left the divided liberals to face an opposition of equal strength whenever the conservatives, anti-revolutionaries and Catholics acted together. This same year saw the first phase of the war with the piratical state of Aceh. An expedition of 3,600 men under General Köhler was sent out against the defiant sultan in April 1873, but suffered disaster, the general himself dying of disease. A second, stronger expedition under General van Swieten was then dispatched, which was successful, and the sultan was deposed in January 1874. This involved heavy charges on the treasury, and the ministry, after suffering two reverses in the second chamber, resigned, June 1874, being succeeded by a Heemskerk coalition ministry. Heemskerk, in his former premiership, had shown himself to be a clever tactician, and for three years he managed to maintain himself in office against the combined opposition of the advanced liberals, the anti-revolutionaries and the Catholics. Groen van Prinsterer died in May 1876, and with his death the hitherto aristocratic and exclusive party, which he had so long led, became transformed. Under its new leader, Abraham Kuyper, it became democratized, and, by combining its support of the religious principle in education with that of progressive reform, was able to exercise a far wider influence in the political sphere. Kuiper, for many years a Calvinist pastor, undertook in 1872 the editorship of the anti-revolutionary paper The Standard. In 1874 he was elected member for Gouda, but resigned in order to give his whole time to journalism in the interest of the political principles to which he now devoted his great abilities. The Heemskerk ministry had the support of no party, but by the opportunist skill of its chief it continued in office for three years. No party was prepared to take its place, and the government of the king must be carried on. The measures that were passed in this time were useful rather than important. An attempt to deal with primary instruction led to the downfall of the ministry. The elections of 1877 strengthened the liberals, and, an amendment to the speech from the throne being carried, Heemskerk resigned. His place was taken by Johannes Capeine, leader of the progressive liberals. A new department of state was now created that of waterways and commerce, whose duties, in a country like Holland, covered with a network of dikes and canals, was of great importance. A measure which denied state support to the private schools was bitterly resisted by the anti-revolutionaries and the Catholics, whose union in defense of religious education was from this time forward to become closer. The outlay in connection with the costly Aceh war, which had broken out afresh, led to a considerable deficit in the budget. In consequence of this, a proposal for the construction of some new canals was rejected by a majority of one. The financial difficulties, which had necessitated the imposing of unpopular taxes, had once more led to divisions in the liberal ranks, and Capena finding that the king would not support his proposals for a revision of the fundamental law, saw no course open to him but resignation. In these circumstances, the king decided to ask an anti-revolutionary, Count van Linden van Sandenburg, to form a ministry of affairs, composed of moderate men of various parties. Van Linden had a difficult task, but with the strong support of the king, his policy of conciliation carried him safely through four disquieting and anxious years. The revolt of the Boers in the Transvaal against British rule caused great excitement in Holland and aroused much sympathy. Van Linden 
was careful to avoid any steps which might give umbrage to England, and he was successful in his efforts. The Ache trouble was, however, still a cause of much embarrassment. Worst of all was the series of bereavements which at this time befell the House of Orange Nassau. In 1877, Queen Sophie died, affectionately remembered for her interest in art and science and her exemplary life. The king's brother, Henry, for thirty years stadtholder of Luxembourg, died childless early in 1879, and shortly afterwards, in June, the Prince of Orange, who had never married, passed away suddenly at Paris. The two sons of William III's uncle Frederick predeceased their father, whose death took place in 1881. Alexander, the younger son of the king, was sickly and feeble-minded, and with his decease in 1884, the male line of the House of Orange Nassau became extinct. Foreseeing such a possibility in January 1879, the already aged king took in second wedlock the youthful Princess Emma of waldeck Piermont. Great was the joy of the Dutch people when, on August 31, 1880, she gave birth to her princess, Wilhelmina, who became from this time forth the hope of a dynasty whose history for three centuries had been bound up with that of the nation. The Van Linden administration, having steered its way through many parliamentary crises for four years, was at last beaten upon a proposal to enlarge the franchise and resigned. February 26, 1883. To Heemskerk was confided the formation of a coalition ministry of neutral character, and this experienced statesman became for the third time first minister of the crown. The dissensions in the Liberal Party converted the second chamber into a meeting place of hostile factions, and Heemskerk was better fitted than any other politician to be the head of a government which, having no majority to support it, had to rely upon tactful management and expediency. The rise of a socialist party, under the enthusiastic leadership of a former Lutheran pastor, Domela Nieuwenhuis, added to the perplexities of the position. It soon became evident that a revision of the fundamental law and an extension of the franchise, which the king no longer opposed, was inevitable. Meanwhile, the death of Prince Alexander and the king's growing infirmities made it necessary to provide, by a bill passed on August 2, 1884, that Queen Emma should become regent during her daughter's minority. Everything conspired to beset the path of the Heemskerk ministry with hindrances to administrative and legislative action. The bad state of the finances, chiefly owing to the calls for the Aceh War, the subdivision of all parties into groups, the socialist agitation and the weak health of the king created something like a parliamentary deadlock. A revision of the constitution became more and more pressing as the only remedy, though no party was keenly in its favour. Certain proposals for revision were made by the government, March 1885, but the anti-revolutionaries, the Catholics and the conservatives were united in opposition, unless concessions were made in the matter of religious education. Such concessions as were finally offered were rejected, April 1886, and Heemskerk offered his resignation. Baron Mackay, anti-revolutionary, declining office, a dissolution followed. The result of the elections, however, was inconclusive, the liberals of all shades having a bare majority of four, but there was no change of ministry. A more conciliatory spirit fortunately prevailed under stress of circumstances in the new chamber, and at last, after many debates, the law revising the constitution was passed through both chambers and approved by the king, November the 30th, 
1887. It was a compromise measure, and no violent changes were made. The first chamber was to consist of 50 members, appointed by the provincial councils. The second chamber of 100 members, chosen by an electorate of male persons of not less than 25 years of age, with a residential qualification and possessing signs of fitness and social well-being, a vague phrase requiring future definition. The number of electors was increased from, in round numbers, 100,000 to 350,000. But universal male suffrage, the demand of the socialists and more advanced liberals, was not conceded. The elections of 1888 were fought on the question of religious education in the primary schools. The two Christian parties, Calvinist anti-revolutionaries under the leadership of Dr. Kuiper, and the Catholics, who had found a leader of eloquence and power in Dr. Schaapman, a Catholic priest, coalesced in a common program for a revision of Capinus Education Act of 1878. The coalition obtained a majority, 27 anti-revolutionaries and 25 Catholics being returned as against 46 liberals of various groups. For the first time, a socialist, Domela Nieuwenhuis, was elected. The Conservative Party was reduced to one member. In the first chamber, the liberals still commanded the majority. In April 1888, Baron Mackay, an anti-revolutionary of moderate views, became first minister. The coalition made the revision of the Education Act of 1878 their first business, and they obtained the support of some liberals who were anxious to see the school question out of the way. The so-called Mackay Law was passed in 1889. It provided that private schools should receive state support on condition that they conform to the official regulations, that the number of scholars should be not less than 25, and that they should be under the management of somebody, religious or otherwise, recognized by the state. The settlement was a compromise, but it offered the solution of an acute controversy and was found to work satisfactorily. The death of King William on November the 23rd, 1890, was much mourned by his people. He was a man of strong and somewhat narrow views, but during his reign of 41 years, his sincere love for his country was never in doubt, nor did he lose popularity by his anti-liberal attitude on many occasions, for it was known to arise from honest conviction, and it was amidst general regret that the last male representative of the House of Orange Nassau was laid in his grave. A proposal by the Catholic minister Borgesius for the introduction of universal personal military service was displeasing, however, to many of his own party, and it was defeated with the help of Catholic dissidents. An election followed, and the liberals regained a majority. A new government was formed, of a moderate progressive character, the premier being Cornelis van Tienhoven. It was a Ministry of Talents, Tak van Portvliet, Interior, and N.G. Pearson, Finance, being men of marked ability. Pearson had more success than any of his predecessors in bringing to an end the recurring deficits in the annual balance sheet. He imposed an income tax on all incomes above 650 florins, derived from salaries or commerce. All other sources of income were capitalized, funds, investments, farming, etc., and a tax was placed on all capital above 13,000 florins. Various duties and customs were lowered to the advantage of trade. There was, however, a growing demand for a still further extension of the franchise and for an official interpretation of that puzzling qualification of the revision of 1889, signs of fitness and social well-being. 
Duck van Portfleet brought in a measure which would practically have introduced universal male suffrage, for he interpreted the words as including all who could write and did not receive doles from charity. This proposal, brought forward in 1893, again split up the Liberal Party. The moderates, under the leadership of Samuel van Houten, vigorously opposed such an increase of the electorate, and they had the support of the more conservative anti-revolutionaries and the large part of the Catholics. The more democratic followers of Kuiper and Schaapman and the progressive radicals ranged themselves on the side of Tak van Portvliet. All parties were thus broken up into hostile groups. The election of 1894 was contested no longer on party lines, but between Takians and anti-Takians. The result was at first to Tak, his following only mustering 46 votes against 54 for their opponents. The new administration therefore came into office, May 1894, under the presidency of Jonkheer Johan Roel, with Van Houten as Minister of the Interior. On Van Houten's shoulders fell the task of preparing a new electoral law. His proposals were finally approved in 1896. Before this took place, the Minister of Finance, Spinger van Eyck, had succeeded in relieving the treasury by the conversion of the public debt from 3.5% to a 3% security. The Van Houten reform of the franchise was very complicated, as there were six different categories of persons entitled to exercise the suffrage. 1. Payers of at least one guilder in direct taxation. 2. Householders or lodgers paying a certain minimum rent and having a residential qualification. 3. Proprietors or hirers of vessels of 24 tons at least. 4. Earners of a certain specified wage or salary. 5. Investors of 100 guilders in the public funds or of 50 guilders in a savings bank. 6. Persons holding certain educational diplomas. This very wide and comprehensive franchise raised the number of electors to about 700,000. The election of 1897, after first promising a victory to the more conservative groups, ended by giving a small majority to the liberals, the progressive section winning a number of seats and the socialists increasing their representation in the chamber. A liberal concentration cabinet took the place of the Roel van Houten ministry, its leading members being Pearson, Finance, and Guman Borgesius, Interior. For a right understanding of the parliamentary situation at this time, and during the years that follow, a brief account of the groups and sections of groups into which political parties in Holland were divided must here interrupt the narrative of events. It has already been told that the deaths of Thorbecke and Groen van Prinsterer led to a breaking up of the old parties and the formation of new groups. The Education Act of 1878 brought about an alliance of the two parties, who made the question of religious education in the primary school the first article of their political program. The anti-revolutionaries, led by the ex-Calvinist pastor Dr. Abraham Kuiper, and the Catholics by Dr. Schaapman, a Catholic priest. Kuiper and Schaapman were alike able journalists, and used the press with conspicuous success for the propagation of their views, both being advocates of social reform on democratic lines. The anti-revolutionaries, however, did not, as a body, follow the lead of Kuiper. An aristocratic section whose principles were those of Groen van Prinsterer, orthodox and conservative, under the appellation of historical Christians, were opposed to the democratic ideas of Kuiper, and were, by tradition, anti-Catholic. Their leader was Jonkheer Savornen Lohman. For some years there was a separate Frisian group of historical Christians, but these finally amalgamated with the larger body. 
The liberals, meanwhile, had split up into three groups. One, the old independent, vrij liberals. Two, the liberal progressive union, Unie van vooruitstrevende liberalen. Three, liberal democrats, vrijzinnig democratische bond. The Socialist Party was the development of the Algemene Nederlandse Werklinenverbond, founded in 1871. Ten years later, by the activities of the fiery agitator Domela Nieuwenhuis, the Social Democratic Bond was formed, and the Socialists became a political party. The loss of Nieuwenhuis' seat in 1891 had the effect of making him abandon constitutional methods for a revolutionary and anti-religious crusade. The result of this was a split in the Socialist Party and the formation, under the leadership of Trulstra, Van Kool and Van der Goes, of the Social Democratic Workmen's Party, which aimed at promoting the welfare of the proletariat on socialistic lines, but by parliamentary means. The followers of Domela Nieuwenhuis, whose openly avowed principles were the destruction of actual social conditions by all means legal and illegal, were after 1894 known as the Socialist Bond, this anarchical party, who took as their motto neither God nor Master, rapidly decreased in number. Their leader, discouraged by his lack of success in 1898, withdrew finally from the political arena, and the socialist bond was dissolved. This gave an accession of strength to the Social Democratic Workmen's Party, which has since the beginning of the present century gradually acquired an increasing hold upon the electorate. End of chapter 34This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Menno, Kuhlenborg, The Netherlands. History of Holland by George Edmondson. Chapter 35 The Reign of Queen Wilhelmina, 1898 to 1917. The Pearson Borgesius ministry had not been long in office when Queen Wilhelmina attained her majority, on August the 31st, 1898, amidst public enthusiasm. At the same time, the Queen Mother received many expressions of high appreciation for the admirable manner in which for eight years she had discharged of her constitutional duties. The measures passed by this administration dealt with many subjects of importance. Personal military service was at last, after years of controversy, enforced by law, ecclesiastics and students alone being accepted. Attendance at school up to the age of 13 was made obligatory, and the subsidies for the upkeep of the schools and the payment of teachers were substantially increased. The year 1899 was memorable for the meeting of the First Peace Congress, on the initiative of Tsar Nicholas II, at the Huis den Bosch. The deliberations and discussions began on May the 18th, and lasted until June the 29th. By the irony of events, a few months later, October the 10th, a war broke out, in which the Dutch people felt a great and sympathetic interest between the two Boer republics of South Africa and Great Britain. Bitter feelings were aroused, and the Queen did but reflect the national sentiment when she personally received, in the most friendly manner, President Kruger, who arrived in Holland as a fugitive on board a Dutch man-of-war in the summer of 1900. The official attitude of the government was, however, perfectly correct, and there was never any breach in the relations between Great Britain and the Netherlands. The marriage of Queen Wilhelmina on February 7, 1901, with Prince Henry of Mecklenburg-Schwerin, was welcomed by the people as affording hopes, for some years to be disappointed, of the birth of an heir to the throne. 
the elections of 1901 found the liberal ministry out of favor through the laws enforcing military service and obligatory attendance at school. Against them, the indefatigable Dr. Kuiper, who had returned to active politics in 1897, had succeeded in uniting the three church groups, the democratic anti-revolutionaries, the aristocratic historical Christians, both orthodox Calvinists, and the Catholics of all sections, into a Christian coalition in support of religious teaching in the schools. The victory lay with the coalition, and Dr. Kuiper became first minister. The new administration introduced a measure on higher education, which was rejected by the first chamber. A dissolution of this chamber led to the majority being reversed, and the measure was passed. Another measure revised the Mackay Law, and conferred a larger subsidy on private schools. The Socialist Party, under the able leadership of Trolstra, had won several seats at the election, and in 1903 a general strike was threatened unless the government conceded the demands of the Socialist Labour Party. The threat was met with firmness. An anti-strike law was quickly passed, the military was called out, and the strike collapsed. The costly war in Aceh, which had been smoldering for some years, burst out again with violence in the years 1902-1903, and led to sanguinary reprisals on the part of the Dutch soldiery, the report of which excited indignation against the responsible authorities. Various attempts had been made in 1895 and 1899 to introduce protectionist duties, but unsuccessfully. The quadrennial elections of 1905 found all the liberal groups united in a combined assault upon the Christian coalition. A severe electoral struggle ensued, with the result that 45 liberals and 7 socialists were returned against 48 coalitionists. Dr. Kuiper resigned, and a new ministry, under the leadership of the moderate liberal De Meester, took its place. The De Meester government was, however, dependent upon the socialist vote, and possessed no independent majority in either chamber. For the first time, a Ministry of Agriculture, Industry and Trade was created. Such an administration could only lead a precarious existence, and in 1907 an adverse vote upon the military estimates led to its resignation. De Heemskerk undertook the task of forming a new cabinet from the anti-revolutionary and Catholic groups and at the next general election of 1909 he won a conclusive victory at the polls. This victory was obtained by wholesale promises of social reforms, including old age pensions and poor and sick relief. As so often happens, such a program could not be carried into effect without heavy expenditure, and the means were not forthcoming. To meet the demand, a bill was introduced in August 1911, by the finance minister, Dr. Kolkmar, to increase considerably the existing duties and to extend largely the list of dutiable imports. This bill led to widespread agitation in the country and many petitions were presented against it, with the result that it was withdrawn. A proposal made by this ministry in 1910 to spend 38 million florins on the fortification of Flushing excited much adverse criticism in the press of Belgium, England and France, on the ground that it had been done at the suggestion of the German government, the object being to prevent the British fleet from seizing Flushing in the event of the outbreak of an Anglo-German war. The press agitation met, however, with no countenance on the part of responsible statesmen in any of the countries named. It led, nevertheless, to the abandonment of the original proposal and the passing of a bill in 1912 for the improvement of the defences of the Dutch seaports generally. The election of 1913 reversed the verdict of 1909. Probably in no country has the principle of the swing of the pendulum been so systematically verified as it has in Holland in recent times. The returns were in 1913, church parties 41, liberals of all groups, 39. Socialists, 15. The most striking change was the increase in the socialist vote, their representation being more than doubled. 
and, as in 1905, they held the balance of parties in their hands. With some difficulty, Dr. Kort van den Linden succeeded in forming a liberal ministry. The outbreak of the Great War in August 1914 prevented them from turning their attention to any other matters than those arising from the maintenance of a strict neutrality in a conflict which placed them in a most difficult and dangerous position. One of the first questions on which they had to take a critical decision was the closing of the Scheldt. As soon as Great Britain declared war on Germany, August 4th, Holland refused to allow any belligerent vessels to pass over its territorial waters. The events of the six years that have since passed are too near for comment here. The Liberal Ministry at least deserves credit for having steered the country safely through perilous waters. Nevertheless, at the quadrennial election of 1917, there was the customary swing of the pendulum, and an anti-Liberal Ministry, September the 6th, was formed with the Catholic M. Ruijs de Berenbronck as First Minister. End of chapter 35This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of Holland by George Edmondson Epilogue The dynastic connection of Luxembourg with Holland ceased with the accession of Queen Wilhelmina. The conditions under which the Belgian province of Luxembourg was created by the Treaty of Vienna in 1815, a Grand Duchy under the sovereignty of the head of the House of Orange Nassau, with the succession in default of heirs male by the family compact, known as the Nashauser Erberrein, to the nearest male agnate of the elder branch of the Nassau family, have already been related. With the death of William the Third, the male line of the House of Orange Nassau became extinct and the succession passed to Adolphus, Duke of nassau weilburg How unfortunate and ill-advised was the action of the Congress of Vienna in the creation of the Grand Duchy of Luxembourg was abundantly shown by the difficulties and passions which it aroused in the course of the negotiations for the erection of Belgium into an independent state, 1830-39. to By the Treaty of April 19, 1839, the Walloon portion of Luxembourg became part of the Kingdom of Belgium, but in exchange for this cession the Grand Duke obtained the sovereignty of a strip of the Belgian province of Limburg. This caused a fresh complication. Luxembourg, in 1815, was not merely severed from the Netherlands. It, as a sovereign Grand Duchy, was made a state of the Germanic Confederation, by virtue of the exchange sanctioned by the Treaty of 1839, the ceded portions of Limburg became a state of the Confederation. But, with the revision of the Dutch Constitution, which, in 1840, followed the final separation of Holland and Belgium, by the wish of the King, his Duchy of Limburg was included in the new fundamental law, and thus became practically a Dutch province. The Limburgers had thus a strange and ambiguous position, they had to pay taxes, to furnish military contingents, and to send deputies to two different sovereign authorities. This state of things continued with more or less friction until the victory of Prussia over Austria in 1866 led to the dissolution of the Germanic Confederation. At the Conference of London, 1867, Luxembourg was declared to be an independent state whose neutrality was guaranteed by the great powers while Limburg became an integral part of the Kingdom of the Netherlands. Since the middle of the last century, the financial position of Holland has been continuously improving. The heavy indebtedness of the country, in the period which followed the separation from Belgium, was gradually diminished. This was effected for a number of years by the doubtful expedient of the profits derived from the exploitation of the East Indian colonies through the cultivation system. With the passing of the revised Fundamental Law of 1848, the control of colonial affairs and of the colonial budget was placed in the hands of the States General, and a considerable section of the Liberal Party began henceforth to agitate for the abolition of a system which was very oppressive to the Javanese population. It was not, however, until 1871 that the reform was carried out. 
Meanwhile, chiefly by the efforts of Thorbeck, the methods of home finance had been greatly improved by the removal, so far as possible, of indirect imposts, and the introduction of a free trade policy, which since his days has been steadily maintained. Such a policy is admirably suited to a country which possesses neither minerals nor coal, and whose wealth is mainly due to sea or river-borne trade, to dairy farming and to horticulture. For its supply of corn and many other necessary commodities, Holland has to look to other countries. The fisheries still form one of the staple industries of the land, and furnish a hardy seafaring population for the considerable mercantile marine, which is needed for constant intercourse with a colonial empire, the third in importance at the present time, consisting chiefly of islands in a far distant ocean. Between 1850 and 1914, 375 million 430,000 guilders have been devoted to the reduction of debt, and the sinking fund in 1915 was 6 million 346,000 guilders. Since that date, Holland has suffered from the consequences of the Great War, but, having successfully maintained her neutrality, she has suffered relatively far less than any of her neighbors. Taxation in Holland has always been high. It is to a large extent an artificial country, and vast sums have been expended and must always be expended in the upkeep of the elaborate system of dikes and canals by which the waters of the ocean and the rivers are controlled and prevented from flooding large areas of land lying below sea level. Culture in Holland is widely diffused. The well-to-do classes usually read and speak two or three languages besides their own, and the Dutch language is a finished literary tongue of great flexibility and copiousness. The system of education is excellent. Since 1900, attendance at the primary schools between the ages of 6 and 13 is compulsory. Between the primary schools, intermediate education, middle baron de Weiss, is represented by Burger Night Schools, and higher burgher schools. The night schools are intended for those engaged in agriculture or industrial work. The higher schools for technical instruction and much attention is paid to the study of Wirtalen, French, English, German, and Dutch. In connection with these, there is an admirable school of agriculture, horticulture, and forestry at Wageningen in Gelderland. To the teaching at Wageningen is largely due the acknowledged supremacy of Holland in scientific horticulture. There is a branch establishment at Kronichen for agricultural training and another at Deventar for instruction in subjects connected with colonial life. The gymnasia, which are to be found in every town, are preparatory to the universities. The course lasts six years, and the study of Latin and Greek, in addition to modern languages, is compulsory. There are four universities, Leiden, Utrecht, Groningen, and Amsterdam. The possession of a doctor's degree at one of these universities is necessary for magistrates, physicians, advocates, and for teachers in the gymnasia and higher Brucher schools. In so small a country, the literary output is remarkable, and marked as it is by scientific and intellectual distinction, deserves to be more widely read. The Dutch are justly proud of the great part their forefathers played during the War of Independence, and in the days of John de Witt and William the Third. For scientific historical research in the National Archives, and in the publication of documents bearing upon and illustrating the national annals, Dutch historians can compare favorably with those of any other country. Special mention should be made for the labors of Robert Fruin, who may be described as the founder of a school with many disciples, and whose collected works are a veritable treasure-house of brilliant historical studies, combining careful research with acute criticism. Among his disciples, the names of Dr. P. J. Block and Dr. H. T. Kolenbrander are perhaps the best known. In the Department of Biblical Criticism, there have been in Holland several writers of European repute, foremost among whom stands the name of Abram Kuhnen. Dutch writers of fiction have been and are far more numerous than could have been expected from the limited number of those able to read their works. In the second half of the 19th century, J. van Lennep and Mervrouw Bosboom Toysant were the most prolific writers, 
Both of these were followers of the Walter Scott tradition, their novels being mainly patriotic romances based upon episodes illustrating the past history of the Dutch people. Van Lennep's contributions to literature were, however, by no means confined to the writing of fiction, as his great critical edition of Vondel's poetical works testifies. Mevrouw Busboom Toussaint's novels were not only excellent from the literary point of view, but as reproductions of historical events were most conscientiously written. Her pictures, for instance, of the difficult and involved period of Leicester's governor-generalship are admirable. The writing of Dawes Decker, under the pseudonym Multituli, are noteworthy from the fact that his novel Max Havilar, dealing with life in Java and setting forth the sufferings of the natives through the cultivation system, had a large share in bringing about its abolition. The twentieth-century school of Dutch novelists is of a far different type from their predecessors, and deals with life and life's problems in every form. Among the present-day authors of fiction, the foremost place belongs to Louis Conperus, an idealist and mystic, who as a stylist is unapproached by any of his contemporaries. No account of modern Holland would be complete without a notice of that great revival of Dutch painting which has taken place in the past half-century. Without exaggeration, it may indeed be said that this modern renaissance of painting in Holland is not unworthy to be compared with that of the days of Rembrandt. The names of Joseph Israels, Hendrik Messed, Vincent van Gogh, Anton Moore, and, not least, of these three talented brothers, Maris, have attained a wide and well-deserved reputation. And to these must be added others of high merit. Builders, Schaefer, Bosboom, Rochessen, Bakhuysen, de Chatel, de Haas, and Haverman. The traditional representation of the Dutchman as stolid, unemotional, wholly unabsorbed in trade and material interest is a caricature. These latter-day artists, like those of the 17th century, conclusively prove that the Dutch race is singularly sensitive to the poetry of form and colour, and that it possesses an inherited capacity and power for excelling in the technical qualities of a painter's art. End of Epilogue End of History of Holland by George Edmondson